in this hearing of the Senate Environment and Communications References, Reference Committee's inquiry into media diversity in Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to their elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, I welcome everybody here today. Today, the committee will be conducting its hearing in person and via video conference. For the, best, for the benefit of all participants, I'm the chair, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and I'm joined in the room by Senator Carr, while Senators Fawcett and McMahon are joining via uh, video conference or teleconference. Um, we also, there might be some other just senators, who, senators who join along the way, so we'll let you know if they um, enter the room. Welcome to you all and thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues that we might encounter along the way. This is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and, as su and such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in a private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken, and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground on which it is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that an answer be given in camera. Such a request <coughs> may, of course, be made at any other time. I remind people in the hearing room to ensure their mobile phones are switched uh, onto silent. Those participating via teleconference and video conference are reminded to please state their name each time before speaking to assist Hansard and to also mute your devices when you do not have the call. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all those who have made submissions uh, and, give, and those that are giving evidence today. So I now welcome uh, Mr Tony Kosh. Uh, Mr Kosh, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, will you please state your full name and the capacities in which you appear today? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my full name is Anthony Patrick Kosh, K-O-C-H. Um, I'm a retired journalist. I had 35 or so years in the game. I started with I was actually a short-hand reporter in the courts and uh, we trained on Hansard to start with and then I um, joined Queensland Country Life for five years and then the Murdoch Papers, um, the Courier Mail and I rose to associate editor there. I was there for 22 years and then the last 10 years I had as chief reporter with the Australian newspaper. Wonderful. Um, Mr Kosh, I invite you to give us a short opening statement and then we'll go to some questions. Um, I understand you're familiar with the terms of reference of the inquiry, so over to you. Thank you, Senator. Yes. I, um, what, what concerns me most about media these days, and it's different, see, I've been retired uh, nine years now, and what I noticed and what brought me to write a the original letter, which was published in the Guardian, complaining about Murdoch Media, was the bias that I perceived and their unwillingness to cover stories that were critical of the uh, uh, Liberal National Party, and they, they always seemed to me to put a twist on uh, that was uh, anti-Labor, particularly leading up to the elections. That was never the case uh, uh, when I I was a journalist with the organisation and worried me. What, what, what I see as the real problem in, uh, in more recent times is News Corp's um, decision to buy all the, uh, in the last year or two, uh, to buy all the little newspapers and news organisations and radios around the country and then to close them all down. Now, I think it was something like 180 putting thousands of people out of work. Uh, and some of those newspapers, like the Warwick Daily News and all, have been going for over 100 years and running profitably. They shut them down. And what this has done, 
uh, is for for people to get news in those areas now. Well, I'm talking Queensland. Um, you've got Sky News on television, and you haven't got a local newspaper. So you've got you have to go online. If you can do that, if you're if you're um, tech savvy. Now, I um, the real area that I, that concerns me is this this um, constriction of the news. I am I was brought up in the bush in the in a little town uh, in Western Queensland. My dad was a policeman, and I have a real real affinity with inland Queensland. And the last fifteen years of my journalism career was spent in the Aboriginal communities in Torres Strait and Cape York, where that I concentrated on those those sort of stories and, and that coverage. Now, what I see as the big problem is the attack by News Corp on the ABC. The, the ABC, and, I, and I'm not an employee of the ABC, I, I, get, I get nothing from them. In fact, they represent me sometimes. But um, the ABC saves lives in this country, and particularly in rural Queensland. In times of flood, and, and I've covered many cyclones, bushfires, the uh, uh, people's, people in there, people west of the Great Divide in Queensland, their radios are just rusted onto the ABC, and they depend on the ABC, not only for news and politics, and that's where a lot of this argument falls down about media. Media is not just about politics. Media is about properly and truthfully informing the, the public, the listening public or the reading public about what's going on, the truth of what's going on in this country. Uh, as I said before, people depend on the ABC um, not, you know, for, for, for life changing and life saving decisions you know in in times of disaster whether or not to drive a car or fly a plane when the weather's bad i mean also you know the same on on bodhi depending on the abc um, for, you know what cyclones are doing and i just think it's appalling uh what news limited is doing with shutting down everybody they can and just attacking the abc so that so that um people will be left with no alternative but to go to, to the appalling Sky News, which is not a news service at all, it's just rubbish. And then um, um, going to, um, I, I lost it there somewhere, I lost the, can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've lost you on the screen. The, um, yeah, so, so that's where I'm really at. I, I just think that in the last, six or eight years that the, the terrible bias against not only the ALP, but also against women, indigenous people. When's the last, you know, proper series uh, written with an understanding of indigenous issues? When did anyone ever last see, last see that in, in uh, News Corp? It's just rubbish and it's really, it's really sad and we deserve better. Uh, <laughs> that's probably all I've got to say. I get a bit angry about this, I'm sorry. Uh Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Kosh. Uh, so just to be clear, when did you uh, leave uh, writing for News Corp? In um, 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 2012. 2012. And had you uh, already started to become concerned about uh, the um, uh, reduction no, in news was, value? Uh, uh, not do a lot. Yeah, I was quite. Uh, yeah, you know, I was, actually, I was very proud to work for them, and and uh, and you know, I I won the was it Sir Rupert or the Murdoch Award for you know, Australia's top journalist and all that sort of thing, and and, and it, it was a, a great organisation. And the paper, the Australian at that time, was a paper that had some authority and had some standing, and the people used to. Do, read it and also i mean it set the scene for for um news throughout australia each day or a lot of days it wasn't the only one obviously and um yeah no i, I didn't have any concerns with it all by the time i had retired mm. um so what has changed between 2012 and, <laughs> I, and I'd today like to know. 
obviously some editors have changed. Um, obviously, the political landscape has changed, and uh, and I just see it. Um, uh, the News Corp papers uh, have have taken a huge right turn, and um, and just obviously favour the LNP and um, and uh, kick to death anybody else who's not connected with them, and they ignore great, you know, really serious, important stories about the LNP, about you know, four hundred million dollars going to some unheard of barrier reef organization, you know, bushfire funds being collected and not being distributed. The and the, the more recent ones, goodness me, if I was in there. Uh, the editors I work for, I can tell you now, if we were confronted with these rape stories, the most recent ones, there's no way in the world we'd be sitting off and just allowing rubbish opinions like um, oh, I haven't read the documents, therefore he's innocent. That just would not have happened. The journalists I work with, the editors I work with, and particularly the women journalists I work with, would not have had a bar of that. Mm. Can I um, ask what, your, what the response was to your um, open letter uh, when you, uh, you know, yeah, was, the, this, yeah. was, this was quite a, there's not many former News Limited journalists who have been so public with saying that they're going to cancel their subscription uh, to their former employer. Yeah. The, um, you asked me what was the reaction to it. Well, it, it was, um, um, well, certainly a lot of my colleagues and former colleagues wrote in great support of me. I, I, there was some criticism. Um, typically, News Limited got a couple of uh, wannabe um, grubby journalists to uh, have a go at me, but it didn't go very far because um, I have a I have a history that uh, that I'm proud of, and it's a, it's a bit hard to kick around. Actually, I mean, as you know, I'm I'm not skiting, but I mean, I've got five Walkley Awards, and if anybody wants to take me on and say that I didn't do my job or I didn't I didn't care about the lesser people, I spent my life in Aboriginal communities, and and uh, you know, it's just yeah, a few of them had to go, but not too many. Um, yeah, but that was just rough. But you did have uh, some others uh, support you in saying that. Oh yeah, I had, this I had was an enormous amount of yeah, I had an enormous amount of support, and uh, and yeah, one big big group here took me to lunch here in Brisbane. Um, uh, I, I had a bit of a misfortune there; I had a stroke uh, not long after that, and uh, and. Yeah, they're taking the lunch. It was just, um, and they were just so happy that somebody said it. But see, a lot of a lot of them can't uh, weren't in the favourable position that I'm in, in that I was retired. I collected my superannuation. Um, I'm nicely set up. I'm you know in a nice marriage and everything. There's nothing in my nobody nobody can hurt me. And, uh, and but that's not the same situation with. Um, with a lot of uh, my colleagues. Yeah. Can, can I ask you, in um, uh, your writing on this issue, you put specifically that journalists are not to blame. Yeah. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? And who is to blame then? Uh, I Well, you, you just your day-to-day -day journalists are, yeah, I, I think 90% um, of them do a great job. I think that the real horrible bias and the horrible misinformation, and I and I mentioned in that um, in that first uh, letter, uh, comes from the commentators, many of whom are not um, qualified journalists, and also uh, yeah, and some of them are just political hacks. When I say they're not qualified journalists, I'm not just saying that they're the only people who can comment. Obviously, they're not, but for a journalist to write something, and particularly uh, write every week like a lot of those uh, wannabes are doing. You know, we're, we're journalists, we're bound by a code of ethics. We've got to provide balance. Uh, we've got to, um, you know, research it properly. We have a responsibility, um, not only to our, to our employer, but they have a responsibility also to the readership. Uh, and, uh, 
and that's that's where I see most of the problem. Obviously, this is a direction. I mean, you've only got to look at the the people that have been appointed as commentators and what their background is um, to see that there's there's obviously a concerted move by management in News Limited to put in um, hacks who will be told who will do what they're told, and uh, and and, uh, and you, you get a poor result from it. Mm. Um. One other thing I just wanted to ask before um, throwing to other senators is you talked about uh, being proud to work for the national um, broadsheet um, yeah. and that it would often lead the news. Um, yeah. This was one of the... Um, we've had this evidence put forward to us a number of times already that the influence of uh, the Australian and other News Corp uh, newspapers um, is far wider than just its concentration in terms of print media. The fact that uh, yeah. other news outlets do take their morning yeah. news their, and, and the, the day's stories from the front page. Um, is that what you're referring to? Could you expand on uh, what you mean in and what you experienced as a journalist who would get a front page story, um, uh, the influence that that would have on other media? Yeah, certainly, Senator. Senator, what what happens? You know, I mean, obviously, a uh, your major daily, like the Australian or the Korean Mail or uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, um, they arrive in newsrooms at daylight. In 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 most commercial radio, for instance, um, yeah, you know, they don't employ obviously a big team of news journalists, and they they depend on on uh, papers, you know, on news in others from other sources. And they do what they what we call rip and read. I mean, if you, there's a little, you know, commercial radio, not even little ones, big ones too. Um, they, they just uh, see see a story, uh, you know, what's leading, what most interest is in, uh, uh, in the paper that comes that morning. And yeah, they rip it out and read it. Away it goes. They don't do any investigation or or value add to the story or anything. And certainly, um, yeah, that, that's that's what I was referring to. That. That the major newspapers set the news for the day, and it's, a, it's the thing that that uh, you know those radio stations, for instance, or, and morning TV, uh, they, they're chasing their interviews, and so yeah, you know, they grab the Australian Sydney Morning Herald, and they see what's on the front. If there's a politician quoted there, boom, yeah, you know, get onto his or her press secretary, and, and they get get a voice from the uh, the person. Yeah, they they do set the. Uh, the time for the day. Mm. Thank you. That's Senator Carr. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Snop, for your uh, appearance today. Uh, I noted Thanks, that um, you, you mentioned some of your credentials. You have five Walkley Awards, Honorary Doctorate, Australian School of Journalism, 48 State Journalism Awards, Sir Keith Murdoch News Limited Award, and the Graham Perkins Award. You've been inducted into the Australian Media Hall of Fame. I also noted that uh, the, uh, Mr Mitchell uh, suggested that your comments actually required, Chris Mitchell suggested that your comments actually were worth thinking about. Uh, and given Mr Chris Mitchell's place within News Limited, I, I thought that was particularly significant. So, so, uh, having said that, I just had a look over your piece and what um, I'd be interested to know, given your extensive experience, is how the process of news creation actually works in the, uh, within news. The, um, you discuss the, the, pro the changes that you observed um, and you say the consequence is that, that newspapers, in my opinion, avoid their primary responsibility to be fearless watchdogs of government and society and work to ensure that wrongs are exposed and fairness is invoked for all. And then you go on to say, it, it agrees with me to say that Australia has become little more than a laughing stock. But you then go say this as well. You say, I must say, I've never in my years been instructed to write an article or not write an article because it suited a political benefit of a particular editor. So how is it that this 
bias, as you describe, does develop within the news organisation, such as the Australian. Uh, yes, Senator, uh, thanks for asking that, because I was really keen to, to make it very clear that in all my years in the paper, in the various newspapers, I was never once instructed uh, to, to write a certain political way. And, and, and I, I'm sure that I never had an article not published because of, um, yeah, because of it, it expressed a certain opinion. Um, so things things change after I left, and yeah, you know, it's obvious just the the amount of biased rubbish that's published now that is being done at you know, at direction. I just like to mention about Chris Mitchell that uh, you mentioned there before. He's a, a an editor who. Uh, as you know, he retired about the same time as me, I think a bit after me, and um, and he still writes a weekly column on the media and gets stuck into the ABC, and I disagree with a lot of that. But Chris Mitchell, uh, he gets a lot of criticism, but I can never criticise the bloke because he's the one who gave me open slather and picked up huge bills for me going to, you know, from Brisbane to... Cape York and the, and the Gulf Carbon Dairy and Torres Strait, year upon year upon year, uh, and very expensive trips to try and assist with the Indigenous issues. And we had a real uh, tie-in with marvellous Indigenous man, um, Noel Pearson, as you'll know. Um, now, um, yeah, to get back uh, to to the uh, to the point. Oh, yeah, I'll also mention this too. Mitchell was the one. Well, I refused to uh, to do anything positive with Pauline Hanson. I just I just absolutely disagreed with what she was on. And I was senior enough that I was able to discuss these issues with an editor. Uh, I I didn't always get my way with them, but I refused to have anything to do with that. And it was me who convinced um, Mitchell to adopt a a proper attitude uh, and, and questioning of Hanson. In fact, we took it to lunch one day. And also, I might just say that I used to do bits on, provide, uh, provide bits on, on radio at the time, and I refused ever to, uh, to have anything to do with Hanson. But I, I'm probably getting off here, off the point of your question. So I'm sorry, would you mind just asking me? So can I, I just to come get, back to, to get back to the how, subject? How, yeah. how is it? that bias is developed within the newspaper. I mean, I read The Australian every day. Yeah. Um, and and it, when I, I look at, there'll sometimes be nine or 10 anti-Labor stories in the first couple of yeah. pages of yeah. the newspaper. Uh, I see it as uh, opinion dressed up as news. How does that develop yeah. in such a way as you get a campaign approach to yeah. the coverage of public affairs? The only way, I mean, nothing can go in the paper without the imprimatur of the uh, of whoever is the editor at the time. And uh, so the short answer to your question is because the, because that's what the editor wants. And uh, it's also the editor. You have a news conference in the afternoon and all the, the stories that journalists uh, have gathered during the day, uh, they put in a, a brief summary, three or four line summary on what's called a news list. There's eight or ten people sitting around a table deciding where the stories are going to go, and uh, the editor is always the chair of that meeting, and uh, he or she uh, decide, you know, the placement of the stories. I'd like to make something very clear about bias. Now, some years ago at a state election in Queensland, um, the, I was with the Courier Mail, and one of our universities did a did a an exercise on bias. They had their students go through the Courier Mail and the then Australian newspaper. Yeah, the Daily Sun was operating here in Brisbane, and they came up with some conclusions by by revealing how many uh, column centimeters you know each party got and each candidate and all this. Now, where that falls down and where people, I mean, bias can be very sneaky. The Australian newspaper and them don't even bother to be sneaky now, but but I mean, 
you can say that you know, the uh, the prime minister and the and the uh, opposition leader got equal column centimeters, but if the if the if one of them is on the front page smiling and and you know, helping an old person across the street, and and the other one is uh, you know snarling and doing something horrible against it with an angry crowd, you know holding up signs of ditch the bitch, um, yeah, and it's on page two. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have the saying in newspapers is you've got to be on a right hand page and above the fold. If you are not, if you're below the fold, if you're on a left hand page, uh, you're being you're being uh, uh, <laughs> you're being uh, treated poorly, and and that's that's more the bias. So, of, uh, so in terms of the journalistic uh, approaches, it's a question of placement, it's a question yeah. of the headline, it's a question yeah. of the photograph, it's the presentational issues. But you also mentioned that you're, uh, you had a view in regard to Aboriginal affairs. I mean, it'd be yeah. fair to say, I, I think, it'd be fair to say that the Australian has taken uh, a particular, I mean, I, I would suggest a, a positive view in regard to uh, many Indigenous affairs issues, as distinct from other tabloid publications. Um, do, is it also a question of getting journalists to do certain stories that, that is understood to have a particular approach to a, a matter? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, and, and that's reasonable, I think. The, um, you know, if you talk about Indigenous affairs, I think it's... Um, you know, you, you've got to tell the whole story and, you know, for instance, go to a community and and tell it warts and all. But, you know, you don't forget the good things that are happening and the people who are trying mm. and, yeah. and, and that sort yeah. of thing. And, yeah, so, so it's, we, uh, oh, but you could take a, a story, for instance, um, on, on uh, other fields. Uh, I noticed, for yeah. instance, the switch that's been taken on, on certain security questions at the moment. There used to be a very favourable attitude towards the People's Republic of China. It's a very negative attitude. Uh, you know, is it a journalist not instructed, but are they picked because they have a particular approach to an issue? Uh no, no, I wouldn't have thought so. I think that the journalist who's there, who might be covering around, uh, I mean, you're really senior journalists who who are, um, you know, writing the upfront stories. You know, the editor will often call them in or come and sit at their desk and have a talk to them and say, what have you found out today? Who are you talking to? You know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, no, I, I don't think, it's not my experience that people are, a handpick because they might lean that way up. So, and, and, and is that because you think, as a senior journalist, you'd be treated differently from a junior journalist? Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, that's yeah, 100%. So, because um, I'm, I'm trying to come to grips with how the news is constructed, as distinct yeah. from, given the, your statement, that you were never told what to write. Yeah. But you told the yeah. editor that you weren't going to write certain things. So clearly there is a political judgment within the newsroom as to how the newsroom will deal with a political or a, a, a public issue, put it that way, a public issue. Now, not all journalists would have your, your um, seniority, your ethics perhaps. Some journalists will approach a public issue in a different way, and would you agree? Yes, um, I do agree. The um, you know you're dealing, Senator, you're dealing with human beings, you know, and, and most journalists, and I'm very pro-journalist, obviously. Mm -hmm. Most journalists are, are educated and, and reasonably or highly intelligent people, and um, you know, I mean, if if you get a a chief of staff, and they're the ones who assign stories in a newsroom. If you get one who, who, you know, says, "Yeah, this, I want you to go out and do this," and I think this is the angle. Well, most journalists, even more junior ones, would say, "But you know, isn't this so, or isn't that so?" And there's a bit of a discussion goes sure. on. But you say that can't; those standards can't apply to columnists. No, no. My, many of my friends, see. decades, they share my disgust. 
you know, she's yeah. the word disgust for columnists. Yeah, uh, yeah. Predictable, well, weak, the unresearched and juvenile. Yeah. Well, why don't they have Columnist. the same standards? <laughs> no, not at all. Columnists um, are not bound, as I mentioned before, by ethics. And, and they're, 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 for instance, and, and, and it's reasonable if, to write a comment. You, you don't have to. Um, you're not you know, bound to go and get uh, both sides of a story. I mean, I think that's appalling, but that's the way, that's the, you know, comment as comment. Um, when when Mitchell first came to uh, to the Australian newspaper and he got me to write a Saturday column, he said, I want you to break stories you know, every other week in your column. So from my, what he expected from me was that they had to be better researched and, and uh, you know, to be able to stand scrutiny, uh, not just not just flippant stuff um, yeah, that, that happens to be anti whatever, for instance, the Labor Party came up with that week. Yeah. So we take, for instance, in your, your piece in The Guardian, you referred to, this is a, a contemporary piece, the, you said the appalling story concerning Bill Shorten's mother's work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, why were you so concerned about that particular matter? Well, that was that current example. I, I um, you know, I, I saw Shorten uh, talk about his mum there and how she hadn't been able to, uh, she'd always wanted to be a lawyer, but she ended up having to be a teacher, <clears throat> which was, you know, a fine story. And then and then the next one, a couple of days later, the, uh, I forget which publication, was certainly a Murdoch one, came up with uh, a story saying that, you know, not the full story was told because, 30 or 40 years later, the lady actually did a law degree. I mean, that's just grubby. And uh, and it was, uh, you know, to attack the family. And uh, I, I just thought it was low rent stuff and, and unworthy, unworthy of any publication. So, <laughs> the, so this issue about the treatment of private lives of public figures is not confined to politicians, of course. I mean, is no. it, do you think that's in response? Uh, has that changed in your experience as a professional in this in the media is that response for instance to social media if it is a more contemporary question oh absolutely uh, yeah the the privacy issue is one of uh, sort of enormous concern i think and, I, and social media yeah certainly has to be looked at in that regard i've seen some stuff in social media that's just appalling and certainly if it was published in a in, a, in, a, in any paper i work for the the size of the writ uh, that would be have to be paid would be enormous. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a very cavalier approach taken now to uh, to um, people's privacy, uh, and um, it, it, it's not helped. And, and I'm not saying this is a political statement. I'm saying it as a political fact. It's not helped by this current federal government, who have a very weird attitude to. Uh, protecting like whistleblowers and that sort of thing, and uh, you know, it's seen more concentrating on on sending little girls over to Christmas Island and putting them in a cage for three years. Mm. I just want to finally turn to this issue of Rip and Reed. You've drawn yeah. attention to what happens in uh, regional radio and the like, and, and as yeah. you know, a, a politician of uh, some considerable years myself, I, I've observed this, you know, in, especially in yeah. under-resourced radio stations. But yeah. uh, I've also observed that at major outlets like the ABC, if you listen to some of the current affairs programs early in the morning, you get the distinct impression that they have taken oh. stuff directly from the front pages yeah. of The Australian. Um, so is it not also a problem with people who have taken as face value material that is presented as news when it is in fact opinion um, presented on the front page of the na National Daily because it is available quickly and, and, and yeah. it's presented yeah. the night before um, in all our inboxes. Um, is that not as much a problem where people are actually not doing the research that's required, they're under-resourced as well? And, and, but the, the question of the ethics of journalistic presentation applies not just to under-resourced regional radio stations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What you're saying is correct. The, uh, um, all the major TVs, uh, for instance, um, 
and um, and radio, yeah, do uh, grab it in the morning and go with it. I, I've heard it. Yeah, you know, I would have heard it this morning if I'd turned on. But what the fact is that newspapers are yesterday's news tomorrow, and and the best and most succinct news service is radio because it's immediate. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I have spent so much time at emergency situations like cyclones and floods and all that. And, and I just envy the radio journalist who can stand there and do an interview and boom, the whole of Australia or the world knows what's going on, whereas I have to humbly sneak back to my motel room and type a story in my day anyway that, that, that comes out tomorrow. Of course, it goes online now, but Senator, what you're saying is right. It's not only the regionals who do it, and there's, a, there's been a problem with under-resourcing newsrooms uh, for, you know, since I started journalism, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr Kosh, we're going to go to um, Senator Fawcett, who's on the phone. Senator Fawcett, are you there? I am. Thank you, Chair. Mr Kosh, thank you uh, for appearing today. Um, thank let's you, take Sam. you to the terms of reference for the inquiry, which uh, focus very heavily in the key terms of reference about the impact of media diversity on our democracy. Yeah. Um, you've talked about your concern about what you perceive as bias within the News Corp papers uh, towards the LNP. Uh, in Queensland, where there has been concerns or have been concerns raised by the submitters about the percentage of ownership uh, by News Corp of papers, which they deny their evidence. I point to the fact that the ALP has won eight out of the last nine elections. So I'm just wondering how that fact, that electoral outcome, correlates with your concern that the bias is uh, A, present, and B, distorting our democracy. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Senator, um, the well, the fact that, the, I mean, if you looked at News Corp's um, Courier Mail and the Australian effort, the last state election here, they were just daily building the ALP and the current uh, Palaszczuk government just, and, and they editorialised, you know, uh, uh, the, the wise thing to do is to vote for them. And then there was a, a landslide victory to Labor and to um, Palaszczuk. Now, th that says, said a couple of things to me. One, the editor of, of those publications is was totally out of touch with the um, uh, with the public mood and the public opinion, I mean, it was just an absolute disaster uh, for the news, for the polls and everything. So, uh, what I'd like to say, I'd like to expand a little bit. I think that that you, we talk about the democratic process. I think it goes further than that. I think that if we if we suffer the the uh, degrading of the ABC in particular. Uh, in Australia, I think there's a, there's a national security issue that we've got here. You've got people's lives and people's livelihoods at stake because they're not getting, not able to get uh, a true and honest service that they deserve. And, and I think, I'll just explain another, a little one. I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. The closure by all these paper, uh, of all these papers and, and uh, other news organisations by, by News Corp, which was absolute act of political bastardry, what it's done is to deny people in all those little towns, Bowra, Roma, Charla, whatever, um, yeah, all the local news service, but it's also, and this is what I can't understand, why I can't understand the National Party, uh, not representing rural people, um, it's also denied local politicians in all those areas, you know, the daily, you know, weekly feed of, you know, I opened a toilet block at the local state school and a photo in and all that sort of thing. And in fact, I had a big laugh after the last Queensland election when Pauline Hanson was interviewed and said, you know, why'd you do so poorly in Queensland? She said, it was just, it was just terrible. We would fly into a little town and I'd get up and speak the rubbish I speak, but there was no one there to listen to me. There was no radio microphone in my face, no TV, no newspaper reported because um, you know, they just don't exist. They're not there. So we got no coverage and that's why I went so badly. And uh, anyway, I thought fair enough. 
Senator Fawcett. So I guess, Mr. Kosh, the, the question though is if if News Corp are so biased and their coverage is so dominant, the ALP won out of eight out of nine elections, which says that there is another presence. And um, certainly I've raised this in previous hearings that online polling and certainly that conducted by the ABC shows that they believe that they are Australia's most trusted news source. Uh, and yet their own internal review after the 2019 election uh, found that they needed to increase the diversity of views on political programs. And they, in fact, found that in the month leading up to the election, uh, shows like Insiders and The Drum uh, were clearly favouring uh, Labor and ideas and policies associated with the left of politics. That's a quote from, from that internal review. So do you accept that other organisations such as the ABC also, in, in their own internal reviews, evidence bias, and that in turn to the outcome of Australia's democracy, uh, that is actually more influential than the, the News Corp papers? <laughs> no, I don't think that at all. The, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I bow to your wisdom in relation to those surveys. I don't follow them and I, I don't watch uh, a lot of those um, current affairs things. Because news service senator, with the greatest respect, is not just about politics, and it's and you know an, an electorate doesn't just look at the political aspects of what's what's going on. I mean, I, I think that the two biggest issues, you know, facing the election now, are employment and security of employment, and you know who's addressing that, and 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 I, I yeah, you know, whether or not the ABC has a bias. I mean, if your survey say that, well, well and good, and it should be addressed. No, and so people Mr. Should Kosh, that, that's actually the ABC's own internal review said that. Yeah, fair, yeah, fair enough. If that's if that's what's being found, well, yeah, that's got to be addressed. Yeah, I, I have no opinion on that. It's not my, it's not my experience, but I look at a broader ABC than just um, any particular, um, you know, one hour show once a week or whatever. I, I just. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just think that's a bit silly. Okay, no further questions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Kosh. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kosh. Uh, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Um, if there's anything that uh, you think we uh, you need to clarify at any point, get in touch with the Secretariat. Um, but we thank you for making time today and. Uh, um, thank you for uh, squeezing in the, the time frame, considering you're an hour behind us there in Queensland. So, yeah, thank th you. Thank you, Sandra, thank you. and all the best to all of you with your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Could we? Could I just have um, invite the next witness up, please, to the table, Ms. Anna Rogers. So I now welcome uh, Ms Anna Rogers. Uh, I understand information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses uh, and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Um, Anna Wentworth Rogers, I appear as a witness. In a private capacity? In a private capacity. Thank you. Now, uh, we have a submission from you. I'll just make sure I get the, uh, it's 853 um, for those playing at home. Would you like to give us a short opening statement and then we can go to some questions? If I could, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, in the 20 years that I've been a photographer for News Corp, I've worked on the national, the state, the regional and the community mastheads. I was one of five women in a team of 30 photographers at the headquarters in Sydney in the 90s, where we used film and hand printed photos in the darkroom. In 1995, I was transferred to the Cairns Bureau and worked throughout Cape York, hand processing film and sending photos remotely. Technology's changed so much that in 2020, I live streamed the Prime Minister on using only my mobile phone. 
The issues that I'd like to address today are the portrayal and the treatment of women by News Corp and the toxic work culture that's a result of the lack of media diversity. When I was employed by the Sunday Mail in 2011 to do social photos, I was told by the acting picture editor that they did not want any photos of, quote, pigs in lipstick. I found this was extremely derogatory to women, but to keep my job, I had to apply this test, which meant that women who were overweight or over 35 did not get a run in the paper. When I was employed at the Cairns Post, I was encouraged to take photos of attractive women with instructions like, get a photo of a yummy mummy, or get a photo of a pretty backpacker. I was never, ever directed to get a photo of an attractive man. I was told that the photo of an attractive woman would get a better run in the paper. I felt uncomfortable doing this, as I thought it was sexist. Even the selection of which court stories to cover is now based on applying the subscriber page view model at News Corp. Former colleagues have told me that they are told to ignore the charges and instead look out for attractive women appearing in court. They check their social media following and lift their photos off Facebook. If the women are attractive and have more than a thousand followers, then it is much more likely that they will run the story online as it will get more page views. I'd like to address the issue of toxic workplace. I believe that the lack of diversity in media ownership has created a toxic workplace where print journalists either accept the conditions or move out of the industry. When I returned to work at News Corp in 2011, after having children, I took a huge pay cut from a grade six to a grade two A, and I remained on, that, remained on that low wage for the next eight and a half years. In the EBA, the two A is for photographers who have completed training and are gaining experience. I had 10 years of experience on Metro dailies. My male colleagues with less experience were on higher wages. I believe I was as discriminated against as I was a woman who had left the workforce to have children and that this is part of the toxic company culture which promotes men over women. When the current editor started in 2015, the ratio of male-female photographers and journalists was 50-50. In mid-2020, there was one female staff member in that team and 12 men. I believe it is now three women and 15 men. By 2019, oh sorry, 15 in total. By 2019, the conditions had deteriorated so much that for months we had to use toilet paper instead of paper towels to dry our hands in the tea room. And there were weeks when there were no notebooks or even pens provided. The company also failed to provide me with any safety equipment or training for bushfires or cyclones. They had boots and gear for the men, but I was not provided with any. Despite this, I was asked to sign off that I had received training and understood the risks of covering dangerous assignments, including bushfires and cyclones. I feel the company handled the death of two colleagues with very little regard to the welfare of staff who were their friends for many years. Instead of being told of their death in person, in a safe environment, I heard of one colleague's death over the scanner, and this was despite the fact that the, my managers had known about her death for hours. The following year, when a colleague committed suicide, my manager called me while I was covering the Premier's press conference. After that, they put up RUAK posters in the office. However, in 2019, when three colleagues told me they were not okay, I asked for advice from my manager. He told me that he'd once worked on a newspaper where four people had committed suicide, and he did not offer me any advice. In mid-2019, the company introduced subscription targets, and we were all very stressed about this. At the same time, they put up black A4 posters in the office which said, who's next? The fine print did say that it was an ad campaign, but from your desk, all you could read was, who's next? I believe this was in very poor taste in a small office of 20, where two had died and two to three people were being made redundant every six months. In 2020, when the office was closed during COVID, all the staff, except for the photographers, were directed to work from home. Photographers would still have to go out on jobs and work from their home or car. When I asked if I could use the office toilet instead of public toilets during COVID, I was told, yes, this would be okay, but I'd have to clean the toilet myself. COVID protocols were put in place, which stated that staff should be provided with PPE, masks, hand sanitizer and wipes. However, the only PPE that I was ever provided with was a single mask. 
I was made redundant, along with hundreds of other journalists and photographers, or journalists probably, in June 2020. When that, that occurred, the company classified me as clerical staff. This meant that I would be paid $20,000 less than I was entitled to. The journalist union intervened and I was paid the correct amount. I believe the lack of competition and emphasis on clickbait has created a toxic culture where staff feel intimidated and bullied and many are just waiting for the next axe to fall and wondering if they will still have a job. Women are treated particularly badly and are paid less purely because they are women. One of the main functions of newspapers has always been to report on a community's births, deaths, marriages, and to cover public interest journalism. The lack of media diversity, when News Corp bought, then closed more than 100 mastheads, has meant that many communities are left without that news, except on social media. And while Mr Murdoch, who's in his 90s, may be computer savvy and across social media, I'm not sure that many of his peers are so lucky. On July the 24th, 2019, the Cairns Post managing editor sent an email to all editorial staff stating that, quote, as you can imagine, I get forensically analysed, that's not a spelling mistake, about our subscription targets. If the managing editor tells staff that he's being forensically analysed, how do you think they're treating the rest of the staff? In summary, I believe the lack of diversity of media ownership has allowed News Corp to descend from being a reputable news organisation with a safe and supportive workplace that published public interest journalism to a place where women are considered as pigs in lipstick with a toxic work culture where even the managing editor feels that he's being forensically analysed. And that's clearly that's my experience. I can't speak for other organisations or papers, but... Thank you, Ms Rogers, and thank you for um, uh, outlining your uh, experience. I have provided, sorry, some documents with them um, which refer to the, the points that I spoke to. Yes, thank you. We've got that. Um, which we'll just, you're asking to have this tabled? Yes, please. Uh, Senator Carr, can you yes, just help them? Thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, submission and those uh, quite graphic descriptions. Um, what, where's your current, just you, can you, for the Pansard record, can you explain what your current uh, status is with News Corp? I was made redundant in June, so I, I, know, I no longer work for News Corp. Mm -hmm. um, and have you worked for any other news organisations? I've worked for John B. Fairfax um, in Hunter Valley, but predominantly I've worked for Murdoch. Thank you. So with that in mind, uh, you know, you've got, what, 30 years experience all up in photojournalism? Closer to 25, probably. All right, 25. So would you say that your experience is just restricted to News Corp or uh, would you suggest that it's a problem more generally? I can only speak to my experience. Yes. I can say that I've now left News Corp and I'm working as a communications agent in a private company and the work atmosphere is, I've just, I, I didn't know it was possible to work in such a um, supportive and positive environment. So mm -hmm. it, I can only speak from my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's in a, a private company working um, in, in terms of your trade, though, as a photojournalist uh, or a, pho a photographer. Yes. That's, and is it, uh, officer, was it your experience working for uh, what was once known as Fairfax? Was it the same sort of culture? Uh, no, sir. No. So you, you're suggesting that there is something specific and special about the way News Corp behaves. Yes, sir. The language that you referred to, um, the behaviour of the uh, pictorial editors, does that happen in other parts of the newsroom, do you think, or was it just specifically related to, to those sections that you directly reported to? I'm speaking of the, the, not the picture editor, of the editor and the deputy editors and I managers, see. not not specifically. So it is more general? Yes, oh yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Senator. And the, the, um, the role you play in a newspaper as a photojournalist is critical to readership, it's critical to the presentation of the news, would you agree? I believe so, yes. Um, you could make or break a story, would that be true? Of course, yes. So. The language that's used and the behaviour that actually is exhibited is absolutely critical to the culture of the news organisation. My behaviour? No, the, of those asking you to produce 
an image. Yeah. And then that's what you do, isn't it? With yep. the, you've, yep. the the uh, description you used is a uh, you know pigs in lipstick, you, yummy mummy. Those that was the terms you used. Yes. Well, clearly, yeah. that that was the terms that were sought. They were the the news editor sought those used that expression deliberately, presumably. I, I don't think it was an accident. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was not an accident. No. No. Uh, just, uh, just sorry, Senator. Just to be clear, Ms. Rogers, they're not your terms. No, no, I'm not. That is what that. is that, told that is what is yeah. told yes. of you yeah, and no, requested no, of you. Yes. No, no, I'm, I'm absolutely clear about that. I'm just, yeah. but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is that there was a deliberate effort being made by the news editor to produce that image for the newspaper, and you were asked to produce that photo or photo op that reflected that intention? Yes, so if we were told to go and get a, a weather, a generic I'd say, you know, a weather photo, um, a, a budget story, a family about something, it would always be an attractive woman, a cute kid, um, never, a, never an attractive man, but particularly attractive women were always emphasised. And do you think this is more prevalent in regional newspapers? So given you mentioned Cairns, for instance, is it, or would you say there's a different culture in metropolitan mastheads? No, I would say the Courier-Mail is, is, is as bad and probably worse where I worked. Would it be the same in regard to magazines? I, I can't speak to that. No. Sorry. But you, obviously, you are an observer of the media as a professional. Is it in terms of advertising, do you see that sort of imagery? Well, I don't generally buy women's magazines, sorry, I see. Senator. No, fair enough. Uh, would you say that this has changed with new people coming into the industry, new generation of photographers coming in? Do you think this is getting better or worse? I, I don't think it's a direction that comes from photographers. And I can only speak from my experience, but I believe if you asked any of the photographers at News Corp, you would hear the same story. Yeah, that's my point. It goes to the question of culture. Yes. Not the question of your training, not to the question, no. but it's the culture that you actually receive that's what I'm saying, yes. in terms of your the working environment. Yes. That's that's a product that you're being asked to produce. Yeah. Uh, you. Um, what would happen uh, if you complained about these matters? Oh, you you would you couldn't complain. There wasn't an environment at work where you could could complain. So there's no mechanism through the union, for instance? I, I have never found the MEAA to be very helpful, except for possibly in the uh, pursuit of my redundancy. Uh, did you raise the matter through the union? Uh, no, I did not. I did make an effort on occasion to take photos of men in a sexist light to try and make the balance, and, and I was um, derided and or made fun of for that, for you know, taking a photo of a man, mm -hmm. exercising or so forth. Look, given the public debate about the issues that around uh, the questions of the culture of sexism and, and, and sexual violence, do you think the media plays a part in the creation or the furthering of attitudes in these areas? Most definitely. So this, when we talk about the role of the media in terms of fostering a democratic value, social values, do you think this actually contributes to negative social attitudes as well. Yes, I do. I've, I, I remember, you know, ditch the witch. I've never heard a comparative thing against a male politician. So what can we do about this? What can be done to address these issues? I don't think that's issues? up to me to answer. Senator. No, but, look, but you're here to offer us advice. As a citizen of this country, yep. you're going to... A, a, right to put a view to the parliament. This is what this committee is. It's a representative of the parliament. Mm. You've got a right to put a view. So do you have an opinion as to what can be done? Could I take that question on notice and yeah, give it some proper can. consideration? That's it. And, Thanks and, so much. You know, perhaps you'd like to consider what role we could take on in terms of recommendations that we make uh, in terms of regulation, in terms of education, in terms of training, in terms of um, advice that we could provide uh, to newspapers and to other media, because it's not just confined to, surely this is not just confined to the printed aspects of the media, is it? I can only speak of my experience, you know, again, Sorry, Senator. But what's your observation? Is it Are these questions that are confined just to newspapers? I, I, I imagine if you turn on the television, Senator, there's not many uh, fat, or you know, overweight, over 35 women on the television either. And maybe it's advice we could tender to the union. Uh, I, possibly. If I, yeah, I don't Legal know. sanctions? Is this an area do you think we could 
canvas. If you would take it on notice, think about what legal sanctions are available. Uh, so yes, what sort of things can we do um, if we provide, uh, in terms of recommendations the committee might be able to make in your opinion? Thank you, I will. Would that be right? Thank you. Yes, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ms Rogers, you've outlined a number of um, uh, quite serious issues. Um, the representation and treatment of women uh, within um, News Corp pub publications. Um, you've talked about a, a, a culture within the workplace that continues that um, treatment of women internally as well as externally. Um, you talk about a, a lack of support for journalists in um, when they're covering uh, uh, crises, um, whether it's bushfires or, or other um, events. Uh, you've talked about the um, influence of the, the clickbait um, culture, uh, summed up by um, the email that you've presented to us um, in relation to uh, the, the uh, facts and figures uh, of uh, online subscriptions and uh, uh, coverage. I, I want to focus on the treatment of women for a moment. Um, you've said that you were directed to get certain photographs of women to uh, depict them in certain ways. Um, could you just explain to me what pigs in lipstick refers to? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'd be putting word to me. It was, as I say, no one overweight, no one over 35, well dressed. Mm -hmm. um, they had to have teeth. That's a big thing. Mm. Um, it's North Queensland, so it was a directive to get attractive people to fit that, that met the standards of beauty, I guess, by the male hierarchy of News Corp. That mm. I understood after working there for so long. It's you know, it's sort of entrenched, really. Mm. Um, and did uh, were you ever directed uh, in relation to taking uh, photographs of uh, or using photographs of women that? Uh, perhaps the uh, newspaper didn't like? Uh, I don't know what you mean, sorry. Well, um, you know, there are sometimes, uh, we've, we've heard from um, other um, uh, evidence, of course, uh, the, de the depiction and the treatment of Julia Gillard when she was Prime Minister, um, and not just the, the, the news articles and the opinion pieces that were written about her, but uh, the photographs uh, that are used, the cartoons that are drawn, um, uh, other uh, you know, women that the that Murdoch, the Murdoch Press would uh, report on. Were you ever? Um, did you ever hear, or were you ever directed in relation to the types of photographs that were taken of women that uh, would sit alongside a critical news piece? Um. I'm not really sure. I'd have to take that on notice. Yeah, not, I'd have to give fine. that some consideration if I could. Yeah, that's fine. Um, could I retract the thing about teeth? That's really nasty. I shouldn't have said that. Just to be clear, though, these are the. the this is the um, uh, attitude and the expectation that you felt. Uh, yeah. That I was told. Yeah. That you were told, not that you felt. Let's yeah. be clear about that. That they you were told. No teeth. They have to have teeth, but it just sounds terrible when I say it. Yes. No, no, I understand. Um, in terms of uh, how women are, were spoken about um, within uh, the editorial uh, conversations about what would be in the paper, what wouldn't be in the paper, um, what stories to cover uh, or not, what was the general sense over your longevity working for News Corp in, in the way women were spoken about in the newsroom? Um, I, think, I think the journalists and photographers held women in respect. So it was a respectful position that we took. It was just the angle that was, t it's hard to describe that, but it was just the angle we, we, we had to take rather than the way we spoke about them all. Mm. Um, people would og ogle, ogle, ogle over a, if you had a photo of an attractive woman or she had particularly large breasts, it would get the attention of the male colleagues and, and uh, there would be comments made and so forth. 
Um, and to be clear, you were never given directions to take certain photographs of particular looking men? No. Um, in relation, I want to go to this issue of, um, that you raise of uh, lack of support uh, for uh, those working in the field. Uh, you mentioned bushfires. Um, could we expand on that a little bit? Um, We, have you, is there, is there counselling that's given after a, a, a traumatic event that you've had to cover? Uh, was there training beforehand? Was there ever, has there ever been any discussion um, with you about impacts of PTSD, for example? Um, there was no training provided for any <clears throat> covering of cyclones or um, bushfires. Um, what I was speaking to was the male colleagues had got, got provided with boots and pants and jackets and so forth but I, w I wasn't provided with any. Um, why, why was that? I'm not sure. Did you ask for them? I think I was expected to use the men's equipment. Mm. Um, I, there was one occasion when I, I was never off. I, I guess there was always, I don't know, counselling. Um, I did seek counselling at one point where a, um, a photo was um, used on the front page of the paper, which uh, created a huge backlash in the town and we got abusive phone calls and two pages of um, letters just saying I was as bad as the murder and so forth. And I did seek the, um, the services of a psychologist after that, but I, I think that was the only time. Mm. Okay. But in terms of uh, just not even being provided with the appropriate equipment that would fit, that mm. was appropriate for women, that just was never even thought of? Thought mm, of. No. I, well, I was the only female photographer. You know, mm. When I started there, I think there were five of us and I don't know, it just wasn't. Mm. But Did agenda. your male colleagues think that this was odd? Were they aware that you were uh, treated differently? I think they're aware, but you know, you, you can't you can't go on and on and on. You know, I was there for years. You can't keep whinging about stuff. Mm. Mm. Um, the point that you make about uh, when you returned uh, to work and were taken from a grade six down to a two A. Um, did you ever raise that with uh, your editors? When I was offered the um, position, um, it was after many years of, of applying and, and never getting a foot in the door, I actually said to the editor um, at the time that it was a lower grade than when I'd started on the Oz in 1993, and this was you know, after lots of experience, and he agreed that it, that it was lower than his grade starting in Fairfax. He unfortunately then was made um, redundant when he was on paternity leave. And um, when his replacement came, because he, he promised me, you know, I'll give you the, an upgrade at the earliest convenience. So I did raise this with my editor um, in 2016, and she told me that my work wasn't uh, good enough to wor be worthy of a pay rise. Um, and I was, I was very disappointed because I was a finalist in three major photo awards that year, you know, the, the Pampers, the Clarions and the, and the local awards. Um, but she did uh, say that I was upgraded from a 2A to a 3 but then when I investigated this with HR, she never actually um, forwarded that upgrade to the, the HR department. Um, I've got you know, a letter to that account. And I, I never received a pay rise, even though it was a, a double, you know, mm. two A, two B, and then a three. So I was mm. very disappointed, but yes, I did raise it. And because she told me, well, my work wasn't good enough, I, I, and I felt so, um, um, scared, I don't know, I, I, I didn't think it was, I couldn't raise it again with her. Mm. And then when you uh, finally left last year, uh, the redundancy package um, had you classified as a clerical staff yes. when you'd been a photographer for over 20 years? Yes, that's correct. Um, and do you believe that if you hadn't uh, raised concern with that, that, it, that just would have, that, that would have been what you uh, exited with? I believe I would have had to employ a lawyer and, and, and take the action, some action privately. Mm. Um, what is your uh, sense of your colleagues? Um, do, would any of them be surprised at the types of evidence that you're putting to us today? I, I don't believe so. I think um, the nature of the toxic workplace is that there has been such a high staff turnover. Um, I think that's indicative in itself of, of, of the nature of the workplace. That, mm. You know, the fact that you, you end up with one, one woman in a team with 12 males, the women all left. We were brought to tears, you know, time and time again. Um, 
derided and so forth, I think, treated differently to the men, and, and they all left. Mm. Mm. Um, and that's a very significant shift from 50 per cent yes. women to... Uh, I believe it has been improved slightly. I believe they have employed uh, two more women um, mm. since that. So there's three now out of the Three 15. out of 15. Three out of 15, yeah. Mm. Um, what role do you um, see this type of um, workplace culture, the representation of, of women playing, in then the media's uh, reporting of uh, these broader issues? And we are in the midst of a national conversation right now about mm. the treatment of women, mm. uh, the way we speak about uh, the issues specific to, to women. Uh, the way we uh, leaders respond to those issues. Um, how does a, a newspaper report on that fairly if they have a toxic culture? No, I, 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 I'm not sure. I, yeah, I don't know. You think that's a problem? I think that's definitely a problem, yes. When you left, was there any... Uh, opportunity for you to, to air any of, of, of these concerns about the way News Corp treats women? Uh, no. I did make a short speech, but it was sort of limited to my career's move from Marbo to Best Donut, but that was, I sort of kept it quite short. Mm. Um, you talked about the clickbait uh, and the, um, the subscription targets. Could we just expand on that uh, a little bit? What... So I've, I did provide a document that set out, we were directed that, um, it was a new initiative that, that everything we did had to be um, directed to uh, either page views or subscriptions. And um, oh, we were given a, um, a, a, a target and we had to agree to that. I don't know if it is attached actually. I had some notes on it. Um, and I felt that it was an, oh, okay, here, this one. This was my goal that I was told I had to uh, agree yes. to. Yes. So that was um, my subscription target. Um, I explained to the um, editor that I didn't think it was possible because, um, and I thought it was unfair, because even if I came up with a story idea, took the photo, gave the journalist the contact number of the person, then that journalist would get, if someone subscribed or page, this journalist would get those page views and subscriptions, not me, even though I had initiated and that would be the same for the male photographers as well. Um, so I thought the whole system was very unfair, and I believe the um, subscription model has led to um, where journalists are pitted against each other. You know, there's, it's like a Hunger Games of the newsroom now, where it'll be the last man standing who can get the most clicks, um, or in the last newspaper standing, I guess. Uh, you know, things like on this last bit, I had, to, I was had to get three page ones and three back pages a week minimum. You know, there were three of us. The paper only comes out six times a week. You know, it's not possible for, you know, so it was, they set us unachievable goals. Mm. And so the newsroom, the atmosphere in the newsroom was, um, was, uh, was terrible after that. And, mm. and I believe it's got worse. Mm. Um, and that type of uh, specific targets for individual journalists, whether they be photographic journalists or um, news journalists, do you believe that that takes a reductionist uh, mm. position for yeah. public interest journalism? Oh, definitely. The union at the time did tell us not to, we didn't have to agree to this, and I, I did refuse to um, agree to it, but I was threatened with um, uh, disciplinary action with, by HR and um, uh, felt that my job was being uh, uh, threatened if I did not agree to hurt the terms that were set out by the editor. Um, but I just put in very vague terms and she seemed to accept that, but at one point she was consulting with HR to see what could be done about me mm. for my refusal to accept the subscription targets. What, so could be, what could be done about you? Yeah. How you could be managed or what disciplined? Action could be yes, what action could be taken. Mm. Um, were you ever able to meet these targets? I uh, don't know. Never met these targets ever. Was any of your colleagues able to meet these targets? I think occasionally um, with, uh, if there was a big breaking news story, yes, uh, they may have met those targets. Mm. Yeah. Is it surprising to you that 
um, as a journalist, you're asked to um, meet targets like this that sounds more like a sales rep type target than someone who's covering news and current affairs. It's definitely new and um, it, it, it made me, un it, it's, not, it's not right, you know, it's not, it's not what I went into newspapers. I, I, I love newspapers. I've lived from the time I went to university and studied journalism, I've lived for newspapers and I'm terribly sad to see it be reduced to this really, mm. as are many of my colleagues too. The, the email that you received um, from the general manager, uh, which uh, quotes, just to be clear, is this a man? Yes, this is yes. a man. Um, where he quotes that he gets forensically analysed, uh, not a spelling mistake. I mean, firstly, is that type of language used in official communication very often? I was surprised. Um, was the sen what, what was the purpose of this email? I don't know, and at the end, you'll note, he says, uh, in other words, thank you and maintain the rage. And I didn't know what that referred to either. So I, 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 as I say, I was surprised at the email. I, I thought it was a surprising thing to put in writing. Um, um, was this the general manager saying that he understands that the pressure to meet these targets is frustrating to you all, but I, this I is the business. I can't speak to what he was wanted to say. Mm, okay. So. Um, what I would, uh, is it, was this target regime, is this, is this normal? Is this, uh, is this something that's across News Limited papers now? Is that your understanding? That's it's not understanding, just the Cairns yes. Post? Yes, that's my understanding. It's across all sure. News Corp publications. Mm. I might go to uh, Senator Fawcett, and then we've got a few follow-ups from um, uh, Senator Carr. Senator Fawcett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to very briefly touch on the issue of uh, the disaster coverage that journalists do and the lack of support around uh, trauma and post-traumatic stress. Uh, you may be aware there are there's a growing uh, concern around that. Um, Kate McMahon, for example, uh, 2016 published a paper through Swinburne University of Technology. There's been some people here in South Australia, uh, one journalist in particular who's uh, I think doing a PhD into that topic. Uh, in our terms of reference, we, we have a, a catch-all at the end of any related matters. And uh, in a similar vein to Senator Carr, who indicated that this, is, this committee is an opportunity for members of the public to communicate to the parliament. Uh, if there were measures that media organisations, and in particular your employer, could have taken that would have supported you better in terms of preparation for and uh, support post-traumatic events. Uh, I'd invite you to consider um, putting something further in writing to the committee as to those sort of areas, because that may form part of uh, what the committee may choose to publish in our recommendations. I will do that. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carr. A couple of things. Uh, uh, newspapers uh, news uh, often says that it represents local communities. Yes. Senator to Carr, can I just interrupt you for sure. one moment? Um, uh, we just need to check with the uh, committee members that we're happy for photographers uh, to be <laughs> covering the photographer. <laughs> as long as he's kind. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have no. No one. No, no one has any objections. Thank you. Go ahead. So. Uh, is, was it your, is it your view that the Cairns Post, for instance, did accurately reflect its community in uh, terms of the photographic images that you were asked to produce? Could I take that on notice? Yes. I, yes, thank you. And secondly, were you asked to produce 
uh, images in terms of ethnic communities, given the diversity of the population in North Queensland? Uh, if it was an ethnic specific uh, story, then yes. But if it was a story about the budget, it was probably frowned upon to get someone who wasn't. Okay. Um, and finally, I noticed in the advertiser on the 12th of March 2021, there's a Cairns photographer, Anne Rogers, shares her favourite pics. I take it that's you? That's Anne, Anna. Anna. That's me, yes. That's right. Yes, Sorry, that's Anne, correct. Anna, my apologies. No, you're right. Um, did you pick those photos? Yes, I did. Okay. Because there's some interesting photographs in those. Oh, thank you, Senator. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, that's all. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rogers, overall, you think News Corp has a toxic culture in relation to women? Uh, yes, I do. And you, you believe that because of your own experience? Yes, I do. And what you were asked to do as a journalist? As a photographer, yeah. Um, do you think that this is that that culture and the approach of how women are presented in these newspapers is different to how women are presented in other newspapers? You mean the Fairfax papers? Uh, I think it probably is. Yes. Mm. Um, this is an inquiry into media diversity. Do you believe that diversity uh, is under threat when there are uh, targets for subscription types of stories, types of presentation? Do you think that that makes it harder and harder to ensure there is a diversity of news and public interest journalism? Yes, I believe so. Um, You've taken uh, quite a few uh, questions on notice, and we appreciate that. And you know, if you could give us some considered responses, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, I just wanted to ask one final question around the issue of bias. We've heard from um, uh, uh, Mr. Kosh today, uh, another former News Limited journalist who'd been at the organisation for a number of years, that he believes there is significant bias uh, in the newspapers, uh, political bias, bias towards different uh, issues, uh, groups within the community. Um, you heard some of his testimony, but do you, ex do you from your experience, uh, do you see that there is bias? I do recall a particular um, uh, incident with a, um, a state politician and I came back with a photo of him. I think it was about AFL, a story about AFL, and the editor was cross because he didn't want the, um, the politician in the photo. And then he said, oh, no, we'll run this one because he looks like an idiot. And I think that was one of the very few times that that Labor politician actually appeared in the paper. Um, I also think that you know the visits by Tony Abbott, by Scott Morrison, I'm pretty sure he came to visit, um, reinforced you know, the angle that we were expected to, to take. So I'm you mean sure visits relevant. to the newsroom? Yes. What would happen when the Prime Minister would come to the newsroom? Uh, he would meet with the editor and the, the, um, you know, the managing bosses. Mm. And were you all told that he would, uh, that well, the Prime Minister would be coming? Yeah, and he'd come and speak to the, the, um, the newsroom and come and say hello and so forth. And what was the expectation of, the, the, of your colleagues and uh, you as people who work in the newsroom if the Prime Minister came to visit? I think it was probably pretty mixed, really. Mm. Um, Chair, sorry, can I ask one follow-up question there? Yes, Senator Fawcett. Just for the, the sake of um, balance, were, in your recollection, their visits by members of other political parties who were ministers or at times Prime Minister? Uh, not that I recall, but I, could I take that on notice, please? Sure, thank you. So, so the member for Leichhardt, uh, one of your favourite pictures here is highlighted. I mean, do you think uh, Warren Inch got a, a different run from Labor candidates and the former member for Leichhardt, who was a Labor member when, uh, during your period? 
I'm trying to. Who was the? I'm, I, I've known more, Mr. Warren Edge for well, a long time. Well, there's been a, 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 um, the uh, previous members. Uh, oh, when it started. Oh, yes. God, um, so what? Just a question is: Was there special? Was there advice given to you about the way in which conservative members of parliament were to be treated? Uh, it wasn't so much advice given to me, it was the coverage that they received, whether yes. they would receive any coverage at all. And did Labor candidates get different treatment? Uh, it, it, it has depended on, in the years over the, with, with different editors. So it, it has really- You were there a long time. I mean, uh, uh, but on different papers. I worked in Cairns on the Australian, the Kurimal and the Cairns Post. So it really did vary depending on- I'm, uh, I'm thinking specifically about the situation in Cairns, given that Cairns is, uh, in a marginal seat. It, it attracts a lot of visiting politicians. Did you note the way that you might have taken a lot of photographs, but the way in which they were placed in the newspaper? Um, I'd like to take that on notice too. You Sorry, please? Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms Rogers, thank you so much for your evidence today, and we appreciate the, um, the frankness uh, that you've responded uh, uh, to our questions with. Um, uh, we, yes, we're very grateful that you've made points? the way. Is it possible to make a couple of other points or have had my time? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you to, to make some other points. To get back to us too. Yes. Yeah. I just, there are a couple of things with the toxic workplace that I realised I hadn't had time to mention that I thought if I could bring up. Yes, Just in point ahead. form, could I do that? Um, a colleague who returned from maternity leave was offered no flexibility with regard to her hours and consequently resigned. That's quite recently. Uh, there was unlimited overtime and toil with no pay or um, uh, yeah. uh, told that if I didn't like my job, I could get a job at Macca's. Who told uh, you that? My uh, picture editor, uh, the, new, don't one, uh, the contract that we all had to sign gave the company the right to listen into our phone conversations and you couldn't get a job with News Corp without signing that. Um, Is that still current? Uh, yes. Uh, I wasn't ever offered employment under the EBA. I was only ever offered employment under the contract. Um, I have no of employees on the award who weren't paid their entitlements or penalties. I know of cadets who weren't graded accordingly after the requisite time. So when I say high staff turnover, since 2015, we've had 53 staff leave our little office, 30 resigned, 19 have been made redundant, three sacked and two died. Um, what else? Uh, uh, oh, they celebrated International Women's Day online by doing an, um, a, a female fashion spread with um, photos of 20 women wearing uh, outfits. Uh, when the business editor uh, was a male, he was a very senior position. When it was given to a female, she was in the same junior classification as myself. And that was about it. Um, can I go back to this point about the phone conversations? Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, if you would, uh, this is a phone conversation, if you were on the phone in the office? Uh, any, any, by any means, it says in our contract. Uh, surveillance in the office and on your telephone by any means, I think it says. Right. Mm. Um, and that wouldn't just be for photographers, this is for across the board. board. That's correct. So a journalist speaking to a confidential source would have their phone be able to be listened to by um, management? They've agreed to that in their contract, I believe. Or I have to agree it in my contract. I believe it's across the board. So sources aren't actually protected at, at News Limited then? I, I guess so. I think it says something about can be listened into. I'm not sure if it can be recorded, but I, the office is um, surveillance, any means available. I'd have to, I'd have to take that on notice. Can I check my contract? Uh, because if I, you I could know check I, your contract, that I would know, be very helpful. Yeah, yeah. provide that, that section yeah. to us. Sorry, if, if, can that be provided? Of, that of course, section, yes, that'd be, yes, of course. That's covered under parliamentary privilege. Yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could provide that to us, that would yeah. be helpful. Um, the uh, example in relation to maternity leave. Yeah. Um, You say that's quite recently? Yes. Within the last 12 months? Yes. And so what has occurred there? Uh, she resigned. She resigned. And could I make the point the editor is a female too? So it is quite disappointing to be 
you know, led by a female who's um, led the newsroom down this pathway as well. Mm. Ms Rogers, thank you for your evidence. Thank you we very much. Will, um, uh, we wait for your uh, answers to questions on notice. Um, we've been, if we can give you um, the date of the the 26th of March, um, that would be helpful if you need more time um, or you have it prior to that, um, be in contact with the, the Secretariat. Thank we you really much, appreciate Senators. your evidence today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Rogers. I didn't want Jim Turnow named as the idiot MP that they were referring to. <laughs> she asked me what was his name. I thought. Um, so we now welcome representatives of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, Mr Rod Sims, to the table. And I understand there are uh, two colleagues of Mr Sims on video conference, Ms Bond and Mr Lima, I can't quite read it with my eyesight from here, I think. But we'll get you to um, pronounce uh, who you are and the positions that you hold and the capacity in which you appear today. So we might start with Mr Sims. Thank you. And now to your colleagues. Tom Loyner, Executive General Manager of the Mergers, Exemptions and Digital Division at the ACCC. Thanks, Mr. Loyner. I'm Morag Bond, Joint General Manager of the Digital Platforms Branch at the ACCC. Wonderful. I understand information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. Uh, Mr. Sims, do you have a short opening statement for us? No, I'd rather just get straight into questions. Great. Thank you. Focus on what you're interested in. Wonderful. You're uh, familiar with the terms of reference of our inquiry? Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I'll, I'll hand over to my colleagues, but perhaps just to, to, to start off with, um, I'd really like to know uh, from you whether the Commission has looked at the issue of media, and, uh, media diversity and whether you think there is a concern about the lack of diversity amongst Australia's media. Uh, we don't look at that directly, Senator. That's very much a... I mean, from an institutional point of view, that's very much an ACMA mm. issue. Um, our focus is on competition. Mm. Um, and I guess if there's any, uh, uh, well, there is good news out of uh, going digital in the sense that that has enabled increased competition to come in. Um, uh, you've got a number of new players like The Guardian, The Daily Mail, The Conversation, The Monthly, Saturday paper and so forth. Um, and I think now newspapers, I mean, of course, we've got news limited at 65, 70% of the newspapers, but now I think companies, traditionally newspaper companies think of themselves uh, as digital first, uh, as well as newspapers. And so uh, we very much, when assessing the market, I mean, I mean, we're looking at it in all its dimensions when we assess something, but Certainly when you look at the top websites, uh, news websites that people go to, um, you know, you've got um, uh, nine, uh, News Limited, ABC, Seven, um, uh, and uh, Daily Mail, Guardian, all up there. Um, so, I mean, we're the competition regulator, we'd like more competition, but uh, uh, I think having things going digital does allow a bit more competition. Um, uh, and one point that um, I often make is that, you know, when I was growing up, the ABC was just uh, TV and radio. I probably read as much of the ABC as I listen or 
or, or watch it, mm -hmm. uh, just because I get these feeds all the time. You go on the website, so they're very much uh, uh, a digital, and so therefore, in a way, they're now more directly competing with what was once news, just newspapers. So I think you've got more competition than you had before, but look, I'll let the question of diversity go to others. Mm -hmm. So j just to, um, uh, I guess, tease that out a little bit, uh, you're, are you saying that diversity is different to competition? Yes, I think it is. Um, uh, I mean, competition, the more competition you've got, I think it follows the more diversity you've got. Mm. Uh, but sometimes people uh, think of diversity in a different way that, that doesn't actually impact competition. Um, and uh, I, I probably hesitate to raise this, but I will anyway, because I suspect there'll be a question on uh, the acquisition uh, by uh, News Limited of uh, APN in Queensland. Mm. And that was a quite an interesting example, really, because uh, we looked at that very carefully, as you'd expect. Um, uh, and in the end, I mean, we, we looked at it from a number of dimensions, both the advertising dimension and the, I guess, the reader's perspective. And when we looked at it, um, we formed the view that what was in the Courier-Mail wasn't really in those daily newspapers at all. They were very daily. Uh, sorry, they were very local. Sorry, what am I saying? Very local. Um, and so the, the local newspapers that APN had very much had local news and there wasn't much crossover at all with what was in the Courier Mail. So we judged that you, you, you aren't sitting there deciding, gosh, will I get the local newspaper or the Courier Mail today? You might buy both, but you wouldn't think of them as substitutes. Mm. And, you know, we did a lot of looking at the papers. We did a lot of research on the ground. So in our view, there wasn't a competition issue there. Um, some might, with a different hat on, say, well, the voice behind all of that is a common voice. Now, whether that manifests itself when you've got the Courier-Mail dealing with state and national news and the local papers dealing with local news or not, again, I leave others to judge. But, but that could be a diversity issue mm. that would be different from a competition issue. Mm. And that's probably as as good as an example as I could give, and I'm probably preempting your question, you were going to ask me anyway. Um, actually, I was going to go straight to that point, so <clears throat> thank you. Um, what do you say uh, then uh, that in response to News Corp um, acquiring these newspapers and then closing them? We uh, had some information which I need to be careful I don't go into, but there was certainly a sense that APN was at risk of closing some of them anyway. I mean, there was just a question of fundamental viability. So I don't think we formed the view that News Limited just wanted to buy them and kill them because in a sense, the, the ones they closed were just local media. I mean, there was nothing else there. So um, I don't think they had an incentive to close off opinion by, by, by closing them. I think they just made a judgment of viability, which we can't <coughs> second guess. Um, the good news is that there are, at least in some areas, and I don't have all the data, uh, new people coming along. And I, I guess the view I'd put for, for local newspapers, which is what APN was, um, often you find that the best people to do local newspapers are local people. I mean, when you're talking about a newspaper that's got a circulation of three, four, five thousand 5,000 for a local town, mm -hmm. it can be very difficult for big organisations to, to, to run those properly. So uh, we'll, we'll just see how that plays out. But there have been a few extra independents coming in, which of course is great to see. Mm. Um, could I... Uh go to a couple of points that you've raised in your official submission um, uh, to us. Uh, firstly, uh, in relation to Facebook, Google and um, Twitter um, and the impact uh, that these global platforms have on uh, the media industry and sharing of news in Australia. Obviously, we've had um, uh, quite a um, lengthy debate uh, in Parliament recently uh, in relation to uh, the uh, news bargaining code. Um, 
there's been a number of articles recently and uh, just in the last week uh, suggesting that Facebook uh, is not negotiating in good faith um, with smaller players or even some of the larger players. Mm. Um, what's your response to this? And uh, is, there, is there something more that needs to be done? Uh, I'm happy to give it a bit more time and therefore not do anything at the moment. Obviously, there'll come a time where you might need to do something, but I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I mean, the way I see that is uh, that the purpose of the Media Bargaining Code was to improve the bargaining power of the news media businesses with Facebook and Google. I think the News Media Bargaining Code has done that, and uh, we've seen a lot of deals with Google, although I note there's not yet one with the ABC, which I'm hoping to see soon. Um, with Facebook, they've done one with Seven West Media, and I think uh, um, uh, private, uh, um, Swartz Media, media um, Social Media, Private Media, if I've got the names right. I don't, not sure Morag's nodding ahead as much as I'd like to say that I've got them right. But anyway, they've done three or four deals with smaller players as well as Seven West, West Media. Um, the, 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 the fact that you've got a more even bargaining power, though, you know, doesn't mean that Facebook will just agree to whatever mm. the, the news media business wants or news media business will. I mean, obviously, now they can stand up to Facebook, whereas they just clearly absolutely could not before. You could just see it, it was take it or leave it territory. Now it's more even, I suspect, and the sense I'm getting is that negotiations in many respects are going on, but they're, they're quite rugged. Uh, and as you implied, you know, they don't have a, Facebook don't have a deal with either Nine, ABC or News Limited, which are the top three players in the country. So uh, that's pretty important. Um, uh, but I think give it time. I think, I think you know, the, the deals I've I sort of, you know, beat at the peripheries out because obviously we're not involved in those, but I mm. occasionally ring up a few people and sometimes they're, they're pretty hectic. They take a lot of time. Uh, so I think, I think it's a little, that's a long-winded way of saying I think it's got a bit further to play out. Mm. I wouldn't be jumping to conclude. I mean, the fact that Google did some, um, them so quickly, I think reflected that they were more advanced. Facebook, I think, is coming from a bit of a back marker. Uh, let's see how it plays out. Mm. But... Uh you're not opposed to using the stick if need be in terms of um, uh, designating, using the power to designate in the legislation? Oh, I would have thought that logically follows. That's the tests. Uh, the two tests for the Treasurer are bargaining imbalance, which we believe has been uh, imbalance, and we believe that hurdle has jumped in the case of Facebook and Google, and uh, uh, whether they've done sufficient deals. Now, if you haven't done a deal with the top three players, and you know, I would add personally in their Australian community media and players like that, then I don't think you've jumped that hurdle. So I think that that would naturally follow. But mm. I think it's too early to make the call. Mm. Um, um, Mr Rudd has appeared before us uh, in this inquiry and uh, he spoke at the press club uh, this week. He had a bit of a swipe at you. I've uh, had swipes from both Mr Rudd and Mr Keating uh, <laughs> recently on these issues, both of whom I know quite well, but they did that didn't stop them giving me a decent whack. <laughs> um, you've addressed the um, APN uh, issue. Um, what, what role um, can the ACCC play in ensuring that we don't have a more concentrated media uh, in Australia, but indeed a, a, a more diverse one? Notwithstanding that ACMA is the, the mm, appropriate media sure. agency, but there is clearly a role in agreeing, uh, overseeing, ensuring that acquisitions, for example, are appropriate and are in the public interest. A absolutely. absolutely. Well, well, the test we apply under Section 50 uh, is in essence only that the merger um, doesn't have the likely effect of substantially lessening competition. That's, that's the test we have to apply. We're a competition regulator. Um, if we judged that uh, something did substantially lessen competition, it's open to the parties to open up a wider public interest uh, agenda. But, but just, just putting that aside, it's, it's a substantial lessening of competition test. I, I think that, as I say, you know, I made the comment earlier about the difference between competition 
and diversity with the uh, News Limited acquisition of APN. And, and, you know, I think it is important that, the, I mean, in merger analysis, it's all about defining the market. And our judgment was they were local markets. Um, there were radio stations there and the, the local advertisers were either advertising in the local paper or the local radio. They weren't advertising in the alternative in the Courier Mail. And likewise, as I said, the readership was different. So we just said they're in different markets and if they're in different markets, there's no issue. Uh, if I could just divert, and then I'll come back to your question on you know the Fairfax 9 matter, uh, which I still have the scars from uh, Mr. Keating. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, a similar issue in a way. Uh, there you had uh, Nine, which owned a television station, buying Fairfax, which owned three very important newspapers and the Macquarie Radio Network which I also always think is interesting from a diversity point of view. Back in Fairfax's days, um, uh, the Macquarie Radio Network was owned by the same people who owned the, and ran the Melbourne Age. I mean, they're quite different. Um, they, they put a different perspective on things and yet they're owned by the one entity. Uh, but nonetheless, Nine, the TV station, was buying newspapers and radio. So in a narrow definition, they weren't in the same market. Once you broadened the definition and said, okay, this is the market for news, you had TV, radio, print, and of course online there as well. So I, I, again, we didn't, you know, I mean, yes, there's less players in the market because if you think they're all in the one market, then you, you know, Fairfax combining with nine, meaning there's, le there's less players. But, and so almost by definition, there's a bit less competition, but mm -hmm. it, in our view, just never met the threshold of substantial lessening of competition and, and would not. Now, just to go back to your question, um, I mean, our merger laws, in our view, do need to be improved. In our view, they're not adequate. When Fairfax was up for sale, I said publicly that, uh, and you know, it's some would argue not appropriate for me to do what I'm about to say that I did, which was to say quite publicly that we would not allow News Limited to buy Fairfax. Now, you might think that's obvious, but I said that loudly and clearly to get the message out had News Corp wanted to buy Fairfax and that went to court, I honestly don't know whether we'd have won or lost. Mm. And that's where the merger laws, I think, do need, because that, I think, by any definition, should never be allowed. It didn't happen. It probably wasn't even contemplated. But uh, that's where, I mean, we could improve our merger laws. But that's a general issue rather than a media diversity issue. Um, you know, we weren't able to stop an effective two to one on the RAF rate market recently, we weren't able to stop AGL buying Macquarie Generation, which I think pushed up electricity prices. They've gone back down now. But um, so I think there's a general problem with our merger laws. But but I don't, I don't, I mean, from a, I think you've just got to, I mean, it's all about instruments and objectives. And, and our merger laws are aimed at competition. Mm. And that will help. If you want additional things for diversity, that's where you go to the ACMA laws. And of course, there are still remaining ACMA laws, not many now, but some that do go to that diversity issue. Do you think Channel 10 uh, is important in the uh, broadcast space for competition? Uh, yes, I do. Um, obviously, nine and seven are the main players, but 10 puts itself in a certain part of the market. It's also got a website, so it's providing news. Um, there was, I think if my memory serves me correctly, and my pardon if it didn't, uh, at some stage thought that news might want to take over 10. And again, we probably would have opposed that too, because you've got Sky and 10 would have said, well, that's a decrease in competition in the television market. Now, we never got to assess it in detail. So um, uh, where we've come out, I'm not sure. But again, that in the market, we could then define that that would be a concern. Mm. Uh Senator Carr. Look, uh, Mr. Zippich, you, you mentioned that you've been criticised uh, for the position you've taken. Uh, um, just, it's not surprising to me that, uh, given that the national competition regulator is arguing that competition or diversity aren't necessarily related, that you would be criticised. I mean, doesn't this well, tell strong us overlap, Senator? Sorry, if I could just interrupt. I mean, they, they strongly overlap, but they're not completely overlap. Well, it's just it's a bit more than overlap because I mean, it, surely it tells us something about why we've got such weak competition laws in the country. If if you take that view, uh, given the uh, 
digital platforms inquiry, that's essentially the argument you presented there. I mean, is it any, any wonder that people would criticise you for arguing that case? Oh, I think the issues with... I mean, I think... I think under any merger laws that we would want... I mean, so, so we're arguing for improvement of the merger laws. But even with the improved merger laws, we would still have approved uh, nine, uh, News' mm -hmm. acquisition of APN All right. because we saw them in different markets and we would have still approved okay, so, uh, so Nine's you can acquisition help me of Fairfax. With this, then. In terms of the context of the Australian economy, how does the ACCC define monopoly? Uh, well, monopoly is defined generally as when you've got complete control of the market. No, control. Market dominance, how is that defined? Uh, look, again, it's where you've got the ability to do things without much constraint from your competitors. So how does News Limited fit into those categories? Oh, I think News Limited is uh, constrained by nine. I think it's constrained by I the see. ABC. I think it's constrained so by so Seven West and a lot you, of other players. Would you say that Australia has got one of the highest levels of media ownership, media concentration in the world? Look, I haven't done that analysis, Maybe Senator, you. but I would just observe, if I could, that mm. if you think about the sectors of the Australian economy mm -hmm. and how concentrated they are, as I say, on the East Coast, we've just gone from two to one rail freight companies, mm -hmm. or two and a half to one and a half. Um, uh, we've got many more concentrated sectors than the media sector in Australia. And that justifies the media being dominated by so few players? Well, it's a question of what you mean by dominance, Senator. I think these things are different people reasonable people can have different views, but if I look at our media sector uh, and, I, and someone says, you know, who are the main players? I'd say, yes, News Limited's one. Nine certainly is one because of their TV, radio, and I mean, they've probably got the dominant commercial radio network in every city, uh, and they've got very important newspapers. The ABC okay. has got radio, TV everywhere, Seven West Media. Um, but, you know, I, a lot of people I know read The Guardian. But I you... mean, there's just a... Yeah, yeah, so a lot of people I know read The Guardian doesn't necessarily change dramatically the level of ownership and control of the media in this country in percentage terms. The ACCC, you've, I mean, have, have you reviewed the current, the evolving situation in regard to uh, what's happening across uh, Queensland and New South Wales? I mean, you, you make the point in your submission that the reduction in quality is actually relevant to competition considerations. Absolutely, it is. So, yes. would you say there's been a reduction in quality as a result of the mergers that have occurred? I don't think there's been a reduction in quality from those two mergers, no, Senator. So have you have you re reviewed them? How, how do you know that? Uh, we have not done an ex post review. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how can you say there's that there's not been a reduction in quality? Well, there's just nothing that's come out that would suggest that. Mm -hmm. You just don't know. That'd be more accurate, wouldn't you? There's no evidence I've seen that mm, that would lead to that conclusion. So I'm just interested to know, I mean, do you think the question of foreign ownership of a private company, for instance, Fact News Corp is a foreign owned company, a wholly owned subsidiary of the News Corporation of the United States. Do you think that has any bearing on, on the media landscape in this country? I don't think so, Senator, but yeah, others yeah. might have a different view. These are subjective yeah, issues. Think. These are a subjective matter, is it? Well, I think it is, yes, absolutely. I think whether, whether or not, I mean, your concern mm -hmm. about foreign, anyone's concern about foreign ownership in any sector, mm -hmm. I mean, we run into this well, all the time, and that's, it's really Ferb's job, not ours, yeah, yeah, sure, but this sure. comes up all the time and yeah. different people but bounce But in terms of ways. the media, is the question of foreign ownership and foreign control of our media in terms of foreign influence on our media, have any bearing at all on that consideration? It has no, no uh, influence on the competition assessment. Mm -hmm. And I totally accept that News Corp is foreign owned, but I do make the point that Nine, ABC, Seven West Media mm. are not. Guardian is foreign owned, Daily Mail is foreign owned. So there is, a, I, I accept there's a degree of foreign ownership, but that does not come into our I competition see. assessment. Uh, and what, should they be subject to the foreign uh, ownership, the foreign oh, I'm sure influences? they are. If, if, they take, if they do an acquisition, I'm sure they're subject to FERB, but uh, my colleagues might correct mm -hmm. me, but I assume they're covered by FERB, just like any other acquisition. So um, the, in terms of the actions of the uh, government in regard to the operations of the new 
uh, digital platforms mandatory bargaining code. How do you see the that working, particularly for smaller players within the industry? Look, I've all we'll have to see how it plays out, but I've always taken the view that on a per journalist basis, the smaller players might end up doing a bit better uh, than their number of journalists would suggest, because I think that uh, it's quite easy for the main players to do deals with them. It doesn't take that much money when you're an organisation with, say, five journalists. Some organisations might have less than that. So, I, I mean, they've, they've got the right, I mean, subject to, and it's obviously up, depends on what, how many deals Google and Facebook do, but um, I, I know that Google's talking to some of the smaller players. Facebook's already done a deal with three or four of the smaller players, and I, you know, if they're going to jump the hurdle in the legislation, uh, I can't believe they won't have to do a deal with the Australian community media, for example, and they've already done a deal with uh, uh, many of the smaller players. So you're expecting all the smaller players or just the ones you've mentioned availing themselves of the collective bargaining under the code? They, well, you've got to be above the 150,000, yes. Senator, but, but uh, that they, I mean, they can come to us to get an approval to collectively bargain. I know there's discussion about that going on. So what, sorry, can you outline what the nature of those discussions are? Oh, it's just different groups talking amongst themselves about whether and when they might do that. So still uh, in the discussion stage, Senator. So um, is it not they're reliant upon the government designating platform services under the code is that not a criteria for those negotiations to actually take place? Well, it, it works like this. Um, once uh, Google or Facebook are designated, then you automatically are allowed to collectively bargain. But absent designation, you can get together and still apply to the ACCC for authorisation to collectively bargain. And I don't imagine it would take us too long to give that approval. So there's just that other way to do it, and that's what's being discussed. So how, how real, in your judgment, is the threat of regulation or designation, as you put it, uh, in view of the fact that, uh, well, the current negotiations? Oh, I think it's the only reason the negotiations are going on, Senator. I was observing prior to the code coming along the interaction between the platforms and the news media businesses. and that was take it or leave it stuff. The fact that you've got the deals Google signed and Facebook signed, I think is completely due to the code and hopefully uh, there'll be more and we'll get the deals done. And if we get the deals done, then designation's irrelevant. So why did it take so long? Why did what take so long? So long to get the arrangements made. The, they have the arrangements that have been made. Why did it take so long to get those made? Oh, I think Senator first, well, two points. Uh, one, of course, the code was subject to a lot of um, uh, discussion uh, with various parties. We put the first draft code out in July. Obviously, it got approved by this parliament very recently, but there are a lot of discussions going on. It's complex legislation. You have to consult with people. Secondly, you are getting the parties, Google and Facebook, to do something they just don't want to do. So it takes time. I mean, I uh, look, personally, if you'd have asked me 12 months ago, uh, and you'd have said, you're going to be in this position in 12 months' time, how's that? I'd say, that's, that's very good. Mm. And do you anticipate uh, that um, we will see the designation at any point? It very much depends. The deal's being done, Senator. I think it's in the hands of Facebook and Google as to whether designation, it's, their, it's, it's almost their call. Obviously, the Treasurer is the one who makes the decision, but I think, I think they can control that and, it's, uh, and we'll see what they want to do. Is it your view that there should be a threshold uh, before a designation is actually invoked? Oh, look, I think the threshold's in the legislation. I accept, Senator, very much. Uh, it's the Treasurer's call as to what meets that, mm. that threshold. But, you know, if you think of Facebook, uh, they haven't done a deal with either of the, any of the big three media companies. I would have thought that's not, that's not going to cut it. And I mentioned before, Google still hasn't done a deal with the ABC and they're one of the top three news organisations. So I think they've both got a bit more work to do to meet the threshold. But, but again, it's not so my judgment, it's the, the threshold. threshold. Just, you do mention the word threshold. What is that threshold? It's what's in the legislation, Senator. So explain that to me, would you? Uh, 
well, uh, I don't have the words in front of me, although I can tell my colleague is grabbing them right now, uh, but the thresholds are twofold. Uh, do, do the platforms, to, to be designated, the Treasurer has to determine whether the platforms have uh, a su substantial bargaining power, and in our view that's, that's met, but he has to make that call. Secondly, uh, have there been uh, significant deal, I don't have the words in front of me, do you have them, Morag, under that second um, I think it's significant investment, I'm, I'm just double checking exact words. So I think the word significant, so it's got to be, I mean, if you could put it in sort of lay terms, it, it's sort of, you've got to do a significant number of deals now. So a number of deals, and is there a quantum issue involved? Is, is there... The legislation doesn't do that, Senator, so that's, it's, question, it's in the hands of the Treasurer. The, so these that. are all subjective measures, are they? Oh, well, I think the, look, I think it's a, it's a judgment call against the words in the law. So mm -hmm. the words mm -hmm. in the law uh, are quite clear, they're not, uh, you know, and so it's the Treasurer's judge, um, but that, that's not unusual. I mean, we have a whole lot of laws that, that have things laid out and the relevant minister has to make a call sure, against that, them. I mean, that's the nature of legislation in many respects, I agree. Now, the point comes back to this though. What's the point of having a bargaining code if the arbitrary or the arbiter model is never actually invoked? Oh, completely realised, Senator. I feel very strongly about this, that the, the code is there to improve the bargaining position of the news media businesses. And they can talk to Facebook and Google knowing that if deals aren't done, they can be very confident of designation. They can then be very confident mm. of arbitration if deals aren't done. I mean, I always thought, if you go back again in time, that if the, if the uh, legislation was enacted, Google and Facebook, Google search and Facebook newsfeed were designated. Um, there's then this period of negotiation, and if negotiation doesn't work, arbitration. Personally, I always expected that uh, deals would be done before you get to arbitration, and it's that, and we see that yeah. in other circumstances. Yeah, it, yeah. it improves the bargaining power yes. and deals get yes. done. That, that all makes sense to me. But how does that affect the small players? They can go to arbitration just as well. When? Uh, well, if they form, look again, this is a territory that very much belongs to the Treasurer, but, but if the smaller players get together and form a strong bargaining group, uh, I would have thought having a deal done with that bargaining group would be a pretty important consideration. But they've got to act in a collective way to do that. Well, they don't, uh, well, I mean, this is an interesting issue, uh, Senator, because uh, Facebook's done deals with Solstice, Schwartz, and I think it's private media. Uh, if I got it right, me, no, yeah, so now she's nodding. Uh, so they've done deals directly with really quite small players. Um, Country Press Australia, I've always thought would bargain as a job lot. So, you know, it's people's call. Like, certainly there were some quite big players at once upon a time were thinking of collectively bargaining and they decided to do a deal individually. So yeah. I, I think it's hard to tell, but Facebook and Google as well have done deals with small players. Okay. so. Um, the, in your judgment, there's a fair way to go yet. I mean, yes, uh, to, that's right. These are complex. These are seriously complex. All right. In your report, the final report on digital platforms from June 2019, you recommended direct grants for local journalism. Now, these direct grants, um, do you think that the, the, some money has been paid? Do you think they've been well targeted? Have they reached the right uh, recipients there? Uh, look, I, to be honest, Senator, I haven't had a close assessment of that. Um, uh, they did go to a range of entities that we had in mind, but I haven't actually followed Would through. You take that, that up. Is it possible you can have a look at that, Senator? I think so. If I could just step back, we we made twenty three recommendations, um, and they covered competition, consumer, privacy, media, a whole range of issues. Some of those issues are no longer in our bailiwick. So the. You know, we recommended a review of the privacy legislation. Mm -hmm. That's happening, but it's not our issue anymore. It's, it's off and yeah. running. Okay. And I think this one's a bit the same, you're right. so judging you, whether or not- you're, you're, but, you're, You don't want any further, you have no further uh, issue as far as the administration. I don't really think it's our All role. Right. Well, so what no. about the question of tax and philanthropy? You made recommendations there in regard to the use of the tax system. It's a matter of concern to me that to find other ways to encourage investment 
Yes. To actually develop diversity yes. in the industry. Uh, now, this was a recommendation that was actually rejected by the government. Now, I'm just wondering what the thinking was of the ACCC in terms of making that recommendation um, for using the tax settings to encourage further investment in support of public interest journalism. Yeah. So we uh, looked at journalism generally and said, well, what's, what's important for it? Uh, we certainly thought the news media bargaining code was important, and we've talked about that. The other thing that we thought was important was the advertising technology inquiry we're doing, because that affects how much ad money actually goes to the publishers, but that's a continuing exercise. We then had in mind those, those grants, particularly for um, court reporting and particular forms of reporting that seem to have suffered most from a decline in journalism. We uh, clearly thought that there needed to be continuing funding for the ABC because that's, I mean, if you think about government in Aust the Australian government's contribution to public interest journalism, the dominant dollar contribution comes by but to the can ABC. I, can I bring biggest. you back to this but, issue uh, of but tax? But I'll, I'll just get yeah. the, the tax yeah. one, sorry. I, and, I, and so we felt that it, we saw in other countries that there were uh, deductions for charitable donations to uh, news. Uh, and we thought that would make a good addition. But I'm addition. specifically thinking here about an adaption of the R&D tax concession that applies for, for a taxation system, which is one of our major innovation uh, tools in this mm. country. It's our largest single uh, policy tool administered by the tax yep. office. Why couldn't that apply for encouraging of investment above a threshold for media investment, for public interest journalism, we're so defined. Look, it could do, Senator. I guess, uh, I mean, we we put a big toe or foot in the water of this whole media issue, which is was consistent with our terms of reference, but now that the inquiry is done, it may not be completely consistent with the ACCC's mandate. But, I mean, basically the government accepted the media bargaining code, accepted the need for the digital platform inquiry, did give some regional grants, accepted the recommendation regarding the ABC, but we didn't get up on the tax one. So four out of five's not bad. Um, and my history of trying to recommend to governments that they do things through the tax system, normally you only get about one out of 100 up. So I guess I wasn't surprised they rejected it. But look, I think other ways to fund public interest journalism is something governments do and something that should definitely be thought about. But the specifics, uh, I guess it's probably beyond, beyond our, Thank our remit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Sims, uh, I'm just going to go to uh, Senator Fawcett, but before I do, you mentioned the importance of uh, funding of the ABC. Um, do you think that should be um, at a legislated level, like uh, is done in the, you know, kind of set there in stone, that it's not something year to year that's played within the budget? Oh, look, Senator, that's a, uh, I mean, I'm always conscious how much we step outside our remit into mm. policy issues that people are going to say wasn't our remit. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously, if I was the ABC, I'd certainly want something stable. Mm. Uh, so I can see the logic for that. But ultimately, I think that's a question probably beyond our remit. Mm. Our, our central point, which we wanted to make really clearly, which is why it was one of the 23 recommendations, is that different countries help public interest journalism in different ways. Now in the US it is, there are tax deductions, but they don't have, pub, they don't have a public broadcaster. Mm. So we just said, you know, the public broadcaster does play a fundamental role in public interest journalism, so it needs to be supported. I guess how you do that is probably beyond us. Mm -hmm. um, Goodo. Um, I'd just also like to ask uh, the, um, The uh, media, um, uh, the union representing um, journalists and media are going to be appearing uh, before us um, uh, next, next after yeah. you. Um, they've um, put in their submission to us that there does need to be a change to the merger rules mm -hmm. to ensure that um, uh, the public interest is protected. Uh, you talked about the fact that merger laws needed fixing. Um, you talked about the fact that as an example, whether uh, Nine and News could merge or 
uh, news could take over Channel 10. These would be things that the ACCC would, on first blush, probably oppose, but you might not be able to mm. uh, win them in a court. Um, do you accept that the public interest is important in looking at these uh, rules in relation to media mergers? Look, the honest answer is that I don't, may surprise you, but I, I think we are a competition regulator and I think you, I, I really strongly believe in appropriate instruments for appropriate objectives. And as a competition regulator, I would like our merger laws improved so that we can better address competition. I think once you put public interest in there, you're going to, um, in, you know, in trying to get um, us to consider a broader range of issues, I think in the end, it will probably kill what we try and do. Uh, we're a competition regulator. I mean, if once it's public interest, you could have an acquisition that we think lessens competition in any field, it doesn't have to be media, and someone says, but, but hang on, they'll get together and fire a few people. So public interest says you should stop. I mean, it just gets awfully murky. Mm. Uh, I think we're best targeted at, at competition and let us do that. If there's other objectives, then they should be done through other instruments and other bits of legislation. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, we, we deal with equity through the tax and social welfare mm -hmm. system. It's, it's not our remit. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm very happy for other laws to deal with it, but, but yes. they're not ours. Yes. Um, in terms of what merger laws uh, need fixing um, uh, to ensure that there is competition in the media space, could you take that on notice um, and get back to us as to, to, to what th those types of amendments would look like or uh, what you're proposing? We uh, were working on that last year when COVID came along. We're now re-engaging. So we're actually working that question through ourselves, Senator. Mm -hmm. So right now we don't know that answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got some ideas, but we'll be working that through in coming months, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. So I think if I, we wouldn't be able to give you anything in the, in the short term, but mm -hmm. we aim, our objective is this year to come out and say, this is what we think should happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what is your um, uh, forecasted time frame for that? Uh, my forecasted time frame, uh, uh, given it's Tom's responsibility, uh, is probably in uh, four or five months. But okay. uh, I don't know whether you saw the look on Tom's face. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Got some work to do there. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Senator, just a couple of very quick questions about your work in the digital media space. Uh, some of the concerns raised uh, that have led to this inquiry go to media diversity and the impact on our democracy. Um, have you looked at all in your work about the impact on the quality of journalism? We've had a previous witness today and other submissions talk about the fact that even the mainstream uh, newspapers and other medium uh, have been affected by the what they call the clickbait approach to how you attract people's attention, how you get ratings, and that that has impacted on the quality of journalism and therefore what's actually presented to uh, Australians. Uh, and that's predominantly a result of, of uh, the digital medium. Uh, did you do any work on that in assessing uh, the impact of the digital medium? Look, we did a bit. I'll quickly answer and see if uh, uh, Morag Bond wants to add. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you've got the effect uh, of the bargaining imbalance, which is addressed by the media bargaining code. So that was affecting the quality of journalism. You've got the issue about whether newspaper businesses get enough of the uh, ad advertising revenue, and that's the advertising, techno uh, advertising technology inquiry we're doing. But going to your issue directly, I mean, there certainly is um, a concern about, I think, both um, echo chambers, clickbait. I mean, it's, it, it, there's a concern firstly about just serving up people what the algorithm says they want, which just gets them to reinforce their own views. And the fact that you've got this uh, broad internet allows views to get out there which are extremely narrow, targeted on very narrow audiences. And I think that is a big issue, uh, frankly, for our democracy, because you can the combination of having this massive amount of data on people, understanding how you might be able to influence them, uh, and then your ability to narrow cast straight to them, 
I think is an issue, again, beyond the ACCC, but I think it's an issue governments collectively need to think about. Um, you know, it's again, tricky territory for the ACCC, but I think some of the things we've seen in America would allow us to, to say there's concerns there. So I, I think it's an issue that governments need to think about. So it's a competition. Well, sorry, regulator. Morag, did you want to just add something? No, I was just going to add in, in the inquiry that inequality, as Rob said, is a, is a very tricky issue for us. And, and we focused on, I guess, sort of three sort of bits of research to sort of assess that, that quality issue. And one was sort of the reduction in the number of journalists. Um, we looked at that and, there, you know, there was a very significant reduction in journalists over time. We looked at reductions in particular types of reporting. Um, and our research suggested there had been a reduction in um, uh, sort of local government reporting, local local court reporting, and we also looked at sort of um, uh, uh, closures of news sources. Um, so that, those were the three areas where we were sort of able to find sort of evidence based on our research. Um, obviously, sort of um, uh, some of the other aspects of quality are, are much harder to assess. Senator Fawcett. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the echo chamber effect that you've talked about, um, you know, I struggle to see how government could intervene in that space without essentially becoming a, a centre or a controller of information flow, which is not a place I think a free society wants to go. Um, so I'd be very interested if you have any ideas as to how we could effectively change that. And, and I guess the only clue I get in the remit of your current work is around uh, some of your analysis of claims of country of origin, which goes to, you know, where does where does inf product come from? I guess you could apply the same to where does information come from? Uh, and is transparency around um, the journalist or or associations, is there, is there any other way where we can highlight to people that they're only getting one side or a very narrow cast of an issue um, without verging into that area of censorship or control of information? Oh, look, a very good question, Senator, and you, you've summed up the dilemma pretty well, I think. It is very complex. Uh, uh, I guess just a couple of quick points. One is we did recommend that ACMA bring in place a a disinformation, misinformation code where they could have the power to take down um, uh, or, or uh, agree processes where the platforms would take down deliberate misinformation, disinformation. Uh, we had a recommendation in relation to uh, a, an ombudsman process where people who are dealt with badly can get that address. And I'm thinking here of celebrity scams just as one um, example. Uh, I think trying to deal with the privacy issues would also help because part of this is all the data that people have on you and how they can then target you. Uh, beyond that, Senator, I, I understand the trade-off. I just think it's an issue to be watched um, uh, and kept an eye on. I don't have an immediate answer as to how you deal with it, but I think it just needs to be watched. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Sim. Thanks, Jay. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Sims. I, I would, um, uh, notwithstanding uh, that uh, uh, your colleagues are still working on uh, this other issue uh, of um, what, uh, how to fix these merger laws, um, I would appreciate um, if you could give it some thought. No, we can, we can tell you what we think the problem is, yes, if that's helpful. Yes, yeah. yes, that would be helpful if you could yep. take that on notice. We're most delighted um, to do that, thanks. All right. Um, before we go, I just wanted to touch on um, one of the other items that you've uh, highlighted in your uh, submission, and that is the role of a newswire uh, in supporting a diverse public interest journalism. Um, could I get you to speak to, to that issue? Oh, well, I've said publicly, Senator, uh, that I think having a, a newswire is important for competition and therefore, I guess, for diversity as well. Um, uh, certainly uh, some of the smaller publications to get started need that news wire because it can uh, give them stories that they wouldn't otherwise get. I think the other point is that when you think about 
uh, take court reporting as a, a classic. Uh, you're just not going to send journalists from four or five papers down there. Mm. Uh, but having an organisation that can send one down there and then circulate it mm. is really important. So uh, as uh, Morag Bond mentioned, uh, we, we were worried about a lack of quality in terms of court reporting and other things like that. But the Newswire actually does a lot of that. So I mm. think it is important uh, for, for quality of journalism. I think it's important for competition as well, because certainly some of the publications I'm aware of, and some who are perhaps doing quite well now, said, look, they could not have got started without, a new, without the Newswire here. Uh -huh. So it, it is part of uh, what feeds uh, those broader competition issues. I, well, I think it just helps the breadth of news because, mm -hmm. as I say, you, you, um, there, there'll be things that are just not covered otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think it does help new players get into the market mm -hmm. and smaller players sustain themselves. So mm -hmm. yes, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for appearing today and uh, taking some of those questions on notice. Thank you. Um, thank you. Now, we're just going to suspend for 10 minutes. Um, uh, and then when we get back, we'll be uh, back with the MEAA, uh, who are joining us via video conference in Sydney. So we'll just suspend for... Welcome back. I now welcome representatives from the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. Uh, you're there uh, in the Sydney uh, office, I see. Um, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses has been provided to you. Uh, could you uh, please uh, go through your team, uh, identify yourselves and the capacities in which you appear today? We might start with you, Mr. Murphy. Yes, uh, Chair, Paul Murphy. I'm the Chief Executive of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. Wonderful. Um, Marcus Strom, I'm President of MIA Media, the Journalists and Media section of the MIA. Um, Matthew Cheshire, Director of Legal and Policy for MIA. Great. Great. Oh, uh, Ms. Percy, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> Could you just re could you just uh, repeat that again, Ms. Percy? Yes, apologies, Karen Percy. I'm the co-vice president of the media section of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance, and I'm sitting in uh, MIA headquarters in Melbourne. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Now I invite you to uh, give us a short opening statement. We do have a submission from you, uh, and then we're going to go to some questions. Thank you, Chair, and I uh, thank the committee for the opportunity to, uh, to give evidence to you today. This inquiry is important. It's important because media reforms over the past five years have worsened the state of media diversity. Journalism jobs have continued to be lost in great numbers, despite a growing appetite for Australian news content. Coverage of critical areas of civic and commercial affairs continues to fall. The effectiveness of the news bargaining code is unknown. And notwithstanding the success uh, or otherwise of the bargaining code, there are no evidence support measures for small to medium or new media providers. The economic foundations of the Australian news media sector have been under challenge for some time. The efforts to address these challenges have concentrated on the survival of existing media organisations. Although MIA has strongly supported these measures, focusing on that alone will see diminishing returns over time. We are concerned that unless there is a clear policy reset, journalist numbers will continue to slide. Mayor's analysis over several years indicates that there are now fewer than 10,000 recognised journalists serving Australian consumers. We believe their number has fallen by around 5,000 in the last decade. The impact has been felt everywhere, but most recently and pointedly in the regions and in the bush. Along the way, we've seen critical areas of public interest where journalism pricks and preserves public interest, like courts coverage, local council and corporate malfeasance be taken out of play. We surveyed journalists across Australia about the state of media ownership and concentration in Australia in preparing our submission for this inquiry. Approximately 350 responses were received. 
27% of respondents rated concerns about Australian media concentration as the highest of all issues canvassed, followed by funding for public broadcasting, the state of local, regional and rural media and public trust in responsible journalism. More than 92% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that Australia's media ownership is too highly concentrated, and 94% agreed or strongly agreed that this was bad for democracy. Support for increased funding for public broadcasters was at almost 90%. And there was strong support, about 80%, for government action to financially support small, independent community and regional media outlets, uh, which may not have been the case even five years ago. And we think this demonstrates a growing recognition of the need for government action in a situation where the market is clearly failing to deliver in the public interest. Our submission calls for new and better ways to create real media diversity. Uh, we call for changes to competition law, implementation of mandatory news media bargaining code, now subject to Facebook's objections and deceptions, extend the public interest news gathering program in both its duration and its quantum. To ensure quality and reliability across our media, we've advocated for the establishment of a new and effective single regulator of media content where community concerns are fairly adjudicated and where penalties are taken seriously. We've drawn the committee's attention to media reforms, jurisdictions similar to our own in Canada and the United Kingdom. They're on a path to sustaining journalism and creating opportunities for new players and for those now battling to stay afloat, like AAP in Australia. Australia will continue to fail the media diversity test if new players, small and large, find barriers to entry too great. Our members also look to government to credibly fund our public broadcasters. As we say in our submission, public broadcasters must be funded in a way that acknowledges the need to provide comprehensive, high quality, cross-platform media content in all parts of Australia. And so in conclusion, the current state of Australia's media is unsustainable. There are too few voices and too much power is vested in these voices. New and credible ways of supporting both existing media and new media must be found in order to preserve the health and transparency of Australia's democracy. Concentration of ownership, market failures and the grinding down of public broadcasters have combined to put our media sector in an extremely perilous place at a time when quality, reliable content is more needed than ever. Thank you. Um, could I ask the, the points that you have raised? We've just heard from um, Rod Sims, the head of uh, ACCC, in relation to merger laws. That's one of the key points that you do raise. Um, I'm not sure if you heard his evidence or not. Um, Obviously, the ACCC takes uh, is, is competition watchdog. It's not uh, it doesn't have the same role as ACMA. Um, could I get you to expand on your recommendation that there is a um, an amendment uh, or there is changes to the merger laws uh, to avoid doing more harm in relation to media concentration? Uh, I might defer to my colleague, Mr. Cheshire, on that chair. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, it's, it's a difficult uh, area, but in the UK, but in Canada specifically, there, um, there is a debate at the moment that um, the Canadian Competition Act, for example, um, when media mergers are proposed, that um, a specialist uh, panel of media experts um, have a statutory role in making a determination based on um, the interests of diversity of media voices. So uh, the change to the um, to the Act in Australia would be along those lines um, to um, ensure that, um, as we've seen over the last decade, that um, mergers don't simply result in in consolidation uh, and an increase in power in the remaining players. So it's essentially advocating a, a change to the law whereby, and as I said, I think this is the case in the UK as well, that um, 
there be a diversity of voices test and that that advice be binding uh, on the decision makers. Mm -hmm. um, and could I ask, uh, News Corp's uh, acquisition of uh, APN, um, did you say, have, what, what is uh, the NEAA's um, uh, a view of that now that we've seen a number of newspapers close down? Uh, following that acquisition? In inevitability, <laughs> unfortunately. That, it, well, that that was inevitable, that that was always going to happen, is that what you're suggesting? Well, I think, I think Chair, it's, it's a demonstration that uh, just merging existing players uh, does not necessarily even shore up uh, the existing numbers of journalists and local coverage. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, it, it's well known uh, that uh, the loss of local coverage uh, is is a, a it's, it's at crisis level. It's a critical issue, mm. uh, and you know the networking of coverage, um, having digital mastheads with no local journalists present in communities is just simply not an adequate uh, state of affairs for the local community. Mm. What about the impact on the merger between Fairfax and Nine? What uh, from uh, your experience and the issues you deal with, what, what have you seen the fallout of that to be? Um, it's Marcus Strom here. I'm a former Fairfax journalist. Uh, in some senses, that merger has helped sustain the large broadsheets um, and metropolitan titles, uh, but to the detriment of regional titles. Um, the merger led to the sell-off of all regional uh, titles that were previously owned by Fairfax. So while there may have been a metropolitan consolidation, um, uh, it, it led to the closure of a number of regional uh, newspapers as the, the, the regional papers were bought by ACM. Um, and ACM is currently also discussing getting a controlling stake in Prime Television, which is a regional TV network. So uh, what we're seeing is further consolidation rather than diversification and current government policy tends to support that consolidation rather than support diversification. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other uh, mergers pending or uh, th that you're concerned about in particular? Um, Closures of all the yeah. concerns. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the um, continuing closures. I mean, we saw even and the re continuing reduction in the number of journalists. We we saw even um, you know s some cases recipients of the um, uh, government funding uh, in the course of uh, you know the pandemic um, coinciding with redundancy rounds mm. at, at those organisations. Uh, so. Well, they were happy to take um, JobKeeper. While well, happy to take JobKeeper. Yep. Hmm. Um, did you hear the uh, evidence from Ms Rogers earlier this morning, the uh, former News Court photographer? I, I've seen some very brief reporting of it, Chair, but I, I, did, not, uh, I did not see the evidence. Um, I, I've only been... mm -hmm. yeah, One of the... Um, claims she made was that uh, the representation of women in News Corp newspapers uh, was um, directed and very deliberate, that she was uh, told to take photographs of, of uh, attractive women um, uh, versus um, uh, others. Uh, the requirements were not um, uh, directed at her or her team in relation to um, uh, men that they would be f uh, photographing. There was claims in relation to how sh uh, women in the newsroom were treated uh, in comparison to their male colleagues, uh, claiming um, sexism and um, uh, disrespect towards women uh, as part of the culture. Um, as the union representing journalists, are these claims uh, things that you have heard before? 
look, the the issue of um, uh, sexism in in newsrooms, uh, the disparity in in wages in newsrooms between men and women, uh, the underrepresentation of women in senior editorial positions have, have long been issues of key concern uh, for the union. Uh, you know, we, we uh, some years ago now uh, changed our standard log of claims when we enter into bargaining rounds with many organisations to include some uh, specific things like, for example, a guarantee of a grading review within six months of returning from maternity leave because one of the issues we identified in terms of the undergrading women in, uh, in newsrooms is uh, the uh, unfair impact of taking maternity leave on their careers. Uh, we we uh, added a claim for payment of superannuation on unpaid periods of maternity leave, uh, a claim for uh, regular uh, uh, transparent reporting of uh, the gender breakdown uh, of senior editorial positions. Um, we were also involved in, and um, uh, our colleague Karen might, might like to add some more to this in the establishment of the Women in Media organisation um, some years ago. Uh, as, as you know, to, to directly address these issues and, and seek positive change. And if you don't mind, Chair, I will weigh in there. Um, you know, the journalism industry has become, over time, a feminised workforce. You've still got a lot of um, men at the top, but you've got a lot of women coming in uh, in the entry levels and, and rising up through the ranks. And we've still got, I think, uh, a, a macho industry, so I'm not surprised to hear these. I would not, in my role as the co-vice president, necessarily have seen any specific um, complaints we'd have had along those lines, but certainly in chatting to colleagues in the in the workforce, uh, you know, when you're out and about on a job, you hear this constantly. And it's not just News Corporation, it's other organisations as well. There is a macho culture, there's still some toxic masculinity going on. And, uh, and I think we've only had uh, limited success in getting employers to uh, buy into and report on, whether it's the gender wage gap or where in the hierarchy of uh, you know, journalists versus producers and editors and, and stars uh, where the women are. So I think we've still got an attitude in the industry that there's nothing to see here. Uh, the women in media um, experiences certainly is that there, there's a lot of uh, problems within the way women are treated, not within, not just within their own workforces, but, you know, a, a journalist's workplace is actually anywhere and everywhere. And that uh, we've seen a lot of pushback uh, in this era of fake news and disinformation a lot of pushback against journalists and, and the kind of pushback against women is particularly um, gendered and violent and that's something that is not being addressed sufficiently. All of these issues I don't think are being addressed sufficiently uh, in the sector at the moment. Mm. Thank yeah, you. Chair, if I could just add one <clears throat> short point. The, um, the, the media reporting that I've read on this matter seems credible to me given my knowledge of newsroom culture. I wasn't surprised at those claims. Um, <clears throat> as Karen said, that this uh, journalism is a uh, feminising uh, workforce. And I would point you to a recent, very recently published academic article from UTS. Sasha um, um, Molitoritz and colleagues have published a longitudinal study on journalism jobs in 2012 to 2020, which has seen a tilt from it being a male-dominated industry to a female-dominated industry in the lower grades and a, um, a parallel lowering of wages, both for um, staff journalists and also for freelance journalists. And it's something worth a look at for the, for the committee. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the other claims that was uh, made in um, Ms Rogers, um, testimony was in relation to the uh, targets for subscription, uh, that uh, journalists uh, had to come up with certain number of uh, front pages, back pages, uh, stories, images, uh, in order to satisfy um, kind of the clickbait uh, culture uh, and environment that the that newspapers are now operating in. Um, are these types of targets something that is uh, usual now in the newsroom? And is this something that your members uh, 
uh, raise concerns with? In, how do you balance um, uh, those types of targets with reporting public interest journalism? Um, speaking from, I mean, I haven't worked in a newsroom for three and a half years now, um, and they change very quickly, but, and also speaking to colleagues since. The practice of getting uh, targets for your uh, stories online is not new. Um, and it's not necessarily counterproductive necessarily to public interest journalism. If used properly, it can be used to ensure that uh, the sort of stories published online are the ones that will reach broad audience. But I think if used badly, it can tend towards a, a clickbait uh, culture uh, where all that matters is uh, the, the numbers of hits and not the social impact or the social importance in terms of public interest news. I think early in the, uh, in the quantification of, uh, of news clicks, it was done very ba badly. Uh, the shift that was made at the Sydney Morning Herald, I think they tried to bring in a more qualitative assessment uh, and not just have a, how many clicks did you get? And I think that did see a shift online, but I think it is definitely open to abuse and there are still targets um, uh, for the number of hits. Just anecdotally, we were told at the Herald, we don't want to publish stories that will get more less than five or 10,000 um, clicks, which doesn't seem unreasonable to me, but exceptions could be made for stories that were of public interest importance. So it wasn't a blanket rule. In terms of how it's applied at other organisations, I can't say from first-hand experience, but I think it is probably open to misuse. Okay, thank you. If I could um, just add something there in terms of it, I mean, all organisations are on the, under this kind of pressure to justify the relevance of what they're doing. I've come out of the ABC and the ABC has those kinds of things as well. There are discussions about you know, what kind of effort you put into or, or resources you put into stories because of, of the concern about the clicks and what's going to happen. So it's, uh, you know, there, there are those kinds of pressures everywhere because you know if you get something up first and fast, it's going to be the one that leads the, the digital KPIs that day. So there's a lot of different pressures at play, uh, but I think there's definitely some concerns and I've heard anecdotally as well concerns about that kind of pressure to get so much into that first paragraph that is going to be there before the paywall. Uh, and that's a lot of pressure for 30 or 40 words. Mm. Um, one of the other um, issues that have been put to us is that, uh, and I'm going now back to the issue of uh, the concentration of media ownership, uh, is that uh, News Corp's 80% uh, uh, stranglehold over the print media actually extends beyond just those, uh, the, the print medium, that it is uh, those newspapers that then uh, feed into the rest of the news cycle uh, and across the different platforms. Um, and it was put to us by uh, Tony Koch this morning that it's the, uh, the rip and read, for example, the impact of, uh, of, uh, of News Corp and the influence of News Corp is much further than just who physically buys that newspaper and who reads those stories. Um, as a number of you are uh, presenting to us today as former journalists, is that something that uh, you would contest um, or, or agree with? Happy to start on that one. I, look, I, I don't think there's anything wrong per se with trying to set the agenda as a news organisation. <coughs> All news organisations and journalists try to do with their journalism. Um, the problem we face is that there are so few media organisations uh, publishing that it's quite easy for one or another news organisation to dominate the, the political coverage. And with increasing partisanship across the spectrum, uh, that can take a, a particular slant. And I, I think the concern stems from the lack of diversity not really from the desire to set agenda. I mean, agenda setting journalism is the sort of journalism that wins Walkley's and it's, mm. if it's done ethically and in the public interest, it is journalism of the highest standards and what we all aspire to. But journalism that tries to set agendas to achieve narrow or partisan political views can undermine 
the public interest nature of that journalism and the low diversity that we see in the Australian media, the worst probably in the Western world, just adds fuel to the, the fire there that, that makes uh, negative agenda setting or campaigning of, of an undermining sort easier to achieve in the Australian market. Hmm. If I could uh, weigh in there too, you know, I think that's part of the issue is you've got all these organisations who have fewer and fewer experienced reporters. Those uh, thousands of reporters who have been lost over the past decade, uh, it's not just that they've left behind the same amount of work with fewer reporters. You've got skilled, high, highly skilled reporters and experienced reporters who can push back on the you know, and say, is this in the public interest? We really should be uh, prosecuting or ensuring that we're not making assumptions. That's what the that what is what on the front is on the front page of a, a paper today is actually true. But uh, the, the pressures these days with fewer reporters, fewer resources to pick up and do that rip, rip and read is really problematic. Uh, you look at the bushfires a year ago and the stories that were out and about about arson, and I was constantly being asked that. I was out on the bush fire field um, in Victoria at that time. And I was asking police and I was asking the fire authorities and anybody else. Uh, and there was no evidence of arson, yet that was picked up by absolutely everybody. President Trump picked it up and tweeted about it. So that is the danger of, of uh, when you've got fewer reporters being able to do, uh, you know, truly, or at least uh, check the veracity. So that's that hyper-partisanship that we are that Marcus is talking about. We've got this issue where if there's, it's, it's hard to dispel something once it gets a momentum of its own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Carr. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, appearance today. Uh, the previous uh, witness uh, had indicated to us um, that there had been a new, uh, well, in fact, referred to the uh, position in regard to contracts for journalists, um, Anna Rogers, evidence was that the, the News Limited was asking, was <coughs> requiring contracts to be signed where the company was monitoring journalists' phones. Uh, is the union aware of that? Um, not specifically that particular detail, Senator. Um, I mean, obviously, the issue of contract employment is, is a constant issue for us as a union. Our view is that uh, uh, people should employ under the, the relevant uh, enterprise bargaining agreement, and we have a current uh, enterprise bargaining agreement in place with, with News Corporation. So, um, as Rogers' uh, evidence, which asked us to, she's, we've asked her to provide a copy of that uh, contract. You're not aware how uh, of that matter. I just want to be clear about that. I've Without further not, detail, not, not previously been aware of it, Senator. No. no. Further detail. That means, I mean, I mean like any organisation, a news organisation, I use your emails, and if they're provided a phone, would probably have some legal access to your phone hmm. and your any other device. But in terms of monitoring, um, that's I would have to look into that. It would be uh, obviously. I'd ask you so, to take that on notice if it yes, um, can be ask members. Uh, I mean, I've had an email from other more uh, from experienced journalists that say they hadn't, they weren't aware of it as well. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just means that uh, maybe in uh, Fairfax, for instance, it wasn't common. Um, it's not common at the ABC, I presume. Is that the case? Uh, as a as a former ABC reporter, uh, I'm not aware of that. But you are aware that as an employee, anything that's in your ABC uh, email address and I guess to some degree because we're all doing so much more work on our phone this is now you know where you do a lot of your work so um, yeah. you know that it can be monitored but uh, as yeah. at monitoring phone calls I wouldn't I not well, that I'm aware well, of. well I'd ask if you could take that on notice and uh, provide us with advice and whether or not you would think it might be legal I mean there is surely a question about its legality I and mean, I can understand the service providers would be available to an employer for email addresses. Uh, it has implications, I would have thought, for a journalist code of ethics Protected in regard sources. to confidential sourcing. Mm. If uh, conversations are monitored, it would have quite profound implications if people who think they're talking to a journalist on a confidential basis have actually were to understand that it was 
a conversation that was in fact being monitored by other people that they're not aware of. Would you agree? Yeah, look, uh, it, Senator, uh, it, is, it does raise a number of concerning issues. And I mean, you know, I mean, us as a union in collaboration with all the major media organisations in this country have been very vocal on issues like mass data retention, uh, protection of uh, confidential sources. I mean, the protection of sources is fundamental to the pursuit of public interest journalism. Uh, and uh, us and News Corp and all the other major media organisations have, have made very clear our concerns about recent national security legislation and how it impinges on that, that fundamental principle of public interest journalism. Thank you. The ACCC has provided us some evidence again this morning following up their digital inquiry where they have suggested that there is, should be a distinction between the question of diversity uh, of uh, voices in the media and uh, ownership um, concentration. Um, the, in fact, uh, in fact, a view also expressed by the Institute of Public Affairs. <laughs> um, the Press Council also suggests that, in fact, uh, media diversity in Australia has never been greater due to the expansion of uh, online voices. Now, you're putting a contrary view. Could you explain to the committee why it is that you take the view that uh, the media proprietors are incorrect when they suggest that we now have a higher diversity even though we've got now the highest concentration of media ownership in the world? Uh, Senator, website rankings, and just because um, something appears in website rankings doesn't equate to influence uh, over public discourse um, would be our views. We've always taken the view this was something that was raised um, when we made submissions previously in relation to the uh, two out of three rule and four out of five rule um, that as a, a demonstration that everything's fine, diversity is great in this country. Um, it, just producing a table of website rankings doesn't uh, take away from the clear, what everyone clearly understands about the state of media in this country and the concentration and, and as a result, uh, the uneven uh, influence of, of some voices over others. It, it does, um, if I... uh, does stretch um, credibility somewhat, Senator, to think that you can meaningfully um, distinguish diversity of voices from ownership of, uh, of media entities. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that could be achieved. If you don't mind, I'll add a few words there too, Senator. Um, when I walked into the Adelaide ABC 30 plus years ago, big building in Collinswood, it was a bustling, busy uh, production centre, as was Adelaide more generally. Uh, Adelaide had big newsrooms at Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10, the ABC, there was other production. Each of those uh, television networks did uh, some kind of children's education or children's programming. There was Romper Room, there was the Channel Niners, there was also Fat Cat and Friends and the ABC's got BTN. BTN's about the only one that's left. Uh, there was other TV production at the time as well. There's some TV production in Adelaide now, but very, very little. Similarly, you look at the radio networks in a place like Adelaide, there's still a reasonable number of them, but the networking uh, of uh, some of that material or some of the programming that goes there. There were two newspapers, two daily newspapers back in 1987 and a Sunday paper. There's only one newspaper today. The Adelaide Review recently closed down. You've had the Channel 10 newsroom now, uh, their studio, their news studio is being networked out of Melbourne. They've still got reporters on the ground. That's a big, big difference over 30 odd years uh, and says a lot about uh, the, the change that's happened in even a place like Adelaide. So it's exactly when you look at the regional areas as well. So, um, and when you listen closely to some of the radio, or read closely some of the digital offerings um, in, in uh, smaller centres, you'd be hard pressed to know where that is coming from because it's so bland and so not local that it could be anywhere. And, and that's part of the problem too, we're re losing a real sense of local identity. And the fact that Adelaide in, in lots of senses is now seen as a region rather than a capital city. And in, in, in when, when you're looking at uh, the, the kind of resources that are put into it. So I think that that gives you an indication 
of the changes that have been happening. So um, you're saying 5,000 job, journalist jobs have been lost in the past decade, 1,000 in the last year. And part of that is technological change, but also the question of, arises about mergers. Now, the ACCC says that competitiveness is an issue they are concerned about, but the question of ownership is not. Uh, how do you respond to the press council in terms of those issues, especially around the issue of quality? If I could start on that, Senator Carr, the, the, the fact is that there are financial pressures in an organisation to save money um, once you have everyone under the same roof and not to diversify. So a, a small example would be the merger of The Age and the Herald uh, Canberra Galleries. They used to be fiercely uh, competitive and separate, uh, and now they occupy the same physical space. They run the same columns, many of them excellent, but it is a is a diminution of voices and uh, a diminution of uh, of audience um, sensitivity regarding Melbourne or Sydney uh, audiences, and that's in the capital cities. If you're looking in in regions, you have the consolidation of the one owner into into hubs where uh, jobs are lost in smaller places, consolidated for financial reasons into one area in order to cover a very large um, zone. So you do have that, and that that comes with the job losses. We've seen that in the last year in regional, but it's not just in regional areas. It, uh, the pressure in the metropolitan newsrooms is the same. If you look at ABC Radio, ABC Radio um, now flicks on to statewide coverage at various times and you listen to someone in, in regional uh, New South Wales or Victoria and you're getting somebody in Sydney or Melbourne, uh, not someone in, in from your local station. And, and when you talk about those, the loss of speciality, does that mean, for instance, in science, the interest that I have, of course, in science and research, um, the number of specialist reporters I would expect you would have noticed has been substantially reduced when those mergers take place. Is that is that your experience? Absolutely. I'm a former science editor at the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and I spoke to Rebecca Morell, who is a science editor of the BBC. She helped set up the Australian Science Media Centre more than a decade ago, uh, and helped initial training. And she came back recently to visit UNSW about two or three years ago. And she noted in the collapse in specialist news reporting within science. The Sydney Morning Herald alone used to have two science reporters. There is now one excellent science reporter, Liam Mannix, uh, who covers all uh, all Fairfax or Nine Facts as it is now. Um, he's just won a Walkley for what he's done. He's an excellent reporter, but one person across five digital titles, where previously there had been two science reporters at the Sydney Morning Herald alone. Yeah. Can I add some? Uh, can I add some context there too? In that, I think that the, the COVID uh, pandemic has shown us the importance of science. You look at uh, the ABC's Dr. Norman Swan and his whole science team, who has really shown the importance of it. So when you are investing in it, it's a really worthwhile. But it's something that um, you know has been denigrated in a lot of areas. I uh, was most recently a court reporter. That's an area where uh, there used to be teams and teams of reporters and there just aren't any more. Uh, in Victoria now, you could probably count on one hand the number of dedicated reporters, perhaps two, uh, in this city, and I don't imagine it's much bigger in, in Melbourne, never mind looking at that kind of reporting, which is true public interest journalism and ensuring that life is shone on uh, the processes, the democratic pillars of, of our mm. country. And then you look at uh, what's happening in regional areas, it's even harder. And then local government is uh, getting less uh, scrutiny again. So it's, it's, it's specialties, but it's also some of those really important basic ones as well. And of course, uh, there's the ancillary services like printing that with the mergers have meant that, uh, is my understanding now that nine uh, facts, as you call it, uh, papers now being printed by news. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, there is some sharing. That's yep. that's correct. Share, so some sharing. Is that what you call it? Um, <laughs> so it is. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it was something that I think there was was a subject of lengthy negotiations and some suspicion between the organisations. But uh, I think the economic pressures uh, inevitably led to uh, to an agreement being reached. But it's more than just an economic question. Really, I mean, if you want to talk about monopoly control, 
If you want to talk about market dominance, surely that is an example of what happens when, mm -hmm. when, when we get these changes occurring in the industry. Now, I know that the AJA has never been real big on the question about printers' jobs, but it is a really significant issue when it comes to actually how the, the readership of, of the media is actually considered. Would you so, agree? So, uh, absolutely. Look, I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you. The other impact that has had is when geographically you move printing and you consolidate it, uh, the timing of when the timing of when you can have news in a newspaper changes dramatically. Because, uh, football score, football results can't appear in the in the uh, Newcastle Herald potentially, depending on yes. where the uh, where things are being physically printed. Look, I've got a lot of questions to ask you, and I know other senators want to ask questions too. So I'm, I'm going to um, perhaps just ask you a couple more and come back if there's time. Uh, you're, I'm interested in your views around what other measures can be taken to improve diversity. Rather than the rhetorical flourish, what practical measures the Commonwealth can take to intervene in the market to ensure that we actually get additional investment into the industry. And one of the measures that I'm particularly interested in is the effect on public interest journalism if we were to institute measures such as the uh, an adaption of the, the R&D tax incentive, which we use for support for, for new, the development of new technologies in industry, one I've had a lot to do with as Minister for Industry, you're supporting that notion. That's a, the public interest journalism um, proposal that has has been floated. Is 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 the union supporting that proposal? Uh, certainly, Senator. We've we've supported uh, uh, tax incentives to encourage innovation and new entrants into the market for some time. Uh, that uh, was, uh, in my recollection, a submission that was picked up in the recommendations from an earlier Senate inquiry on public interest journalism in about 2017 or 2018. Uh, and uh, I think the question of some uh, reform and greater tax incentives was something that was covered also in the recent ACCC uh, inquiry. We, we absolutely support um, uh, changing the, the taxation uh, environment and regulatory environment to encourage new entrants. Our, 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 our fundamental view is the way to improve media diversity in this country is to get more entrants into the market. Senator Carr, the, the only, possibly the two most successful new entrants to the market have been Guardian Australia and the Daily Mail. Um, and they had their own form of uh, financial incentive and support by, because they were supported by external uh, organisations in the United Kingdom. They're, they're part of, and if you look at uh, smaller attempts to enter the market, such as by uh, BuzzFeed, uh, or, and, or by the Huffington Post, although they also had some support externally, they withered on the vine to a large extent because there is not an uh, economic environment by which small publishers and new or innovative ways to enter the markets can survive. Can I just finally then come to this issue about the quality of journalism? Uh, traditionally, the media alliance has relied upon the code of conduct as your, your self-regulating mechanism. Uh, now, you also now talk about a harmonised approach for media regulation across platforms, given that the level of union memberships declining and therefore, I presume, endorsement of the code of ethics, which binds union members, is also declining across the industry. Uh, now, I'm wondering what the harmonisation of approach and media regulation would mean. Does it mean the abolition of the press council, given that that's been, uh, I take it, in your view, not, not a great success? Um, what would it would mean in regard to the communications authority's responsibility for policing ethics? And what other actions would it mean uh, in terms of actually building ethical journalism and or building quality journalism? I'll take that one, uh, Senator. We would like to see a streamlined approach to regulation. We know that um, we need a stronger, we need a simpler oversight mechanism that is transparent, that 
that people easily understand and that it's easy for people to access. A one-shop stop is, um, is what we'd like to see. You know, 68 per cent of our members worry that ACMA and the Press Council and other regulate, regulatory uh, systems within our industry are just not adequately carrying out, carrying out their roles. Um, there are too many sets of rules, uh, whether it's your know, separate broadcasters and different mechanisms for digital and different print media. So there, there are too many. We know there's wider frustration, not just within our sector, but from the public about um, the regulation and, and how news consumers can take part in regulation. Uh, MIA's Code of Ethics is one of only about 14 different ways, statutory and self-regulation, that you can uh, you know, make a complaint or, or have some kind of um, attempt for recourse. Uh, there's a real lack of consistency between those uh, ways of going about things. So members of the public, whether they're listeners, readers, viewers, or our members, uh, you really don't have any recourse if you have issues about something. Now, it's true that only members of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance are subject to any kind of potential sanction with the Code of Ethics. We take a complaint, we investigate it, uh, and we rule. Uh, but in reality, uh, you're not going to have a, very many journalists stand up and say, I don't abide by the Code of Ethics. But there is a real issue about how uh, uh, journalism is held into, uh, you know, is, is held to account because of this quite disparate um, way of doing things. So we would like to see uh, a more streamlined approach. We know it's not going to be an easy road, but the time is now. We know there are real issues about integrity and it's not just, uh, you know, some whinging whiners on Twitter. We know through Ipsos, through the Edelman process, the University of Canberra, a number of different measures, if you like, or studies that show that there is a real uh, decline in trust and concern uh, about whether it's TV, whether it's uh, online. And of course, the internet age has, you know, the, the so-called democratization of the internet age means that anybody can post anything. And it's quite confusing, I think, for viewers, listeners, readers sometimes to figure out what is curated, resourced, uh, accountable journalism and what's just somebody's few opinions put on the internet. So uh, in this digital age where organisations are, are doing cross-media platforms, those existing checks and balances, in our view, are no longer fit for purpose. We know it's not going to be easy to find a replacement, but it's time to start having that conversation. Senator Carr, on, just briefly on that, I think um, while there has been a reduction in our membership over the last few years, it hasn't been as uh, precipitous as the decline in the number of journalists. So arguably, our density in the industry has been increasing. Uh, but that said, we would like to see uh, a robust uh, regulatory system that would rebuild trust in the public in the in the fourth estate, and that doesn't exist. And uh, dare I say that people, journalists probably, our members probably fear appearing being lampooned on media watch, and they than they fear being brought before the press council at the moment. And that's not a situation uh, that, is, that is great for a regulatory environment. Mm. Okay. Um, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think Senator Rennick is on the line. Are you on the line, Senator Rennick? We might uh, leave it there. Um, uh, Mr Murphy, thank you to you and your team for giving us your evidence today. You've taken some things... Chair, yeah, David Fawcett. Oh, sorry, that. David. Uh, sorry, Senator Fawcett. Have you got any questions? Yeah, just a couple of quick ones. Um, you talked in your evidence just before about the fact the economic environment makes it difficult for new players and indeed a lot of the contraction has been reported due to falling in advertising and subscription revenues, um, which basically leaves philanthropy, the taxpayer or external sources um, as of the last month or so, also now potentially an income stream from digital platforms. Uh, do you have a view as to how uh, negotiations are playing out and an ability you have as an organisation of the negotiations that are occurring with Google and Facebook, but you have a view on how they're going and how that's um, going to benefit not just the major players but smaller platforms and new entrants? Uh, well, Senator, we, we don't have any information on how negotiations are going beyond what's been publicly reported. 
Um, we have expressed very clearly our, our concerns about uh, the process in, in two key areas. One is that we don't want to see a situation where smaller uh, independent uh, uh, publishers and media organisations miss out on funding because we fear that that could actually lead to a greater concentration rather than increase in diversity. And we also have a concern to see that any monies that flow out of the bargaining code or the commercial arrangements that are in, entered into under the threat of the bargaining code are used on journalism, on new journalism, on employing more journalists, on paying freelancers better. Uh, those, those are the two key concerns. And really, we're just watching, uh, like everyone else, I suspect, very closely uh, how this situation develops. Just the other concern we have is regarding this imperfect device where, which has prompted Facebook and Google to seek commercial arrangements with publishers is there's a danger this just kicks the can down the road a few years and when these contracts and these come up for renewal, will they be renewed? What pressure will Facebook and Google try to bring on these publishers? What does it mean for the independence of the journalism? Will there be robust independent uh, journalism cultures in these organisations? If it just does leads to the reconsolidation of the existing narrow ownership base, that means freelancers again will be left out in the cold. They have no, they do not have the economic power to collectively bargain uh, for, uh, for rates, and we've seen a plummeting in freelance rates because of that, because of the lack of competition, uh, and because of the narrowness of ownership, uh, and that we're worried that the uh, Facebook and Google money could lead to the consolidation of that ownership rather than diversification. Sure. So can I come to that topic of diversification? One of the risks of that that you identified in your oral evidence was that anyone can take an opinion or a point of view and put it up on the internet. And for many people who access the news predominantly through the internet, they're hard pressed sometimes to separate uh, fact from, from feeling or fear or you know, whatever other agenda people are wishing to put forward. So how, in your view, do we counter that lack of um, value or trusted journalism? How do we counter the echo chamber effect where narrow sectoral interests are pushed to people as, as mainstream news without verging into um, government control or censorship, which is where we don't want to go in a plural society. How, how do we find the balance in that space? If I start on that, um, number one, there's, a, there's the top-down question, which is around regulation. And I think there is a weakness in the regulatory environment, the self-regulation, which we've indicated we would like to see discussion in the industry that would improve that, that regulation so that people can trust what happens in journalism. But there's also what we would refer to as control of quality from below, and that's from our members. And uh, I think the stronger our union is in a workplace, the better the journalism tends to be because our members use the code of ethics. Um, the code of ethics, not just as an aspirational tool, but actually as an industrial tool to ensure that journalism is of a high uh, quality and that people are not being forced to do unethical journalism because they have a strong union in their workplace. I would also add that you know education um, within our own membership and within the industry about the importance of the code of ethics, etc. But also amongst the general public, I think one of the things that these lengthy press conferences that we here in Victoria have shown is that there's a bit of um, a lack of understanding to some degree about how the process happens, and that there's a bit of theatre in some of these press conferences, etc., but also in just how we do our jobs and the importance of what we do. And, and that what uh, journalists and journalism uh, producers put out is curated. We are accountable. Despite the failings in our regulatory system, we are still accountable. We have to actually show where our facts come from. We uh, know our sources. We can test our sources. So we actually have to really educate people about ensuring that you know, you're not just taking uh, somebody's feel opinions um, from the internet, that it's actually curated. And look, you know, given that a lot of people are actually directed through social media, for example, to news 
uh, coverage. When I read the H newspaper, I know exactly where the news is. I know exactly where the opinion is. When I go to their website, as a website, it's also curated in that way. But if I go directly to an article, sometimes it's not always evident there. So I think we can probably be doing better things to ensure that when we know people are coming through, uh, looking at information, that they know where it's coming from. But also education for people uh, to, to know what to look for and that, uh, you know, if it's not a well-known organisation or it's not an organisation that's got legitimate uh, journalistic uh, abilities and, and backing and has a code of conduct, code of ethics, that it's uh, not the kind of information you should be relying on. We've seen too much of that in the last year either over bushfires and the pandemic. Uh, so it's crucial that we do some education as well. And I think the, there's definitely a role for all of us in that part of it. So if we were going to have, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but a, a media or journalist equivalent of the country of origin labelling on things that you buy off a supermarket shelf, um, who would be making that assessment as to the efficacy of the organisation and the review, etc., uh, around fact-checking and proper sourcing of uh, references um, to put that kind of um, labelling, if you want to call it that, onto news items? Is it even practical? Uh, sorry, Senator, you, you, are you talking about labelling of content on the digital platforms in some way? Well, essentially, that's, that's the inference, I thought, in your evidence that a consumer of news should understand whether it's come from a reputable source with appropriate checks and balances or whether it's somebody's idea that they're putting up there in a format that looks official or informative. So we oppose government accreditation of journalism. Yeah. Uh, very the point I was trying to make is, was education, is that there are ways that people can figure out whether it's a credible source or not. And that takes a little bit of um, re research as such, but I'm not suggesting that there be some kind of stamp of approval that, you know, it's, it's like your um, ingredients on a, a sausage. I'm not suggesting that, but I do think some education about how people can understand what is verified, sourced, uh, credible journalism, as opposed to just what your uncle's decided to put in a meme. Well, one would hope one would hope that membership of the press council or a similar regulatory body would give enough confidence to the public that the journalism being published there would be reliable. I think we've mentioned a weakness in the regulatory environment. I think that exists. We would hope that membership of such a regulatory body should bring that confidence. Unfortunately, it does not always bring that confidence. I would also argue that membership of our union and adherence to our code of ethics would also bring confidence. I feel a bit more confident about that aspect of self-regulation through membership of our union. Um, Senator, finally, the, um, the recently published rules concerning the mandatory news code uh, bargaining framework do actually um, require that a company adhere to uh, a recognised um, system of press standards or have an appropriately um, rigorous um, internal process of review. It, the language is a little bit grey and woolly, but it does exist uh, within the formal rules for the news bargaining framework. Okay, Senator Fawcett, have, have you got a final yep, question? Fine. Thanks, Chair. Okay. No, I'm happy to pull up there. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Mr Murphy, thank you and your team for presenting today. Uh, we appreciate it. You've taken some uh, questions on notice and uh, if you could get back to us in, in the next couple of weeks, that would be wonderful. Um, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. I will now welcome Mr Peter Marshall, representing the United Firefighters Union of Victoria, to the table. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senators. Um, if I could, Madam Chair, yes. could I uh, seek leave just to table two more documents? Yes, yeah, yes, but just just bear bear with me for a moment. Um, 
we've obviously given you information in relation to parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses. For the Hansard record, could I just get you to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, my full name is Peter James Marshall, and I appear in my capacity as State and National Secretary of the Firefighters Union. Okay. Um, now, Mr Marshall, we're going to invite you to make an opening statement, but you also have some, uh, some documents you'd like to table, is that correct? Yes, That Madam you're going to Chair. refer to? Yes, if I could, Madam Chair. There are um, two folders, if you like. They're actually to assist the senators. Okay. Uh, they, um, they go to the point of our submission. So the first fo folder is called um, Additional Documentation. Uh, it has uh, tabs 1 to 13. Mm -hmm. uh, they're appraisals of um, the overall, our initial submission that was put on the uh, 20th of December uh, last year. Uh, the second document is actually a subset of um, the one I just described. That's tabs in 11 and 12. Uh, they are actually um, uh, an independent inquiry. It's a parliamentary report independent inquiry into the media uh, and media regulation by the Honourable Finkelstein. It's in its um, entirety. I'm not asking the senators to read it, but I will be referring to certain sections of it. Mm -hmm. So if someone was to ask, uh, where's the authoritative document? Uh, and the other um, part of that is um, uh, pr uh, a paper that was produced by the Honourable Ray Finkelstein, uh, Melbourne, uh, sorry, um, uh, just bear with me. Uh, yeah, Rodney to Melbourne University Law Review, uh, and that was in relation to press self-regulation. Again, it was the Honourable um, Ray Finkelstein. Okay. So, uh, we're willing to uh, accept these, and we'll just, you know, if you if you want us to refer to them as we go through the uh, evidence, just yell out. Thanks for being so organised, Mr. Marshall. Um, <laughs> We're taught thoroughly prepared. Thoroughly prepared. <laughs> We're actually um, taught that for fires. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, uh, what we might do um, for senators that are uh, on the line, if there's... There's been an electronic version, is there? Yes, there is electronic. They've been provided. There's we've, actually uh, so USB, sorry. Thank you. So we've circulated an, ele an electronic version. So for those of senators who are accessing this remotely, um, you can follow along as well. Okay, Mr Marshall, over to you. You can give us an opening statement and then we'll go to some <clears> questions. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. We thank the Senate for the opportunity to appear. Um, and Madam Chair, in 2011, we had that opportunity to appear before the Senate over an issue that related to professional firefighters uh, and the issue in relation to a higher incident of cancer that they received during the course of their employment. Um, I just want to quote from the final Senate report, if I could, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. um, dated 2011. Uh, just bear with me, sorry. Um, the I'm just a little bit nervous, I haven't done this for a while. Um, the community holds a deep respect and gratitude for those who serve to protect and assist. Uh, if we're honest, however, along with this respect, uh, gratitude comes a generous dose of expectations. We expect firefighters to come to our assistance with our homes, schools, hospitals and business in a blaze. Uh, we expect that a firefighter will enter a burning building when every human instinct tells us to leave. <coughs> Excuse me. We expect that we will search for those trapped inside and bring them out alive. We accept them to do what they can to do to minimise loss of life and damage the property. While everyone, is, uh, while everyone else is fleeing danger, it's a firefighter's duty to tackle it head on, to enter an extreme and dangerous environment um, with the best possible protective gear available. Um, Senator, the reason I read that to you is that um, uh, the ha this House of Parliament, uh, the Senate, and also uh, the House of Representatives recognise the work that firefighters do, uh, how dangerous it was and how they're held in high regard. Unfortunately, the reason I'm actually appearing before this um, particular inquiry is that uh, between the uh, year 19, sorry, between the 2015 and 2017 and onwards, there was a systematic, systematic vilification of the very people that this Senate has recognised uh, as being um, sacrificing their own life in protecting the community. Um, in particular, that was um, uh, by the um, Herald Sun. Murdoch Press, and if I could just read uh, the extent of that, if I could please. Uh, we actually made seven uh, 
uh, over a seven month period to the press council. Uh, we made complaints consisting of approximately 113 Herald Sun articles. Uh, after 13 months since uh, making its first complaint, the union saw no purpose to continue in the process. Uh, to the press council, there was no recourse for us. Can I just talk about the extent of that vilification? Uh, the vilification consisted of over 113 articles, including 84 Herald Sun print pieces published in a 60-day period, more than 20 Herald Sun front page stories in a 30-day period, in the lead up to the 2016 election, and push polling by the Herald Sun. Uh, in fact, it went to, this, uh, to the extent that the Herald Sun produced stickers to distribute to the public. Uh, the stickers uh, were distributed through 858 Victorian news agencies in the lead up to the 2016 election. Uh, and it's, uh, the sticker says, Union CFA takeover bid, back to CFA. Um, at the time, we were in an industrial dispute with the Country Fire Authority, um, that is um, within the legislative frameworks of this parliament under the Fair Work Act. Uh, the Herald Sun um, took a very partisan a misleading role, uh, and we got the examples there in relation to our press, graphic examples. This resulted in extreme vilification of firefighters, professional firefighters. Uh, can I say on uh, pages 20 of our original submission and tab 13 of the submission I just handed up, uh, that is the extra documents, there's examples in relation to that vilification and the results of the psychological illness the firefighters actually experienced. Uh, if I could just go to that just briefly. Um, Newcastle University undertook uh, in 2017 uh, a report into the discrimination, bullying and sexual harassment of CFA and MFB. Uh, the survey consisted of 885 professional firefighters. 95.5% uh, of the staff said the media coverage as a result of Herald Sun's vilification profoundly damaged effect on morale. Uh, and I'll quote out of that particular uh, uh, paper from uh, Newcastle University. Firefighters have frequently commented in this survey that certain sections of the media, working co 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 with the VFBV, propagated a dishonest and biased account of issues under discrimination, uh, sorry, under discussion in the enterprise agreement negotiations, and vilified career firefighters as greedy thugs because they argued for safe working conditions and demanded to have a say through their union over the quality of the equipment they expected. There's another egg, a number of extracts from personal experiences of firefighters, and that's on page two under tab 13 of the extra documents. Um, and I'll quote, um, firefighters have been assaulted and harassed in the public uh, media and on social media, very stressful, and I'm attending counselling because of this. This is from a firefighter. Another one was, for example, <coughs> the campaign takers of normal toll on myself and my partner and my colleagues, sleepless and lack of morale, are extremely common. Um, our degradation, our de de degradation in the public arena has led me to not divulge my profession to those who inquire as, as I fear abuse. We are, workforce, uh, we, are, we are forced to work with the very volunteers who have publicly and privately attacked us and there's profoundly negative, neg negative impact on our health. Then I'll go to another one. A career firefighter actually collected money for volunteers, was handed a bullet on one occasion in the height of this campaign uh, at a set of traffic lights. Um, firefighters were being accosted on page three under tab 13. Firefighters were being accosted uh, at petrol stations by a member of the public and harassed about one of the articles in the Herald Sun, which was misleading in relation to the amount of leave they actually received. Um, the um, sorry, the um, uh, sorry. The next one, a firefighter having an argument with his father over the leave entitlements that were um, misleading in the Herald Sun. A firefighter on duty in idling truck being approached by a member of the public who yelled at him to stop wasting money uh, and get a real job. The firefighter was worried that the situation would escalate. A firefighter crew in a truck at an intersection being twice told by a cyclist to get a job. So the very people who were held in such high regard were actually vilified to such an extent with 113 articles, uh, 84 uh, print pieces over a 60 day period, totally misrepresenting uh, the real case. In fact, uh, making outrageous 
uh, claims about no firefighting would commence unless there were seven professional firefighters on the ground, that um, senior officers wanted chauffeurs, chauffeurs to drive them around, um, that they had extraordinary amount of leave. Um, all those matters were uh, untruthful um, to the point where as we made a number of co co uh, complaints to the Australian Press Council. Um, can I just say that the recourse for firefighters, and one of the reasons I'm appearing before this inquiry, is that um, as a union, uh, if I take you to um, uh, just, if I could, uh, page uh, tab 10 of the new documents. And what it sets out there, the avenues, avenues for recourse, in other words, to make the Herald Sun um, accountable. Can I just say, um, uh, there are good journalists uh, and they are workers too, so um, they're not, my comments are not directed at them per se. Um, but if you can see that the extent of that vilification that's turned the protectors of the community into the most hated, if you like, at certain times, to the point where their children were abused at school, they were ostracised in their community, um, uh, verging on physical assault to the point of actually being handed a bullet during collection, um, this is all a result of the vilification. I mean, it's unprecedented for a media outlet to engage in producing stickers, tens of thousands of stickers, and distributing them through a news agency that vilified the very person, uh, people that this Senate recognised as um, foregoing quantity and quality of life. Um, can I just say that what was our recourse? And I'm so pleased with this inquiry. We actually have. Um, uh, if, if, uh, if I can go to tab 10 there, we actually don't have a recourse under defamation as a union. Uh, the law is deficient in that, in that sense. So normally a person would have two courses of recourse open to them or an organisation. That is legal, uh, being defamation against the, uh, the outlet. Um, the reality is that um, defamation, uh, I've provided some uh, advice from a Queen's Council there. Uh, defamation is around $250,000. Um, in cost, uh, if an individual takes it out, um, the reality is that if that individual loses, and even if the individual wins, they could be out of pocket, um, or alternatively, they could lose the very assets being their house. On top of that, um, the law is actually deficient in the sense that um, the Defamation Act does not allow for the union to commence defamation proceedings, albeit so expensive because there's an exclusion to excluded corporations. The union would fall under that. So what is our recourse uh, against that um, vilification from an organisation that actually has a circulation of around 350,000, uh, potentially 126 million readers? Uh, what is our recourse? Uh, the recourse is the Australian Press Council. Um, the Australian Press Council, we put numerous complaints in um, uh, we had five complaints that referred to numerous articles. Um, not one of those complaints reached a satisfactory outcome. Um, uh, after seven months, we were told by the Australian Press Council they did not have the resources to deal with the volume of complaints. Um, what the, the volume of complaints wasn't because the union was trying to overload the Australian Press Council. The volume of complaints was actually reflective of the Herald Sun's vilification. Um, so, um, uh, after 13 months, the union had no option to withdraw. Out of all those complaints, we had no satisfaction at all. Um, it is so telling, um, and the reason I've introduced the Finkelstein report, uh, everything I've alluded to here um, is documented. I have a chronological and key findings of the Finkelstein inquiry in 2011, 2012. Uh, the press council was found to be ineffective back at that date. Um, there was a recommendation for a statutory body um, that actually would be put in place. Uh, the safe safeguards for the uh, freedom of the press were contained within that recommendation. That is that the statutory body operates at distance from the relevant minister. Uh, it was structured in that way. Um, if that recommendation had been adopted and there had been law, we would have had a legal recourse to address what was, off the, uh, what was obviously a systematic vilification of a workforce uh, to the extent that it had a, a psychological impact. Uh, and some of those people are still vilified today uh, and still suffering today. Mm. Um, I probably haven't done justice to the submission, but um, I suppose if 2012, um, the Finkelstein report, um, 11,000 persons and organisations put in submissions, uh, and I'm not being disrespectful to this inquiry, I just would like to bring it to their attention. 
uh, and 9,000 were facilitated through advocacy groups. 41 people gave evidence. Um, uh, and indeed, the conclusion after that extensive uh, forensic analysis of the effectiveness of the press council was that it was ineffective. Now, historically, I've gone back through the origins of the press council, uh, the fact that it's a self-regulating body. It cannot enforce its will on the uh, participants, being the media outlets. They are financial contributors. They can simply withdraw. Uh, the sanctions are only um, token, if you like, even if they sanction a uh, media outlet, such as the Herald Sun over this, uh, they can simply ignore them because uh, press council has nowhere to take it. It's self-regulation. Um, the effect has been profound. Um, um, and I put that against the context of this Senate actually talked about these people in so mm. glowing, glowing terms. Um, I could go through example after example after example, um, and indeed the chronological um, order of and it's containing the documents of our interaction with the press council, but it is a toothless body. It has no force. Um, and I'll just conclude and take any questions on this basis. Um, so what was the recourse for firefighters? There was none. Mm. Balance the imbalance of power. Um, you're talking an organisation that uh, says that 126 million circulation. Uh, you're talking a workforce that doesn't have that scope to be able to counter. The only avenue, which was the Australian Press Council, to make those corrections um, said they didn't have the resources. Um, after 13 months, we didn't have one result. Uh, and I can say our complaints were put together by our lawyers. It's not as if the complaints were deficient in their, in their making. Um, so uh, that leads us to the conclusion that the Finkel Station report was correct. Uh, and I heard just previous submissions saying the ineffectiveness of the Press Council. There is no accountability. Absolutely no accountability. One more may, may argue that um, you've got the legal accountability. That is no, that, even the defamation, as expensive as it is, is not open to the union because of the, uh, that uh, section in the legislation about exempted bodies. Mm. Um, we seek um, to be heard on this um, in the context of what the Senate found in 2011. Um, and um, we would like to re-agitate, um, uh, if permitted for a final submission, um, the Finkelstein inquiries, because even the submission by the Australian Press Council in that inquiry says that one of the key issues was enforceability. There is no enforceability. Um, so where does that leave us? Thank you, thank you Mr Marshall. Uh, can we I might just go finish on this one question? The, the argument about freedom of the press, that was canvassed absolutely canvassing the Finkelstein, and that's why they come up with a statutory body. It's at arm's length from the executive and the minister. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Mr Marshall. We might go to some questions. Uh, Senator Carr. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr Marshall. The firefighters are essential workers under any definition. Um, you've described the effect that the, this uh, campaign of vilification. I've, you know, I'm a Victorian senator. I've watched this very closely. Uh, can you just outline to the committee what the effect is on families, firefighters' families, of this vilification on your members? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Senator, for that question. Under the uh, additional documents I've handed up on ta 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 tab 13, on page 2, down the bottom of the last paragraph, um, I made a submission to uh, a Fair Work Amendment Bill uh, in 2016, and I'll quote, uh, career firefighters as a, response, as a result of Herald Sun's vilification, reputation being sorely damaged. The children have suffered at schools as a result of the irresponsible public media and new political campaign. Um, career fighter actually collecting money for volunteers was handed a bullet on one occasion. Children at schools have been abused and harangued because of the particular campaign. Um, children within the community at their school, because their father or their mother was a professional firefighter, uh, against the backdrop of the misleading, inaccurate, and sometimes downright lies, um, they were vilified as kids were vilified at school. Um, within communities, some of our firefighters actually live in very close knit communities. They were ostracised in those communities. We had no recourse to correct the record, none. 
So your description of your experience before the press council is uh, well documented. And I've known you for a very long time. I say to you the various other submissions you presented to Senate inquiries have been of similar quality in terms of the presentation. I have no doubt that your documents to the press council would be presented in a similar light. Um, it, it is surprising to me that the press council would say to you that they can't deal with the quantity of material that you're presenting. There's too many examples. In effect, is that what you're saying to the committee? There were too many examples of complaint for them to be able to deal with? We weren't saying that. We used the appropriate body, being the Australian Press Council. We submitted the articles that the Herald Sun put out. The Press Council wrote to us and said, uh, we haven't got the resources to deal with the volume of articles. You know, it was around 113 odd over a period of time. Um, so they, their remedy was to take a selection of four and put that to the Herald Sun. Uh, that was totally inadequate, uh, and that's documented. Oh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, par I, I'm actually paraphrasing their letter, mm -hmm. uh, and I can, if you give me a moment, I can take you to it. No, well, I think the point um, you, you made it very, very clear, and I accept that uh, evidence. Now, many folks would say, well, in fact, the media proprietors often complain about the defamation laws in this country as being too difficult to uh, for them. You're saying that they're just not available to your members, one, cost, and two, to the union to actually finance them. You're not, you're not actually uh, able to secure redress through defamation, is it? Absolutely. It's not available by law to the union. By law, it's not available to us. The only thing that's available is the Australian Press Council. Um, you know, I actually asked the Queen's Council, who specialises in this area, um, the cost for a normal case would be around $250,000 conservatively. That's not open to an individual. In fact, the Finkelstein report deals with the issue of defamation. The Finkelstein reports deal with the ineffectiveness of the press council, and, and that's how they arrived at that recommendation. Mm. And so uh, your, your suggestion, your recommendation to this committee is that we go back to this report and look at that as a means by which we address the question of redress for people that are in fact mistreated by the news media in this country. Is that, have I understood you correctly? Uh, correct, uh, Senator. What we're actually asking for is that the recommendation, um, and it's under tab four um, of my uh, additional documents, um, uh, sorry, uh, tab 10, sorry, um, of my additional documents. Um, the recommendation, and I'll just read it into transcript if I could, Senator. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it is a statutory body under section nine of the, sorry, um, bear with me. Oh, sorry. The screen, um, uh, they recommended um, uh, that there should be a strict timeline for handling complaints. Uh, that they recommended that there be a statutory body um, put in place to, uh, for enforceability um, uh, and that uh, complaint handling be, uh, there be a legal recourse to it. And the reason they wrecked about the um, statutory body uh, was for this. And, um, uh, and even on today's government website on page eight, page six under tab 10, a statutory body, um, and yeah. the government describes what it's for. It's an activity requires a level of independence from the responsible minister or executive government. Um, legally enforced decisions made by a regulation or decision maker uh, provide a distinct ongoing status of activity, high levels of accountability and transparency. Now that came about after the Finkelstein report. Uh, and as I said, you know, um, sure. many, many thousands of uh, uh, go back to the number of people that participated, but lots of people participated in that inquiry. Um, mm. uh, just, just bear with me. Uh, yep. Could I, could I just ask Senator Carr if that's okay? Um, through this, do you say, 13-month process, um, um, putting forward information to the Press Council, um, did they... Uh, were they engaged with you to try and resolve some of these issues, or was it that they just kept asking for more information uh, and then it all got uh, too difficult? Um, or were they saying the whole time along that there was very little they could do? 
um, they engaged in a very bureaucratic process, um, if you like. Um, I've got a chronological events based on correspondence. Uh, I've got some additional documents I can hand out up to the senators. That, that clearly outlines the whole journey, if you like, um, which was, you know, for us, we just, where do we go? We had nowhere to go. Were you assigned a caseworker or somebody to, to help you uh, work through uh, how to put a complaint together? Uh, did they talk you through how they would consider it, any complaints? Uh, no, no, we weren't. We uh, addressed our correspondence to Mr Levi at the time. Mm. Um, as I said, our, our complaints weren't just um, written by me. They were written by our lawyers mm. in accordance with the forms filled out by the Australian mm. Press Council from their website. All the information was provided. Um, uh, Madam Chair, if I could say that even after seven months you know, <laughs> where they say not enough resources and 13 months where we give up, um, even if they'd made a finding, it's some 13 months after some of the most horrible vilification mm. has been perpetrated against these people in the community. Mm. Um, and I've been around long enough to see if there was a retraction, it'd probably be on page 14, 15. <laughs> Um, it would be in small print, and what would it mean? What would be the relevance? Mm. Um, you know, the Finkelstein report covers all these issues. Um, there's another issue I want to talk about, and the principles of the Press Council, uh, they are in spirit um, uh, admirable, and if they were enforceable, they would be good, and Finkelstein report actually picks up on that. But can I say that, um, uh, you know, the practice of complying with those principles, whereas there's an article already written, and then it, you'll see in one of our examples at six o'clock at night, after the office is closed, there's a voicemail asking for our comments. Tick the box, you know. Um, there's just, you know, like it's outrageous. It really is outrageous. Could, uh, uh, Senator Carr. Well, I'm just, I mean, I want to go through some of the practices, but I think it's probably appropriate, if you don't mind, Mr Marshall, just deal with the specifics in the case, because... Yes. I mean, have you got any idea how much the union actually spent on your case for the uh, press council? Is it, uh... it would be over a hundred thousand um, so dollars. So even that process is in resource intensive for an organisation of your size. We're only a small union yeah. senator, and what you know, a hundred thousand dollars. By the time I sought advice from Queen's yeah, councils yeah, no, no, hold, and it, lawyers. So thank, thank you for that. And so let's just go through it. The Herald Sun was alleging, this is through your EB uh, enterprise uh, bargaining uh, processes, all done legally and consistent with... Um, in accordance with the laws of Australia. A, as it is, right. So this is in a dispute with the country fire authority, which had strong political connections, if I, as I say, a Victorian Senate, strong political connections with uh, opponents of the government. Uh, now, it said, for instance, that you were seeking to take over the CFA. I take it the union, in my recollection is that you, you specifically denied that. The so-called integrated stations, uh, which were involving UFU members and volunteers, um, whether they're affected by the negotiations? Was that, to, how, how did that occur? How did we see? I mean, we're a union. We're not a statutory authority of uh, parliament in Victoria. And it's ludicrous to suggest we were taking over the CFA. We were operating in accordance with the laws that have been established for unions to bargain in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a sensation, take over the CFA. And not only that, produce stickers to distribute the 10,000 people. They were authorised by the editor of the Herald Sun, Mr Damien Johnson, that's correct? Correct, and yeah. sent to some... Um, no, bumper stickers, we're talking about car bumper stickers, are they? When oh, you say stickers? They were everywhere. Yeah. They were everywhere. Um, now, so th there was a number of points made throughout the articles which you uh, were repudiated. Um, I've got here a collection of 30 front pages I can see in front of me, um, highly uh, emotional, highly uh, contestable propositions uh, directed at you and, and the Premier of Victoria, I might say. Um, now, did you contact the Herald Sun to actually seek redress in regard to those matters? Yeah, we actually complained on a number of occasions to the editor and uh, the, edi the email was received, but there was never any response. So did the editor just did not respond to you? No, that's in our evidence there. Yeah. Um, and was it, no, was it uh, the process of communication with the paper? Uh, did you uh, 
communicate with anyone else at the paper other um, than the editor? Yeah, we well, actually told reporters there was a We called a press conference to correct one of their misleading articles in relation to leave. And um, uh, rather than actually run with the correct figures, they, you know, they were saying that firefighters were having 196 days of leave, which was just totally inaccurate. They double counted leave, did all. Anyway, even correct the record when Herald Sun says, the headline was Marshall backflips. Now, I'm not worried about me, but I'm worried about the firefighters. Yeah. OK, so were you offered any space to uh, no. counter the position? Were you offered any no. counterweight to the, to the suggestions that have been made? The, 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 I'm probably not making that point very well. The only time, and it's, it's a requirement to seek the other side's views, as I understand by press council principles, what, five, six o'clock at night after the story's been printed or ready to roll? Mm. Yeah, I'm just ringing you for a comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the suggestion that you wanted to have, uh, or every commander gets a chauffeur, I remember was one story. Um, what did you do with that story? Did you contact the editor about that? Um, we would have contacted the uh, reporters and editors, um, uh, but the fact that we had no uh, response from the Herald Sun, um, that's why we actually took what was un we understood available for us to um, take it out of their hands. Um, the recourse we thought was available to, which is not available to us. Mm -hmm. And was the campaign pursued by the other major newspaper in Melbourne at the time? No, in fact, the pre when we corrected the issue regarding the leave banks, the, um, the other paper actually uh, printed the correction. Um, the contrast was breathtaking. Do you think the campaign against firefighters uh, was actually had a broader political agenda? There is no doubt that um, the linking with the uh, Daniel Andrews, the Premier and the Labor Party, um, and if you have a look at the 2016 federal election, the lead up to that is when the Herald Sun vilification intensified. Um, you know, so there's no doubt there was a political undertone to it. So I'll just get this clear then. So we've got numerous articles, 113. Um, that, is that the total, do you think, the total summary of the Well, yeah, I think that is 113 Herald Sun articles. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Uh, uh, that's, um, and we put five complaints to the press council over a seven-month period. Um, um, and can I just, so can I just, I, I mightn't have said it before because I was a bit nervous if I could. Um, the extent of the vilification was 113 articles, including 84 Herald Sun print pieces published in 60-day period, more than 20 Herald Sun front page stories in a 30-day period um, in the lead up to the 2016 election. That goes to your political point. Mm -hmm. A push poll asking, should you, Daniel Andrews, back the union CFA takeover bid? There was never any takeover bid. Mm. It's impossible for the union to take over a statutory organisation. Uh, and then the production and distribution of back to CFA campaign stickers distributed through 858 Victorian news agencies. Tens of thousands of six stickers leading up to distributed to the public against that backdrop of highly misleading if not downright deceptive claims about what we're asking for. Mm. For example, the Herald Sun said that no fire could be actually, um, you couldn't commence firefighting operators until you had seven professional firefighters on the ground in anywhere in Victoria. That's a lie, mm. an absolute blatant lie. So the persistent trafficking of malicious falsehoods is a proposition you put to us here. It was not just a question of being critical of your the industrial campaign you were running was actually critical about anything to do with the union, uh, is my, my recollection of it. Uh, now, it'll be said that this had no real impact on the state government because the state government's been returned with the record majority, but did have an effect on the federal election in regard to that 20, see, right up to the federal election, do you think? So, um I actually, um, if I could, Senator, I've actually concentrated on the effect of my members, but now you've actually raised that point. Mm. Leading up to the federal election against the backdrop of the Herald Sun vilification uh, and this distribution of their stickers through those 900 odd whatever eight number of agencies there was, sorry, what was it? Um, uh, 858 news agencies. Uh, the then um, uh, 
opposition, uh, sorry, the then Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, um, and Michaela Cash, uh, the minister, spoke at a rally of CFA volunteers against. Th th there was an incitement to, against professional firefighters on, on a falsehood, uh, and you know, uh, you know. So in fact, federal legislation had flew, uh, uh, was drawn from that uh, uh, dispute as well, if I recall rightly. That's correct. Uh, as part of that uh, lead up to the federal election, the vilification resulted in. Uh, professional firefighters becoming a political football. Now, they were only exercising their right under the Fair Work Act, where the Fair Work Act was actually amended by motion of the government of the day, Michaela Cash, uh, that actually denied the ability for professional firefighters to have an enterprise agreement. No other worker in Australia had those laws put against them. And that's the result of all this misleading information. And my point is this, we didn't have a forum to correct it. I had no legal, legal I couldn't, I, 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 I couldn't protect. Mm. Mm. Right. Um, well, I think uh, finally, I just want—I just wanted to uh, be clear. Do you think there's an ongoing campaign by the Herald Sun, or is it the change in the leadership of the Herald Sun led to a change in the attitude of the Herald Sun to the to your union? Well, um, I don't think there has been, but look, um, the Herald Sun will do what they will do. <laughs> um, my point is there's no, um, no way of making them accountable. There's no option to bring, make them accountable. Defamation's not open to us, not open to an individual because it's cost prohibitive. The Australian Press Council is totally ineffective, was in 2012 when the parliament had examined it. Our experience shows that they write to us against this background of vilification where we're asking for accountability of what the Herald Sun's writing. They write to us, say, we haven't got the resources. We'll pick four and we'll send them to them. Are you serious? And even if they did, there's no enforceability. It's a voluntary organisation, which is funded by the Herald Sun in part. So there's no justice, is there, Mr no. Marshall? Thank you very much, Mr Marshall. What do you say to your members, Mr Marshall, when they ask what you've tried to do? Can I just have a sec? Uh, what I say is that... Um, um, What can you say? Excuse me, I'm sorry. No, but, um, it's, 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 it's okay. I mean, I, I, I think we've all heard the testimony and the, uh, the weight of the pain of the members that you carry on your shoulders. And it must be very frustrating to not be able to have any recourse. And you came here today and you said you, you just want firefighters to be able to have a voice and to be heard. Um, our inquiry is looking at um, a variety of issues, but one of them is about the power of some pretty big media players in this country and the influence that they have on, on the community, on politics, on uh, decisions that are made. Uh, you don't have to apologise. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I mean, you know, look, as I said, imbalance of power, you know, we talk about that a lot and the law is supposed to be equally protective of reporters and firefighters. Um, but the imbalance, 126 million people read that paper. You know, 350,000 distributions. I mean, how does the union, a little union like us, combat that sort, even with social media? But more importantly, normally they will be open to legal recourse. There's no legal recourse. Mm -hmm. And what's most disappointing is that in 2012, all the issues and failings with the current system were canvassed at length. 
and there was a recommendation for a statutory body to make it accountable. And it didn't happen. If it had happened, the very people that this Senate found gave their life and protected the community would have been protected in law from the vilification by the Herald Sun. Mm. Um, thank you so much for your evidence today and all of the information you have prepared. I can imagine that if you've come to our com uh, inquiry this prepared, I can only imagine the preparation that went into uh, uh, the complaint to the Press Council. Um, uh, we will, of course, put some of these um, issues to the Press Council um, and to the Herald Sun and, uh, and uh, give them an opportunity to respond. But uh, I look forward to, to hearing uh, I look forward to hearing um, uh, their justification. Yeah. No, thanks, Madam Chair. There's one thing I know they will say. There was a small pause um, uh, when there was proceedings in the court against a particular reporter. Uh, and her, uh, the, um, their practice, the press council is to suspend, and they did suspend, but it was only for a small period of time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mr Marshall, if there's anything else that you uh, um, think you need to give us uh, once you leave here and, and reflect on what you've presented, don't hesitate to contact the Secretariat. And when we have a response, um, if we get a response um, from the Herald Sun or if we have a response from um, the Press Council, you're uh, entitled to um, uh, get back to us on that as well. Thanks, Madam uh, Chair. I'm I really do appreciate the opportunity. I'm sorry I got emotional, but um, the long and short of it is the documentation is evidence-based. It's not speculation no. and it's blow by blow, that horrible experience that those firefighters experienced, documented. Thank you and thank you to um, your members for keeping us safe and uh, saving our homes and our lives whenever it uh, is required. I think um, you do deserve that extension and please um, pass that on to um, those of your members um, back in Victoria. They would be pleased to hear that, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're going to uh, suspend now uh, and come back at uh, 1.45. Um, uh, recommence our hearing for today. Uh, thank you to Hansard. I now welcome representatives from Garden, Guardian Australia. I understand the information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you both please state your full names and the capacities in which you appear? Uh, Lenore Taylor, editor of Guardian Australia. Daniel Stinson, managing director of Guardian Australia. Wonderful. Um, now I invite you to make a short opening statement. We do have your submission. Um, it is submission number 13 uh, for our records um, and then we'll go to some questions. Thank you and thanks for the opportunity to give evidence today. Um, in short, we do believe that the concentration of media ownership in Australia remains a problem. As we said in our submission, that concern was one of the motivations for setting up Guardian Australia eight years ago. Eight years on, we're now the seventh most read news site in Australia, according to the Nielsen survey. We employ 113 people and we've grown to a size where we can have some influence in the Australian debate. For some years now, we've been profitable. We've paid back the original seed loan we received from philanthropist Graham Wood to help us get started. And even though we don't have a paywall, we now receive over 60% of our revenue from our readers, with most of the rest from advertising and a small amount from, from philanthropic grants. We have for some years been profitable, and because of our model, that means that those profits are invested directly back into journalism. That success and the entry into Australia by other sites, for example, the Daily Mail, is sometimes cited as a reason to be less concerned about the, um, the problems with media diversity in Australia. 
Uh, certainly the ACCC cited us uh, when it approved the nine takeover of Fairfax as one of the reasons that it didn't reduce competition sufficiently to be in breach of the law. I saw the Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas also cited our arrival in Australia as a cause for optimism about the future of journalism. And you know, in a way, it's true. We are offering a new service that Australians didn't have eight years ago, and we've created jobs that weren't there. But over that same period, other things have happened to reduce uh, the diversity of media ownership, and many, many journalism jobs have been lost, as the committee has heard. Um, and uh, so, I don't see this. I don't think our arrival should be seen as a reason that there isn't a problem for this committee to look at, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all. We aren't yet big enough to compete across the board with the big players, News Corp and Nine. We don't yet cover politics uh, in the state, at a state level or courts or local government. We've got special, specialist reporters so far only in some areas. I'm only just now recruiting for a science writer and an economics correspondent, for example. And while we've been expanding steadily over those eight years, uh, lots of other journalism jobs have been lost elsewhere. Secondly, I think the size and the cross-promotional opportunities of the big players makes it easier for them to set the news agenda or for their stories to be taken up and, um, and uh, to, be, to, to have influence, to have, to have traction in the debate, if you like. If the nine newspapers break a story, it can be uh, pushed out through the nine television station, the nine owned radio stations, nine online websites, the state based websites. So it's more likely to get noticed and picked up by other media organisations and responded to. If The Australian breaks a story, it's often taken up by other News Corp titles or by like minded radio uh, announcers or by Sky News or other News Corp mastheads. I'm not contending for a minute that you know, the media only uh, follows up stories that their own organisation has broken, but Dominant players have a better chance of getting their product noticed like in any other market. That's not to say we can't and it's not to say we don't. I think we've done quite well elbowing our way into this market in a fairly short space of time, but it is more difficult. Uh, and third, as uh, we set out in our submission, it shouldn't be assumed that the conditions that allowed us to set up in Australia would be easily replicated because we had the benefit of a global news organisation behind us for all those sort of technological and uh, data and analytical things that you need. And secondly, as I mentioned before, because we had the benefit of the seed loan from Graham Wood, which allowed us to sort of grow to a scale where we could become profitable more quickly than we otherwise would. Um, our immediate aim is to get bigger, to become more influ influential, to fill in those gaps in our reporting. Um, but we do believe that there are other things a government could do to uh, encourage media diversity and to help smaller players like us or players smaller than us to grow. Um, in broad, we favour mechanisms that use the tax system rather than any kind of grants program that could allow a government to exert influence over the media or even be perceived to exert influence over the media. Uh, we can offer a few ideas. I have to say that we haven't modelled them or researched them in detail, but broadly we can see, I can see sort of three uh, immediate uh, ways that a government could um, improve media diversity. One would be the zero rating of the goods and services tax for the sale of digital news products. About 25 per cent of our total revenue comes from digital subscriptions, which requires us to charge GST. That includes our premium paid app, so you can get all our content for free, but you can also buy a premium app, app that is an ad-free experience. It includes Guardian Weekly and it includes some of our reader revenue products uh, that um, do attract GST. Um, if, it, if it didn't, then we could reinvest that money back into the civic journalism in Australia. Uh, second, I think it's worth the government considering some sort of R&D style tax credit. I mean, that would require all the same kinds of considerations as other R&D style tax credits do, namely how you define the eligible investment and how you make sure that it's additional to investment that would have happened anyway. But if policymakers wanted to help smaller publications in particular, then the benefit could be tiered greater for companies with lower turnovers and lesser for higher turnovers. Um, I think other organisations like uh, PIGI have done more detailed research into those kinds of schemes. Um, and third, it would be very helpful if there was a way that there could be sort of across the board DGR status for philanthropic grants for public interest journalism. Um, we do accept philanthropic 
philanthropic grants now because we have partnered with Melbourne University to launch the Guardian Civic Journalism Trust. Um, that collaboration means that when we get a grant, we can use it for journalism, but we also, through the partnership, have to use it to benefit journalistic education through internships or guest lectures or funding student reporting projects and the like. So it's, it's working well and it allows us to, to accept some philanthropic grants, but there's obviously a limit to um, how many projects you can accept in, with that kind of an arrangement. And we have um, several times now suggested a small amendment to the Income Tax Act to allow institutional philanthropic donations for the purpose of civic journalism. Um, and I think there are a couple of other points that Dan will add before we conclude these initial remarks and take any questions that the senators might have. Uh, thanks, Lenore. Um, just a couple of other points from me quickly. Um, so there are uh, probably two other ways uh, that we think regulation could be used to, to both strengthen and enhance media diversity. Um, firstly, and perhaps most importantly, is through enhanced privacy regulations. Uh, now, the reason for this is because uh, data is effectively the currency that underpins digital advertising, uh, with audience targeting, which is the dominant form of digital advertising, being made possible by the ubiquitous collection and use of consumer data. This has resulted in a data arms race that has largely benefited the digital platforms of Google and Facebook, as we've heard a lot uh, this morning. Uh, and as a result of that, they have an 81% share of the digital advertising market, according to the ACCC. Now, the committee touched on this with Mr Sims earlier today uh, in the context of the information echo chambers that exist, but it also applies to advertising targeting. So at the moment, there is nothing to prevent Google, for example, reading your Gmail and using the data it obtains from that to sell your advertising uh, on YouTube or even on The Guardian. Uh, similarly, there's nothing to prevent Facebook from reading your WhatsApp messages and using this to sell targeted advertising in the news feed. But it also makes it difficult for a medium-sized media company like The Guardian to compete with Nine and News Corp, who aggregate data collected from consumer engagement across a vast range of products which spans television, radio, news websites, classifieds, and many more. The way to solve this is with purpose limitations on the collection and use of consumer data. There needs to be a reasonable, reasonableness test applied to data collection. Is it reasonable, for example, for Google to track where you move in the real world from your Android phone and use this to sell you targeted advertising in YouTube? Is it reasonable, as another example, for data on where you use your credit card to be bought and sold to sell you targeted advertising online? Uh, we would say, no, it's not reasonable. To be clear, we're not opposed to targeted advertising and placing consumers into relevant audience segments, people interested in buying a car, for example, or people interested in taking a holiday. Um, at some point, however, this becomes uh, more than just putting uh, consumers into audience segments and it becomes consumer profiling. And that is where the potential for consumer harm exists, uh, as evidenced by the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal, which was broken by The Guardian, uh, and where it is difficult for smaller players to compete in digital advertising. Uh, finally, uh, another way to strengthen media diversity is through regulation of the App Store ecosystem, which once again is dominated by two large Silicon Valley tech companies, in this case, Apple and Google. Apple in particular exerts its market power by refusing to allow iOS app developers to provide payment options other than with, with Apple's proprietary payment services. Apple's policies also prevent us and other news mastheads from marketing to those users in order to let them know that they can subscribe or contribute to uh, news services outside of the iOS ecosystem. So what this means is, as, as a result of this, Apple takes 30% of the value of all digital subscriptions and reader contributions that are made on all iPhone uh, and iPads, and which is where the bulk of our audience exists. By contrast, third-party payment service providers such as Stripe or PayPal take a payment fee of 0.1% or 3.4% respectively. So the disparity is pretty stark and it's an indication of Apple's market power. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but uh, we welcome the committee's questions. Thank you. Um, I just I wanted to deal with, I guess, an issue that has been put to us. Obviously, there's been a lot of attention on News Corp and the um, influence and uh, concentration of Murdoch-owned Murdoch -owned media uh, in Australia. And often The Guardian is used uh, as the, uh, or um, uh, referenced as the antidote to that. Oh, well, you know, but what about The Guardian? You know, it's, it's, it's getting bigger every day, it's doing well. Uh, there's no problem with media diversity. Um, 
it's seen as, uh, as uh, it's, it's, it's been put to us that it's a, that your outfit is a counterbalance to the concerns that we have. I'd just like a bit of a response to that. Um, I don't think that's what diversity means and I don't see that as our role. Um, we are progressive, that's true, which to my mind is um, an expression of the way that we look at the world, that we think it could be better and fairer. And that probably does influence how we approach stories. We're probably more likely to look at a news story from the point of view of people who are subjected to the exercise of power rather than from the point of view of the people who are exercising the power. It may lead to um, a choice of the sorts of stories that we do, but it mustn't influence how we do journalism. We do want to set the agenda, but only where the facts take us. And, uh, only when um, we have like a verifiable fact-based uh, journalistic project. We don't ever, what I'm trying to say is we don't ever try to bend the facts to get to an outcome. We go where they take us. We don't try to be a partisan player and we don't think impartiality sort of lies somewhere between where what one person says and what another person says. Impartiality lies in coming to the table with the point of view of what you want to pursue and then pursuing it to where the facts take you. So I think that um, uh, stands in contrast to some of the criticisms that the committee may have heard. It's certainly an approach to journalism that could be uh, taken by, uh, by um, an organisation with any starting point point of view. Mm -hmm. But I think it's um, the idea that somehow because we have a starting point that is progressive, that somehow balances out the the size of, of News Corp, the dominance of News Corp, or some of the criticisms that have been made of uh, the way that News Corp exercises its power. I think that's um, a mistake. That's a mistaken analysis. Mm -hmm. So if I could just add to that, I mean, I'd also make the point we are um, substantially smaller than News Corp. And yes, we are, we are growing, we're successful, um, and long may that continue. But uh, by comparison to News Corp, we're a very, very small outfit. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a counterbalance you can be when, when, uh, when you have such a size discrepancy. Mm. Um, one of the points that we've been investigating is the influence uh, of that concentration beyond just the print media. So uh, and it's been put to us that uh, Murdoch, uh, the concentration of media ownership of actual Murdoch newspapers being 80%, uh, but then there's TV and there's radio and there's The Guardian Online and there's all these other online uh, media agencies, that, there is a, um, that there's a diversity out there. It's been put to us that well, the influence from those daily uh, news court papers each morning actually bleeds into those other uh, platforms. So that is where the influence, uh, if there is a particular political agenda being pushed, if there's a, uh, a view on climate change, for example, being pushed, that is where it um, uh, gets its traction as opposed to just being printed on the front page of which we know less and less people are buying. I think that goes to what I was trying to say in my initial remarks that um, you know everybody, all media organisations, if they if they've put a lot of time and energy into a, a, a scoop, a revelation, a series, you, you want it to have an impact. You want it to be noticed. You want other organisations to pick up on it. You want politicians to respond to it. You want inquiries to be set up into it. You need to get it noticed to have that impact. Um, and the scale of both News and Nine uh, means it's, and their cross promotional opportunities, their cross promotional uh, avenues means it's much easier. And well, the ABC would probably be in that bucket as well. It means it's much easier for them to achieve that end. Mm. I mean, that's whether you're, whether they're, whether it's a sort of a, um, an agenda, if you like, or if it's just a, 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 an, an investigation. It, the, the, the size of in market makes it easier to get noticed. Mm -hmm. um, could I ask about the issue of uh, opinion versus news? Sure. Um, we had uh, uh, CEO of News Corp in front of us um, last month 
and I asked about the issues of uh, reporting facts on climate change, for example. Um, uh, it was put to me that they had written some things about climate change in relation to the bushfires uh, uh, as an opinion. It seems to me that more and more, uh, and from a lot of the submissions we've had from both general members of the community and others, uh, learned observers, suggesting that actually we are really seeing this bleed from uh, opinion into news pieces. Where there's, it's, it's harder for the consumer or the audience to work out which bit is fact and which bit is um, someone's opinion. How do you balance that? So I think there's two points to be made there. One is that you do have to be very careful to uh, make it clear to the reader what's opinion and what is news. Um, we certainly, for the most part, um, don't allow reporters to write opinion. There's only a few very senior reporters who write opinion, and most of our opinion pieces come from outside the organisation, from people who are expert in that field or have a particular view. Uh, and we actually use different colours and different fonts to distinguish opinion pieces. Opinion writers have their names in orange in italics, you know, like to really make it clear that that's opinion and that it's something different. Um, but there's a second point to be made, which is opinion still has to be based on facts. Um, opinion still needs to be grounded in facts. Um, uh, so um, saying, for instance, that the primary cause of the summer of bushfires was was arson, which is not true. That's not valid even as an opinion because it's it's simply not factual. So I'd make those two points. One, yes, you need to delineate it, but even within opinion, the opinion needs to be fact-based. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, uh, Senator Carr. Yes, uh, Ms. Taylor, you're a uh, very experienced journalist. You've worked for a number of organisations, in fact, all the major media companies before you were editor at The Guardian. Um, we've heard evidence that there's been a change in the media landscape, uh, particularly through news in recent times. You know, um, just uh, Knock this morning, for instance, uh, presented evidence that in his 30 year experience, there'd been a dramatic change. Can you give us any advice as to uh, your observations? Has there been a change in the way news is reported through the major media companies? Obviously, you'll comment on your own outlet now, but then you have done that. But what about the others and your direct experience? Um, so are you asking me in general or about News Corp in, in particular? Well, well, I mean, I, you have worked for The Australian. I have twice. Yes. Um, I'm wondering whether or not you've noticed any changes as, as a professional, as a journalist of high standing in this country, very experienced. Have you noticed any changes in the way in which news is presented through the, that organisation throughout your career? And uh, so I can comment on my experience. Um, and there's a couple of factors that would come into that. The first time I worked for The Australian was for about eight years from 1988. So I was more junior and I was doing mostly sort of policy-based reporting. And for the most part, I could just sort of get on with my job, writing mainly then about Indigenous issues and environmental issues. There were times when um, I thought maybe the issue I was writing about deserved more prominence than it got, but I think lots of journalists think that at times. Um, the second time I worked there was for two years um, from, I think it was about 2007. Um, and uh, I did at that point, um, I was more senior. Um, I was writing more political based stories and I did notice um, more um, more briefs out of news conference that had a particular slant to them. But that said, if I said that brief doesn't make sense or I think that brief is based on a false assumption or I can't, I can't write it that way but I could write it that way, um, that was accepted. 
On occasions when I said that, I would see the original brief appear in the paper under someone else's byline. Um, and, you know, I, there were times when there were tensions. I recall um, being at the Copenhagen Climate Conference and having some tensions with the news desk over whether I should leave the conference where there were 115 world leaders to go and cover a climate skeptics conference on the other side of town, which I didn't think was the right use of my time. Um, but, I ne but I was never directed to write something and nothing that appeared under my byline was something that I was unhappy with. You didn't with. write? Yeah, no, yeah. that didn't happen. So um, Mr Knox says that he was never directed in a similar way, again, highly experienced uh, journalist, um, very highly reputable, highly decorated journalist. Um, do you think there's a difference as to whether or not uh, that might occur for a journalist that doesn't have extensive experience? Would it be the case that people are able to be directed or influenced to write in manners more conducive to the news desk view of the world? I don't think I can. Prop I don't think I can fairly answer that, mm. because when, I mean, when I was more junior, it was in an earlier time. So I'm. I'm but I was the was the uh, in that earlier time was the uh, your experience was there greater evidence of attempts to influence the direction of the paper? I think uh, the papers were generally sort of straighter in their in their mm. approach to the news then. I think that's mm, fair to say. Yes, right. Um, I mean, you are particularly expert in regard to climate change, which has become a highly contentious issue in this country, as unlike others. Uh, how do you account for that? Why is it more contentious in your judgment in this country than it is, say, for instance, in Europe? Uh, because it is some, uh, portrayed as, um, because climate science is portrayed as a matter of debate when it's a matter of science. And would that not be a product of the media coverage? In part, yes. So when we talk about the importance of the media to democratic debate, is this not an example of where it actually has a direct bearing on the direction of public policy? I think so. We see it's been put to us that we're actually living in this ideal time. You know, this like chairman's mouth, thousands of flowers are blooming. Um, it's been put to us by the media proprietors that although we might have, it's my contention, we've got the highest level of media concentration in the world, in the Western world, that is, um, but it's said we've got the highest level of diversity because we've got all these platforms out there, these digital platforms. The ACCC seems to think that's a reasonable point of view as well, as does the IPA. Uh, even the press council says that. What do, what do you say to that? I mean, it's a slightly different point to what's being said before, but do well, we get diversity out of more platforms? Well, I would like to think that we are providing diversity. To torture your metaphor, I'd like to think I'm tending my flower garden as hard yeah, as I possibly sure. can. But it's a little and patch, though, isn't it? It's well, more like, I would like to think that we're somewhere. actually quite mm. influential yeah. in the debate, particularly on climate policy and mm. climate science, because we saw that from the beginning as a place where we could have an influence, and I think that we have. But what do you say to the proposition that's put to us, that within the Murdoch press, there is a diversity of opinion? Uh, that's true to an extent. Does that cover it? We, we should let the highest concentration of media ownership go undisturbed because we've got so many different opinions I being think expressed. that would be a matter for you, Senator. Mm, mm. Because the range of views is so wide, isn't it? I didn't say it was wide. I said uh, to uh, an extent. Mm. All right. Well, then, if I might take it through, you're now in a position where you're saying you read a contribution of about 60 per cent of your revenue. Is that right? Um, do you expect that proportion to grow? I do. Um, what do you think in terms of the responses to the government's digital platform uh, changes. Do you think you know, will that be sustainable uh, revenue source for you? You mean the deal we've done with yeah, Google? Yeah, Google. Um, uh, well, I think that there is the ongoing pressure that's there from the legislation, so we hope that it is. Um, I think that there are two things that we need to bear in mind when we go about 
um, implementing the journalism that we can from that deal. One is at all times to maintain editorial independence, to report on Google in exactly the way that we would have otherwise, which is in no way impeded by the deal. Mm -hmm. And the second is to be aware that we can't um, bake it into our business to the extent that you know we would be in a difficult position if it were to at one point not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. But Dan might want to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd largely echo those points. I think, um, but perhaps add a couple of things, and that is that because of this legislation, even though uh, Google and Facebook aren't designated under it yet, the threat of that designation, as we heard here this morning, has certainly been enough in Google's case from our perspective to do a substantial deal and a deal which will, will make a very material difference to our business and, and the number of journalists that we employ. Uh, we're hopeful that the same will happen with Facebook. Um, time will tell. Um, and as long as this legislation is in place and that threat of designation is there, uh, or designation itself, um, then uh, we're hopeful that it will make a, an ongoing difference. So is it, um, how long's the, the arrangement, uh, what's the term of the arrangement for you, for the current deal you've got? That's uh, commercial and confidence, Senator, oh, but it? oh, it's uh, a oh, multi-year right. deal. Okay, yeah. So um, how, how do you renew it, no matter what the length of time is? Um, like most commercial agreements, uh, Senator, we get to the end of this term and we would mm. uh, no doubt negotiate a new agreement mm. which would be based on the, the terms of the previous one. Yeah. No doubt there'll be some tweaks to make. Um, yeah. But I'm relatively confident, again, if the legislation is in place, that uh, that, that renewal would be forthcoming. Mm -hmm. What about smaller players? How do you think they'll fare under that arrangement? I think similarly. Um, uh, we have seen some Smaller players already strike deals with both Google and Facebook. Um, I think, as, again, as we heard here this morning, I think uh, time will tell. Um, but uh, I would have thought that Google and Facebook would be motivated to do agreements with smaller players as well as larger players. All uh, of them? Um, it's difficult to say. Um, but I would be, I mean, this is just my personal opinion now, I would be surprised if there wasn't a substantial number of additional deals done. I think it makes sense that the, the deals that have been announced so far are with the largest players just, and because they employ most of the journalists. Sure, but just the government's pretty reluctant to designate uh, these uh, various measures to actually force the arbitration process, isn't it? I don't think we know that yet, Senator. Do we? Are we? Oh, you've seen evidence that they are quick to move on it, don't they? The six months we've seen so far, you've seen any evidence that the government... No, Senator, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just making the point that um, the agreement... Uh, well, I can give you some example here. So, so the agreement that we negotiated with Google is a very complicated agreement. Mm. Um, it took a long time to negotiate. Mm. We were already had laid down some of the groundwork for this before the legislation was uh, mm. passed, and in fact, even before the draft was introduced into the lower house. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm just making the point that I think it's, um, it's, it's going to take a reasonable amount of time to negotiate these agreements because of their complexity. Right, I see. And so the smaller players, they'll have access to this complexity, will they? They have um, the capacity to collectively bargain as well mm. under the legislation. I, I don't know if they've availed themselves of that, but they can. Yeah. I see that. But you're also suggesting that that's not going to be enough because in your submission you're saying when you need to ensure future interest to public journalists through tax relief. And in your submission you're talking about uh, the use of the tax system, which I commend you for. Um, so so it'd be fair to say you don't rely on this as a source of money, do you? We think it will help, but it's no, I mean, clearly any media business uh, in today's world needs a diversity of revenue. Uh, mm. Be that from advertising, be that from consumers, mm. be that from licensing content, as we've seen with, uh, with right. these agreements. And also, if um, I mean the the deals with the platforms are broadly proportional to the si existing size of the players in the market, so they're not going to change no. the the pattern rel no. one relative to the other. In so fact, if yeah. we want to get relatively big, proportionally bigger in the market, sure. then we need to you know do more, work harder, and yeah. know, find other ways. In fact, it's been said the deal. Uh, with Google and Facebook really is for the benefit of, of news. 
Well, I, I think, I mean, look, nobody knows the commercial terms of everybody else's deal. It seems mm. to me from what you can see that, it, that the deals are proportional to the existing size of players yeah, in the market. Yeah. Um, so I just want to go to the issue about this taxation um, question, because uh, I think this is going to be a critical matter for future directions in terms of encouraging investment. Um, your, you've had a look at the public interest uh, journalism initiative that's, that's flagged this idea. Mm -hmm. um, this um, similar types of proposals by the ACCC have been rejected by the government. Um, do you think there's got uh, any room here for this measure, which you know, talking about benchmarks of $150,000 a year investment or revenue investment, a revenue basis for it? Um, definitions around core news content, some commitments in regard to professional journalistic standards. Do you think these are the sorts of criteria that should be applied? Um, well, I think um, as in the discussion of any tax credit like this, the definitions of eligible activity are incredibly important, um, as we've seen in many other areas where R&D tax credits have been offered. And I would imagine if a government was going to look at it, they'd want to be really careful about that. Yeah, well, that's always the issue. Um, and administered by the tax office, so that same as the other schemes, so that'd be one of the criteria I'd suggest necessary. And look, just um, I'm beginning to wind up here. So one of the final um, points I'd raise is that uh, the Guardian's foreign owned, isn't it? That's well, correct. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, right. So yeah. Guardian News and Media is a subsidiary of Guardian News and mm. Guardian News and Media Australia now, is a subsidiary of Guardian I'm obviously raised a concern about the fact that the uh, news is American owned. Are you subject to the foreign interference uh, regime? I don't believe so. And Why not? We, well, uh, we, that's our advice to date, that we're not. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. Senator, I, I think I might notice. suggest you have a look at Kevin Rudd's uh, submission here, because uh, he has uh, got legal advice. And we're getting a, a QC's opinion on this, uh, Mr. Secretary. I trust we've followed that up. Um, it may well be that you are. Which would be relevant if we were lobbying government on something? Oh, you mean to say you're not influencing governments through the media? Uh, I thought that was the point you were saying beginning in the beginning of your submission, agenda setting. I mean, surely that's what you're about. Well, there's a difference between that and directly lobbying ministers or oh, government yeah. MPs. I see. I see. I look forward to having a look at that advice and perhaps the, the QC's opinion. Sure. Thanks very much. We're happy to take um, uh, whatever advice you want on, on notice on that. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Yeah, Chair, thanks very much. Um, earlier in your evidence, you referred to some of the discussion that's come up in submissions and earlier today around echo chambers and the impact of the digital media. I was interested in your observations about data use regulation. Um, as it pertains to advertising or, or other um, referral, if you like, of, of people. Do you think that would be a potential answer to this whole issue of echo chambers distorting the, the breadth and diversity of news feeds that go to people? I was referring to it primarily in the context of targeted advertising, but uh, I think it is fair to assume that the data that is collected on consumers uh, both on and off uh, Google and Facebook's platforms, that data would also be used for the purposes of targeting content to them. So uh, it, I think it would have a similar benefit if we, were, if we were to put limits or guardrails at least around the collection and use of consumer data. Not only would that uh, limit the um, advertising targeting capabilities, it would also, I would assume, limit the content targeting capabilities and could potentially, this is speculation, but could potentially minimise the impact of those echo chambers that were discussed this morning? Yeah, uh, you may have heard uh, raise this question with a couple of other submitters. You know, I'm, I'm very, very wary of, of governments or in fact anybody um, getting in between the Australian people and sources of media because I think a plural society has to have uh, a free media that's um, able to communicate. But where that's filtered, which is essentially what these algorithms are doing, that I'm concerned because even with fact-based journalism, um, you know, if the economy is growing, 
GDP is rising, you can factually say in some cases that a section of the budget may have decreased as a percentage of GDP, but it may have actually increased in real terms. Uh, and yet you can have two counter narratives, both are factually correct. But if somebody is only getting the information on, on one version of that, uh, then they're quite misled in terms of, of the reality. I mean, I think it's a, a legitimate concern, Senator, uh, the, um, the whole issue of filter bubbles that leads us to another whole conversation about um, media literacy, I think, which is really important that, um, you know, people can understand uh, what news they're getting, where they're getting it from. Indeed. So even with the advertising, let's leave aside content around news for the moment, but even with advertising, given that uh, these large digital platforms are offshore based, um, there's you know, been a long drawn out process around how they deal with people such as yourselves as news content providers. Um, but in your view, would the Australian government be able to influence how they deal with data? Or would that be something that would need a a broader agreement between nation states? Senator, I think, um, I mean, I should stress, I'm not an expert in this area of law, but um, uh, I'll, I'll give you my understanding and why I think this is a potentially quite an elegant or quite a powerful solution to this. So obviously uh, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for um, a country like Australia to mandate, for example, the breakup of uh, Facebook and the, the, the uh, forced sell-off of, of Instagram and WhatsApp. What we could do from here, though, uh, is we could mandate that there are purpose limitations on the use of data so that uh, Facebook is no longer allowed to read your WhatsApp messages and use the content of those messages to sell targeted advertising to you in the Facebook news feed. That seems to me that that is something within uh, the realms of privacy regulations, which we could do from Australia. And the, um, the beauty of this is it, it has the, uh, a similar effect as breaking, of, of breaking them up. Um, you know, but is actually possible from, from a jurisdiction like Australia outside of the US. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, if you have any uh, further thoughts on, on you know, that approach of uh, data use regulation to get rid of echo chambers, I'd be, uh, be, be very pleased to hear them. Thank you. Um, and, and the same on the taxation question, if there's any further advice sure. uh, in regard of that matter, supplementary submission would be most welcome. Yes, I, that was actually the point I was going to make. You did. Sorry. You meant no. That's fine. You did mention that you didn't have any, You hadn't modelled any of these suggestions, but um, it would be helpful for us to have some sense of uh, the positive contribution um, from your perspective that it could make. So, sure. you know, obviously we can fiddle around the edges, or we can come up with something that actually. Um, works. Um, works and makes a substantial difference. So if you've got anything that can help us understand uh, where we get our best bang for our buck, that would be helpful. Senator, I could probably give you a little bit of colour around this now, if that helps. Um, so as Anor mentioned in, the, in her opening remarks, uh, about 25% of our revenue currently comes from um, digital subscriptions or membership, and that has uh, a GST component to it. So therefore 10% of 25% of our revenue, whatever that works out to be, I guess two and a half percent, uh, we are effectively not, in, not able to use for the investment in journalism. So mm -hmm. that's, um, that's not massive, but it's not immaterial either. Uh, and the other point I would make with regards to uh, a scheme similar to the R&D tax incentive is that our biggest expense, as you would expect, is uh, investment in journalism and, uh, and civic journalism. So if there was a tax incentive for that investment, that would make a really material difference to our business because mm -hmm. we would have a lot more money to invest in more civic journalism. And, and just to be clear, that type of R&D tax incentive as opposed to a grant program for investing in journalism uh, so that there is, a, there is more of a, um, a guarantee that it's at arm's length and it's not yes. a government of the day cherry picking their favourite outlets. Yes. Yes. It's, and then if it's based on civic journalism, really, uh, you come up with a definition of civic journalism and then uh, it's, it's not a matter of opinion after that. Yes. Which the ACCC already did, mm. and the government already did. Could, could I ask one final question? This is in, yes, in relation to the civic journalism and the philanthropic contributions mm -hmm. that you make. How do we, um, or how do you ensure that 
uh, your journalists are still able to write what they need to write, um, even if somebody has, you know, contributed money to this particular yeah. area. We have to be very, very careful about that. So um, we don't do very many of these arrangements, and when we do, we have a conversation and and say, so this is an area that we want to do more reporting in, but we can't finance ourselves right now. If a philanthropist wants to um, wants to contribute to that, then. Uh, we agree on the parameters of the reporting project or the reporting task, and then they have absolutely no more say in it. They don't talk to me, they don't talk to the reporter. We report back to them on the impact of what we're doing and the, the number of times the stories get read or whatever. Mm. But the only way that we can do those arrangements is if the uh, grantee absolutely understands editorial independence, and that's got to be non-negotiable, and that doesn't suit any, everybody, and that's entirely fair enough, but there's, that can't be compromised. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it, it's different, it's not a commissioned piece no. per se. No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both very much for your time today, and thanks for staying that little bit longer to yeah, get through I the I apologise for being late. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having us. So I now welcome Dr Dennis Muller uh, from the Centre for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne to come to the table. Welcome, uh, Dr Muller. Uh, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Dr Dennis Muller, and I'm a senior research fellow in the Centre for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Now, um, do you have a short opening statement for us? I do. Okay, wonderful. Let's go through that and then we can get to some questions. All right, thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity of appearing before you today. I appreciate it greatly on behalf of the university. I'd like to start by emphasising that the issue of media diversity and the history of how we got here are not politically partisan questions. Both the main political parties have made policy decisions over the past century or so that have brought us to where we are now, and we've pointed these out in, in our submission. In the wake of the first of these decisions, the one that allowed the newspaper companies to buy controlling interests in commercial radio, Robert Menzies was asked if the government was ever going to do anything to curtail the publisher's power. He replied, we haven't the guts. That frank statement about the imbalance of power between government and media is as true today as it was in the 1930s. That imbalance distorts our democratic institutional arrangements. It's a distortion created by the concentration of media power in too few hands. The institutional role of the media in a democracy is to hold government to account. Its role is not to intimidate government. This is but one way in which lack of media diversity undermines democracy. The American media scholar C. Edwin Baker identified another democratic principle which is undermined by lack of media diversity, the principle of egalitarianism reflected in the concept of one vote, one value. He argued that a country was democratic only to the extent that its media, as well as its elections, were structurally egalitarian. Only in this way could the whole of a self-governing people have a say in how their government was run, their country was run. There is also an economic principle at stake. The principle is that market failure in media diminishes what media can bring to a democracy. Many scholars have argued that professionally produced news should be treated as a public good 
in the classic economic sense. Others go further. They say journalis journalism is not only a public good, but a merit good. Merit goods are typically undervalued by individual citizens, so they don't buy them, yet they are essential to society's well-being. If we accept these arguments, the concentration of media ownership in Australia is a clear instance of market failure in a merit good. One company, News Corporation, controls two-thirds of the metropolitan daily newspaper circulation and has monopolies in Brisbane, Adelaide and Hobart. In Perth, Seven West Media controls virtually everything. The details are set out in our submission. Market failure in a merit good is a double-barrelled reason for government intervention. Now, forced divestment of media assets is not going to happen. So what form should government intervention take? The present government has intervened so far in two different ways. First, it introduced the mandatory bargaining code between Australian media organisations and the global tech giants. And it produced an assistance package to regional media during the pandemic. But a more permanent form of assistance is needed. However, it must work in a politically neutral way and provide support to the widest possible range of media outlets especially those in rural and regional Australia, where the deficit in public interest or civic journalism is most severe. Emeritus Professor Rodney Tiffin of Sydney University has proposed in his submission to the inquiry that one way to do this is by the government's providing financial support to a news wire service. Australian Associated Press is the obvious candidate. It has a long and distinguished history of providing comprehensive accurate, politically neutral coverage, uh, free of commercial considerations. It's now owned by a consortium of investors and philanthropists who were alarmed when AAP was shut down as a result of the decisions by its two biggest shareholders, News Corp and Nine Entertainment. News Corp immediately set up its own in-house news service, prompting Rob Sims, chairman of the ACCC, to fire a warning shot across its bows about predatory pricing. This showed how alarmed the competition regulator was at the prospect of News Corp extending its reach even further via a newswire service that would likely be taken up by former AAP subscribers. Those subscribers include a vast number of rural and regional newspapers and radio stations. Government support for a newswire service would, at a stroke, go some way to remedying the deficit in public interest journalism provide a news lifeline to rural and regional media and increase diversity by helping innumerable local media outlets to survive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr Muller. I might go to Senator Carr, if that's okay. Thank you, if you could. Look, uh, uh, Dr Muller, the uh, ACCC uh, has told us there's no problem with the current uh, competition in Australia. In fact, they didn't actually say that. They actually said that there was a, they thought there was plenty of diversity. They didn't. But the Australians written up their appearance today as being no problem for um, <laughs> competition in Australia. Uh, I'm just wondering the uh, new, and, and of course nine entertainment executives also gave evidence that because we've got this diversity of views, it's more important than a diversity of ownership. I think it's more accurate description of what they actually said, as distinct from the report that's now appeared in the uh, in the new in the Australian and the news <laughs> paper, the Oz papers, following our proceedings. Uh, what do you say to that proposition? Is the diversity of voices more important than the diversity of ownership? That sounds to me like a distinction without a difference. If you have a, a, a corporate arrangement, as certainly News Corporation does, uh, where um, there is a high degree of consonance, shall we say, between the content of its various outlets uh, on particular issues, um, then I think it's a very difficult proposition to argue that um, there isn't, in a sense, one um, owner and one voice. I mean, just take as one example, a pretty colourful one, uh, the example of the, pre of the um, 
portrayal of the former Prime Minister, Mr. Rudd, after, I think it was after his appearance here. And eight of the News Corp newspapers across the country had identical pictures, headlines and text, uh, basically attacking Mr. Rudd in a partisan way for his appearance here. Uh, now that's, uh, of course, not an everyday example, but I think it does, no, but it's, does point to, to, does to the proposition. The issue, now, yeah. uh, on the other side, um, you've heard just a moment ago from um, Lenore Taylor and, um, and her organisation uh, represents um, a, uh, a more centrist, uh, progressive um, uh, perspective on public events, as does the, the old Fairfax papers, now the nine entertainment newspapers. Uh, they tend to offer a more um, progressive, centrist view. Um, and then Kerry Stokes, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure which way he would jump on any one thing, but basically I think the proposition that a diversity of ownership equals diversity of voice uh, is a canard, frankly. So if we have online news uh, sites, uh, both or most of which are associated with the major media companies, and one standalone business effectively, um, do we actually get improvement in the quality of journalism or, or do we get a broader dissemination of fake news through these various uh, multiplicity of standalone sites? I, I think we get both, <clears throat> frankly. Um, the, um, the, the fake news phenomenon, there's no doubt, has been enabled by the proliferation of online um, platforms of various kinds, excluding the online platforms of the established media. But, and I think an associated point is, however, that um, all of the readership data show that, in fact, the, uh, the established news companies colonise the online um, news uh, area and we see from the readership data that that's where most people go when they go online for news. They go to Nine or the ABC or News Corp um, rather than to these smaller news sites. Um, but then, of course, uh, you've got this proliferation of sites that uh, have no attachment at all to the professional standards of journalism. And, of course, we've seen in the case of the United States uh, just how destructive of democratic life that can be. So let me just take this through. I mean, it'll be also said, though, that we, in fact, the media executives made the point very strongly that, look, we've got this major competitive source, namely the electronic media television, as an example. They'll say, where's the source where people get most, uh, most Australians watch the TV rather than read the paper. Now, it's also true, isn't it, that broadcast media draws a lot of its information from newspapers? Yes. And is it also the case that newspapers of the traditional kind and are associated websites still provide the primary source of news information in the yes, country? Yes, that is correct, and it's, it's correct by a country mile. Right. What's your evidence for that? Well, I haven't brought numbers with me, mm -hmm. but if Would you, you were to do... A, an analysis of any weeknights, uh, commercial and ABC for that matter, and SBS news bulletins on television, you would see uh, that there are very, very few breaking stories. There would be very, very few stories any, on any day or any week that hadn't in fact been broken by the morning papers, yeah, typically. Uh, uh, and yes, look, uh, we, we are professional media watchers here, yeah. media consumers, if yes. you like. Yes. Now, that would be, I'd say, most politicians would agree with that. Do you have any uh, academic studies that sustain that view? No. Unfortunately, right. so I do, don't. How do we know? Uh, I mean, that's our intuition. I, I, and I'll say to you, it's not just the TV. I'd say to you, I listen to Fran Kelly quite often in the morning and having read The Australian, and I'm yeah. wondering how much her executive assistants or her researchers have fed material straight through to go well, all over Australia based on what is 
uh, News Limited story, which may well be wrong. Hmm. Well, if you'd like, Senator, um, I could set aside a week no, I don't and I could produce um, you. Well, or you could, you could um, I'll put it to you, if you feel uh, that it's useful to make a supplementary submission to sustain the argument that you're putting, mm -hmm. I'd appreciate it. I'm sure the committee would appreciate yes. it. Uh, right. Now, whatever evidence there is, but I think this is a critical issue because it goes to this key question of the dominance of the print media. We're being told it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter a bit because we've got this multiplicity of opinion out there, uh, you know, within a very, very narrow range, I might say, but nonetheless, we're, we're being told by the IPA, um, by um, the uh, Press Council, which is, of course, run by, you know, is a body that's effectively an agent for the newspapers. Yes. We're told by the media proprietors. We're told by the ACCC. We're not much interested in that. That's someone. That's that's another body's responsibility. Um, that's you no. Know, we're only interested in uh, you know we're in competition. Well, but it's quite clear that the dominance of print media has a profound effect on on the capacity for news dissemination in this country. That's that's the argument that I would put. I'm just wondering if that's the case. Then the issue of ownership remains a critical factor. It would does. you agree? I would agree, and I think that um, the, stra the strategies of the big media companies and respective newspapers tells us that it's true, that they're still critical. Um, there's been all sorts of um, uh, premature, and as it turns out wrong, predictions about the death of newspapers. I mean, some newspapers died, but long before the internet the came along. The Argus died some time ago. Yeah, they did, and so did a lot of afternoon yeah, newspapers. Yeah, but yeah. the fact is, the fact remains that newspapers remain vitally important uh, for a range of reasons. One of them is that they still have the largest newsrooms by miles. I mean, um, television newsrooms can be counted in the dozens, the numbers of reporters. In, still in, in the age, for example, there would be, what, 200 or something journalists um, employed at the age newsroom. I was in there the other day. Uh, so the other thing is that newspapers have not disappeared, even though at one point Fairfax said they were going to phase out newspapers, they haven't, and there must be obviously good strategic reasons for not doing so. Uh, but I think your fundamental point um, would be answered by some data, and I would be very happy to provide a, a supplementary submission uh, which gave you some, some data on the number of stories that, are, for example, um, it turned up on the morning radio news bulletins, AM, and the perhaps the 774 um, yep. Melbourne morning show, which draws heavily on stuff in the Herald Sun and the Age. I'd, I'd do that for a week for you, certainly. It, whatever, if you can provide it, that'd be greatly appreciated. Okay. Uh, you also refer to international research indicating extent to the impact of the loss of local news. Yes. I think this is a matter of deep concern yes. to Australians. Uh, especially uh, in regional Australia, but you know, in terms of the uh, hollowing out of newspapers. I mean, it also, I think, occurs in suburban Australia too, not just in terms of uh, uh, in rural Australia, but no. in, in the suburban, the loss of suburban news uh, outlets has been quite a critical. I mean, I, I remember some years ago reading the data about the most highly read newspapers often the throwaway. You know, mm. I don't know if that'd be the case anymore because there's considerably fewer of them. Now, I'm just wondering, is there once the routine or the daily routine of reporting, uh, that's, has that changed? Is there less course reporting, there less uh, public meetings, less police rounds, less engagement with the community about providing that sort of access that any democratic system actually requires? Yes, there is. And um, uh, I and Andrea Carson and Margaret Simons uh, at, the, uh, at the university uh, conducted a, a research project, which we referred to in our submission um, in 2015, I think it was, and it showed there was a serious hollowing out um, of exactly the sort of news you've been talking about. I, for example, went to Maury, uh, was my contribution to this, and I remember that um, the local paper had been reduced in staff from four to three, that it no longer went to the local council meetings, much less its committee meetings, that it relied on the Maury or the whatever the Shire is up there, Shire Council's um, website 
for news, well, you can't rely on a website for news, they're propaganda. Um, and the, the one local commercial radio station had a single reporter who had come from the motor vehicle spare parts industry and had no formal training at all. He told me he never got out of the office, uh, was completely at the mercy of press releases from the local council and the local members of parliament. It, isn't, it wasn't journalism. Mm. And so there was, and there was no court coverage anymore except a list of the outcome of the week's proceedings published in the paper once a week. That, is, that was an, a colourful example of how uh, civic journalism, public interest journalism, has been hollowed out just in one city. Byron Bay was the same. Thank you. Now, there's been, uh, uh, I think, uh, horrific uh, evidence presented to us today concerning the failure of the press council, failure of uh, people that have been gravely wronged to get any respite or justice through the current administrative arrangements and legal arrangements mm -hmm. in terms of the way that uh, newspapers can move against individuals and organisations. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yes. What do you say to the fact that the Press Council has been, uh, is, is, is such a, a paper tiger? Well, I say it's true that it is, and it's a tragedy. Um, and it's uh, partly a result, yet another result of the lack of diversity because the financing of the press council is proportionate depending upon the, um, uh, the circulation of the paper. So once again, News Corporation is a dominant force in the financing of the press council. Clearly the press council lacks independence it always has. Um, I used to, I must say, um, in defence of the Press Council, that it's not a pleasant experience um, appearing before it. I used to be the Press Council advocate for firstly the Sydney Morning Herald and then the Age, going along to defend the indefensible before people like Hal Wooden, who was a former Supreme Court judge. Um, but I think that the Press Council over time has proved to be ineffectual and the um, I think the evidence for that is that the, the media members tr tend to treat its findings with contempt. Um, even when they publish negative adjudications against them, uh, they'll be published as far back in the paper as possible under a heading that says something like Press Council Adjudication Number 1506. <laughs> no, no sign of a verb or a noun anywhere. So would you support uh, a news media council along the lines recommended by the Finkelstein in inquiry? Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I, I must declare I worked as a consultant to the Finkelstein inquiry. Uh, I thought that the um, proposal for a statutory authority was unwise. I thought that was a step too far. Um, but I do think that what I think of as a statute based self regulator is, is a why better... Wouldn't that be the what would that, why wouldn't that have the same problems well, as it would, the press council? It, well, a statute, if it was statute-based, um, the, the statute would lay down certain requirements and parameters and accountabilities. See, and, it, then, and, and, and then that could be challenged in a court if they didn't follow through, is that what yes, you Yes, yes. And who would fund it? It would have to be funded by the industry. But see, then... Isn't the case of the piper, you know, who yeah. pays the piper, pays the tune? Well, you get into a collision then between le legislated requirements and, and funding. But what's, the police aren't funded by, uh, you know, law, uh, criminals. I mean, no, we no, do. We, you know, I mean, yeah. wouldn't expect them to be. No. There is a role for the state to actually fund enforcement. Yes. And it's the role of the state to... Uh, appoint people that are independent and are capable of proper uh, well, I mean, judicious judgment. Mm. I mean, that's, is that not true? That is true. Uh, but I think, I think it's difficult to, um, to treat the media in, in, in our democratic system, it's difficult to treat the media in a way that you would treat um, ordinary law enforcement like the police. 
I, I, I acknowledge that it's a difficult, it's a really difficult question, mm -hmm. but I, uh, my, my proposition would be that the, that the, the statute would lay down certain requirements okay. upon the industry, and that would include the financing of it. All right. Well, if you, you're, you're a consultant to uh, Finkelstein, and you, uh, I take it you've obviously studied his recommendations. Oh, oh yes, yes. And, yeah. and, and you maintain the view that you thought it went too far. I, I thought the statute of authority went too, went too far. The, the Convergence Review came up with a, a, a more, um, I think, moderate proposition. But uh, at any rate, uh, I think it will be very difficult as a matter of practical reality to get a statutory authority up in Australia. And I Why? think- Why? Because the, the look Media what, barons look what are happened, too powerful. Well, look what happened to Finkelstein and Rickardson. Yeah. They were Stalin, they were Kim Jong-un. I mean, the political f fire. Go back to Robert Menzies in the 1930s. We didn't have the guts. So, so you think, and that's why Finkelstein was stymied. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And you think those forces would still stymie any proposal? I do, yes. So it's not, a, so, for the, so for lack of political gumption, is that the issue? Yes, precisely. That's a profound observation to make, that, <laughs> that the political system lacks the gumption to actually do anything about I accountability. Think the, I think the, the runs are on the board, as they say. I mean, there've been you know, the Finkelstein inquiry, the Convergence Review, any number of royal commissions going back to the 1950s have tried to tackle this question and have got nowhere. Thank you. Um, Mr. Muller, just finally, before we um, finish up, I was wondering if you had um, in, you obviously participated in the Finkelstein review. I know you've been in front of this committee previously mm. in relation to some of these issues. Obviously, the focus of our inquiry um, uh, has been media diversity across the board, but there is a clear um, uh, need to look at the influence of the Murdoch press. Um, I'm wondering what you thought, or, or if you've turned any um, uh, of your resources or, or thinking to what the impact of the Leveson inquiry in the UK meant for the Murdoch press, um, either in the UK or internationally, and should, are there things that we should be considering in that and learning from that? Yes, uh, there are. Firstly, um, what we learned from the Leveson inquiry was that even when there was proven criminality, uh, it proved impossible to get uh, Lord Leveson's recommendations for an independent press council through the British Parliament. Mm. It collapsed in, in a mishmash of Fleet Street-driven mechanisms and impress, the, uh, the independent one. Uh, so it taught us that, uh, that the power of the Murdoch press in England and it is at least as great here, is sufficient to block significant reform. Um, I think that's the that's the first lesson to come out of uh, out of the Leveson inquiry. Um, the second is that uh, even when you get dreadful revelations of this kind, the public interest in it evaporates rapidly. So there is no countervailing political f pressure brought to bear on the parliament to, to do anything about it. So in a sense, you've got extreme pressure from one side, in that case, Murdoch, and in a sense, no countervailing pressure. Mm. So I think they're the other two lessons I take away from Leverson. Mm. Thank you. Um, you've uh, agreed to do some homework for us, so we look forward to receiving that. Uh, thank you so much. I think that would be very helpful to, um, and goes to a, a big part of um, what okay. we're talking about. Okay. Uh, so appreciate uh, you pleasure. taking that on. Thank you so much this afternoon. Thanks very much, Senator. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have. Next up, we uh, have Anthony Clan, and he's going to be appearing via video conference. I understand we've got him on the line. Mr. Clan, can you hear me? I can. 
Good afternoon, One Senator. Wonderful. Thank you. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Anthony John Clan, I appear in the capacity as editor of the Claxton newspaper and former journalist with News Corporation Australia. Thank you, Mr. Clan. Now, we have um, your first uh, initial submission. Um, we also have received uh, your uh, supplementary submission, but I just we've, we've had a bit of a discussion about it on the committee here today. Um, uh, like we always do with these things, if there is adverse comment made uh, in submissions, we give um, others the right of reply before we publish. So just to let you know, we're not going to be publishing your second secondary submission uh, at yet. We will, but just uh, we're, we're just going through the proper process. Um, so I would appreciate as we go through evidence today, um, if there are things that stray into the secondary submission. Um, just think a little. Uh, just think carefully about um, uh, making sure that you understand that there will be a right of reply um, to any of the people that you perhaps name. Understood. Okay. Um, uh, do you have an opening statement for us? Uh, opening statement. I would just like to say thank you for the opportunity to appear. Um, it's an important inquiry. Um, the issues raised and have been raised so far are extremely important, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to be to be able to assist. Thank you. Um, in your submission, uh, Mr. Clan, you you talk about uh, you've been you were with News Corp at the Australian. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were a. Um, uh, an investigative journalist? That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, and where were you based? I was based in Sydney. Uh, I spent 15 years at the newspaper, based 14 of those based in uh, the Sydney headquarters in Surrey Hills. Mm -hmm. um, and what type of investigations did you undertake for The Australian? Uh, for the first three years, I worked in the business section. Following that, I worked in the general section, conducting Investigations around uh, business, finance, corporate corruption, um, mainly financially related, typically. Mm -hmm. Although I cover a broad area, they predominantly most of my coverage was was around finance, investigative finance. Um, I studied commerce and accounting and uh, related subjects, so I sort of have a have a background in that area. Mm -hmm. So you're you're well versed at the, these issues, as you've referenced in your uh, submission to us in uh, finance. Uh, 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 banking and superannuation. You, this is th this is what you would regularly write on. Yeah, this this is this is my round. This is my bread and butter. Yeah, um, and you've been in journalism for twenty years. That's correct. Um, in your submission, you uh, bring to our attention uh, a story that you were writing in relation to superannuation funds. Could you just step us through uh, what uh, you were asked to do and what was the result? Sure. So for many years, as many Australians have cottoned on to, there are some issues within the superannuation sector. Um, it's an area that is so well uh, funded and has so much money and so much power that it's extraordinarily difficult to take on as a journalist because you're, you're constantly shut down. So in early 2018, and at this time, the terms of reference to the Banking Royal Commission had been drawn up and they were extended to include super. Um, and I, my understanding is the government was of the position that industry super funds, now these are the not so-called not-for-profit funds, they're half, about half the industry sector. Um, this is your, your Australian super, your host plus. That's one half. The other half of retail funds uh, or for-profit funds, and that's your banks, your Westpac, uh, NAB, IOOF, AMP, et cetera. Now, I was asked to look into this. My understanding is the government had an issue, uh, was of the understanding that there was issues with the industry funds as opposed to the retail funds, which is an, enorm an enormous misnomer. There's, um, as I mentioned in that submission, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a world apart. So the issues with the retail funds. So anyway, I got into digging into this sector, which I was extremely excited to do because it's something I'd always wanted to. It's just a matter of having the, the backing, editorial backing to actually do it. Uh, so I did that and started out and we had a number of front page stories, really good hitting front page stories. Things were starting to change. Um, the public was starting to wake up to, the, to the, the enormity of the gouging by these retail funds, the bank funds. 
And this continued for several weeks, perhaps two months. Um, and then the, the government forces, lobbyist forces, got involved behind the scenes and basically I got shut up. I, it, it got to the point where I was just about to, to blow the lid on the entire thing and I was just shut down and it was extremely difficult to get any any further stories in. I got a handful of other stories in, but it just, it just there was no, there was no, they didn't want to know about it. It, it was a complete change, change of uh, about turn, basically, mm. which is and deeply concerning for me because it involves 5 million, 5 million Australians have their money with these retail funds, the, the, the Westpac, ANZ, CBAs, um, and they're the people that are being extremely, uh, extremely badly hurt by this process. I mean, the Productivity Commission managed to somehow dodge pointing out this, this fundamental issue or it sort of worked around it, but it's all in there if you join the dot through the report. But um, it, it found that you're losing about up to a million dollars just on the average worker. A million dollars in their retirement saving is different if you're in your average retail fund or your average industry fund. So basically the industry funds, they're the, they just pay the market rates. You see the ASX goes up and down or whatever, that's roughly what you get. But with the retail funds, they're taking all of the cream and you're basically ending up with exactly what you put in there. So you're actually going, you're better off putting your money under the mattress in a lot of cases with these with these funds. So that's an enormous drag on Australia, on the, on their future economy, on the taxation system, on, it goes to the heart of everything. And it's, it's in the many hundreds of billions of dollars have been gouged. Now, this is, they're illegal. Um, trustees, which are the people that look after the, the super funds, have a legal obligation to act in the best interests of members. If they don't, they can face up to several years jail. Now, the issue is um, the corporate regulator, uh, APRA and ASIC, are beholden to the same forces, as I mentioned before, the industry, etc. So they are just refusing to take action, even though it's cut and dried. Uh, Westpac's, for example, gouged $8 billion through its BT fund over the past decade, as I've written about but nothing's happened. And that was, we published that five months ago on my site or four months ago on my site. Um, and we put pressure on the on the regulators, but not a word. Um, and this is the story that I couldn't get out while I was at the Australian, it was spiked for no reason. Westpac BT came in and that was that was the end of it. So, and that was sort of one of the reasons I, I ultimately departed. Can I, in your submission, you uh, go to the fact that you were called into a meeting. So after writing this story about BT and Westpac, um, of which uh, you had been told by superiors uh, that it was a very good piece of writing, you say it was it had already been to the legal department and it had been legaled, um, and then you were called into a meeting with editors and a representative from Westpac. Um, it was, How? it was a meeting. Sorry. I was just. It, just, just, just uh, yeah. No, you go. Just, yeah, sorry. Just clarify there. So there was a meeting uh, with uh, three top editors in one of the editors' office, and there was a, um, a conference call with half a dozen or more, maybe even a dozen Westpac executives and, and, and members. So they were very concerned about it. And then, yeah, so just a, it was a, it was a conference call. Okay, yeah. it was a conference call with, with numerous members from uh, Westpac and, uh, uh, on the call. Um, yeah. Before this meeting, how long had you been working on this story? Over a month. Okay. And, over a month, a couple of months almost. And uh, you, you say it went, it was, it had been legal, it had gone to the, the legal department. Um, had they asked questions uh, to, to clarify? It, was, to... it wasn't a particularly, they asked a couple of questions. It wasn't particularly litigious story. I mean, it involves um, a corporation with over 10 employees, so the corporation can't sue. Um, it, they weren't worried about it. it. I mean, I deal a lot of with uh, legally contentious stories, being vested in journalists, particularly we write about um, you know, powerful people with lots of money, deep pockets, but this wasn't one of those, this wasn't a particular concern. Um, uh, and as it stands, I've written the story since, published it and haven't had a, haven't had a peep from them. Um, so there weren't any issues on that front. It, it kept coming back to me to, to double, triple check everything, which I did over and over and over, which I understand that's fine. Um, I had experts call the editor that I dealt with to explain who were the best in the world practically at this stuff, but it was spot on. Um, the gist of it was I'd been asked to track a dollar through the system of this retail fund, of these retail funds to see where the money was getting ripped off. Um, and no one had done that before. Um, so I eventually got to the point where I realized that they were, they're all what we call managed investment schemes. 
And so you could work out, track it through, it was painstaking, and it was actually probably closer to two months in all. We actually managed to track through through all these funds and accounts where all the money went. And it was being siphoned off into these paper companies that had no employees, provided no services, but just uh, just took the money. And it all just went to Westpac into one of its subsidiaries. Um, and the the value of this subsidiary that was, that was reaping all of these fees uh, rocketed. It grew at uh, many multiples of the ASX, the equivalent ASX companies over the period. And that's purely because of the money it was taking out of the accounts of almost 1 million Australians. And those 1 million Australians in that 10 year period didn't see their their, their income, their, their super go up at all. So basically every month they're putting in or every week they're putting in 9% of their salary, but it's their, their, their accounts only gone up by the same amount. If they're not getting any of the interest, mm -hmm. despite taking on all the risks of the stock market, et cetera, mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the excess is, is was going over to Westpac. And this is still going on with BT. Mm. Um, when you got called into this meeting, did you know it was going to be to spike your story? I didn't. No, I, I, I went in there with good faith. Uh, it was through three top editors. I'd been told they, want, they wanted to talk. But it's an unusual situation that you'd be sitting there anywhere with an editor's office, then speaking to the, the party you're dealing with, particularly seeing I dealt with them over s several weeks, probably many weeks, gone back to them in writing. It was always in writing because they wanted to ensure that they were, you know, well, everything was the way they wanted it. And I, I'm completely fine with that. That's fine. But then when we got to the last minute, I made sure every every single point was absolutely spot on. And then they decided they wanted to talk because they realised it was about to run the next day or two days later. I think it was a Thursday. It was going to run on the Saturday. And then they just made up a they just yeah made up a bunch of demonstra demonstrably false claims, um, half truths. And I wasn't allowed to speak in the meeting, so I was just sort of um, uh, silently you know, outraged and gesticulating, sort of pointing out that all this is wrong. But then it sort of became apparent to me, and it became, obviously became apparent to the, the one senior, most senior editor, and the two others were sort of just looking at the ground. And looked up. They realised what was going on, obviously, before I did, and they were just not engaging at all. And then two thirds of the way through, I realised it was a stitch up, and it was just a way for them to, for the editor to 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 spike the whole thing. And and BT at the time was spending money with the paper, and I suspect they spent a whole lot more on the back of this. Um, and this is often how it works, is my take. Um, big corporates are just paying, can, can just, yeah, uh, buy outsized clout within mm. newspapers, mm. yeah. Mm. But so, I won't stray too much at that. So your, your contention here is that it was, uh, it, was inconvenient. it was an inconvenient story to have run for somebody, for, uh, for a company that was taking large amount of advertising uh, out of the, well, out yeah, in the I mean, as, as, you, as, as your colleague mentioned before, he who pays the piper calls the tune. and. That was exactly what's going on there, mm. which is the big problem with that is you have a, a media organisation or a couple of media organisations that pretty much run the show in Australia. And if they get together and just refusing to run this, then you've got five million Australians getting robbed blind day after day. And we can't tell them about it because there's no avenue to get it out there, uh, which is an investigative journalist and, you know, civic minded person like most of us. It, that's it's, it's quite terrifying, really. I mean, you, it, not to be able, not to, be able to, 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 to get this information out in a democratic country such as Australia is quite a concern. Mm. Senator Carr, do you have a... Can I be clear? I mean, uh, who was the editor that you're talking about? Uh, this editor was John Lehman, editor of The Australian at the time. He's now right. executive editor of The Australian. Right. OK. So um, are you suggesting that there is an association between the executives and News Corp and the executives of Westpac? There's an association. Um, yes. This association. I mean, it depends how you define association. But for example, when I spoke to Liam in several days before this, he said, "Oh, we'll just ring up and you know, let's put it to put it to Maxted or put it to the chairman or put it to the CEO." Like he was obviously uh, or appeared to be on close, you know, very close terms with him. Uh, we put it to him at the races or something. I think I believe he said. So at the races. Um, so, so, so you're thinking, what's this a social network? What's the nature of the relationship in your judgment? I don't know what the relationship was. My understanding was it was a social relationship of some some kind. Perhaps he was being flippant, but I. I suspect that he knew him as a, yeah, through, through, through the races, I guess, through, through a social arrangement, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're, um, you, you're actually, uh, were a finalist, was it, uh, there was some recognition in the, uh, in, in the newspaper at the time that your superannuation work uh, was acknowledged by the company at the executive level as being of high quality, you were a uh, finalist for the company's top award, the Sir Keith Murdoch Award um, for journalism. That's the Chairman's Award, isn't it? That's correct. Right. 
And that's a finalist for the News Corp Australia Business Reporter of the Year. Is that that's right? That's correct. And is it that's also right. the case that uh, the, uh, the chairman of the corporation actually has a close hand in selecting the finalists and winners for the chairman's award? Yes. That's Mr. Murdoch. And that's correct. Mr. C that's the, yeah, Mr. That's Mr. the senior Mr. Murdoch we're talking about. Yes, I understand. Um, I, yes, yes, I understand the Murdoch family are closely involved in, and the no. senior Mr. Murdoch. I, yes, I just want to well, be clear. Well I, just, I, want to, I want to be clear as your credentials. That's all. And you're saying oh, yeah, that, that your stories. All. Sorry, would you? Yes, that's oh. that's correct. So th these stories on superannuation, the chairman was obviously very impressed with them. Um, it's in the name of his father. The award he presents the award. Um, I was one of four finalists for the award, as well as. Business right. Journalist of the Year. So finalist. can you be clear to this committee, why, in your opinion, what's, well, how do you account for the suppression of your story by the senior editorial executives? I account for it in terms of it being financial, that they didn't want to upset the big end of town, they didn't want to um, overturn the apple cart. There's a Royal Commission going on. This would bring down, I think, if I'd kept reporting anyway, the super system as we know it would, would have changed. It would have to have changed because more people would understand these uh, issues. And this was sort of the turning point. This was this was going to be the sort of bit of the dynamite that really kicked it off. So they were throwing everything behind shutting it up. So I understand it, was, it would have been money. It would have been, I suspect they would have been paid substantially more money after it, whether that be through special uh, advertising or a, a number of other reasons. I see. So um, you're not suggesting that, the, that Mr. Murdoch was directly involved in the suppression now, are you? No, I don't, I don't think he, not at all, because the suppression happened before this award ceremony. So I, he wouldn't even known about it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. he's, I've put this information in, it's, he's seen the entry um, through other hands and it would have gone up, the, the handful of top ones would have gone to him. He would have seen it um, and thought it was great, which it was. I believe it was very good work, um, but he wouldn't have been aware of that. Uh, it would have been the, the editors below him. I mean, the editors below him, mm -hmm. he's not going to be across that minutiae. Yeah. And if he were, yeah. he wouldn't have selected it to, to be yeah. in the top uh, of the award. I just want to be clear about how it works at News Limited. Um, sure. So does it work on the basis, because it's often said to us that the editors don't uh, get directions and instructions from on high, that they make these choices at, the, uh, at each of the individual newspapers. So this is your experience in this particular case that would suit that that would fit that line of argument. I wouldn't agree with that line of argument, but in this particular case, yeah. that would suit that line so, of argument. So right. Yes, and that's the case it wasn't. But you don't agree with that line of argument. Why wouldn't you agree with that line of argument? Well, it's statistically impossible. I mean, how could every, every single day uh, all the columnists wake up with the same point of view um, and have the same angle? And it, it's, I mean, you, you could run a regression yeah, analysis. They're remarkably really patient uh, individuals. I mean, I presume they're. Uh, that's the way. It, isn't that how it yes. works? Well, well, my, well, my experience hasn't been that. It, it, okay. my, uh, if you've got a point of view or an angle that doesn't suit, then it just gets axed. And if you've got an angle that does suit, it gets put, pushed through you know, massively. So. Right. Well, um, you mentioned that you fact-checked your material uh, several times, you said. I thought, was that? That's correct. That been? Wouldn't you fact-check your material as a matter of course? Yeah, always. Always. I mean, it, it depends how much time you have. Obviously, in the daily newspaper, you're always there's always a lot of time pressures, etc. But, but yeah, you do. You always double, triple check. But this was an extraordinary level of checking. We went back uh, and back and back. So, Mr. Kenny, you always check. Now, I've noticed that other investigative reporters have presented material which is full of factual errors. So, is it? It's not common practice, surely, at, at, at the Australian to or well, some of the tabloids within the news stable to always check. That can't possibly be true. I don't know that there are many investigative journalists in the tabloid stable at all. I can't uh, think of any. I see. Uh, is it, uh, you can't think That's of any. That's a matter of terminology. Uh -huh. All right, well, um, I won't go too far into that. I just want to be clear about how your direct experience, you were required to fact check, that is your standard that's your professional approach to your journalism. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And, and what was the circumstances upon you? Have, you've left News Limited now? That's right. Why? I departed uh, in May 2019. Uh, after this superannuation issue, which was for me enormous, not being able to get this information out, I decided I was going to leave. It was a matter of then when and how, and some other events unfolded. 
uh, two months, three months out from the federal election, and that was the catalyst, and it all came to a head, and I departed then. Okay. Well, we, there, you've got a supplementary submission, which we will provide to the persons that you've named, uh, and it may well be necessary to invite you back uh, as well, so I, perhaps I'll leave my further questions to that occasion. So thank you very much for sure. your appearance today. Um, Thanks so much. Th thanks, Mr Clan. Um, just I've got a couple of final ones to, to follow up, um, if I could. Um, generally speaking, I mean, you've spent 15 years at the Australian newspaper. Have, in your experience, have you uh, seen a change in the way uh, stories are presented, uh, the way opinion and fact are blended, uh, the way uh, the issues that are highlighted versus issues that are ignored? Has there been a change in the 15 years of your experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a different place from when I started from when I left. Um, and I mean, there, there was always things that one would feel uncomfortable with, um, but it was it, it was nearly unrecon unrecognisable, um, the difference. And it, the level of unethical behaviour, in my view at least, or, or, or what would be gauged the view of the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance, Code of Ethics, etc., um, was extremely high. But and before the election, the things that unfolded were, were extremely concerning and, and, in my opinion, highly unethical, yes. Um, uh, what, was, what are the things that you're referring to in terms of before the 2019 election? Well, much of this is covered in the supplementary statement, so I don't know how much you want me to veer into that. No. OK. We, we, might, we might have to get you back. Um, could I ask you, have you seen a um, particular attitude towards uh, uh, women in leadership uh, at The Australian in your time? Have you got any reflections on the way The Australian has uh, written, reported? Uh, you mean reported on or within the organisation? Uh, reported on, I was thinking. Right, no, because I think within the organisation, actually, it's, 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 and from the, the, the many women I know who work there who have great things to say for it, and it's actually really good like that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, say anything negative on that front at all. Regarding women in power, um, it's not, I can't, I can't say that I have seen that, no. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, actually, yes, I have seen that, come to think of it. Um, it's not something I've cast my mind to recently, but certainly uh, female reporters, female politicians have come under a lot of attack, I've noticed, yes. Um, but again, that's not something I had given a lot of thought to. Mm -hmm. I sort of generally stuck in my investigative round and sort of just stuck to that, to be yes, honest. Yes, understandable. Yeah. Okay. Um, look, Mr. Clan, we uh, will consider your uh, supplementary submission and we might need to get you back uh, to answer some questions in relation to that. Okay, sure. Th thank you so much uh, for giving us your time today. Thank you very much, Senator. Th thank you. That concludes today's proceedings. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses who have given evidence to the committee today, as well as to Hansard Broadcast and the Secretariat. Uh, our next hearing will be on the 12th of April. Thank you.